Fallout New Vegas is one of those games where you either love it or you hate it. I don't think there's really an in-between there. If you do love it, it's not a game you can simply play once and put down forever. I personally have played through New Vegas around 27 times on various different consoles, and I still like to come back to it every so often. Those runs can range from heavily modded experiences with new quests, companions, weapons, and mechanics, or more vanilla runs that are only modded for the sake of stability and maybe an EMB shader to bring a little bit of life into the dated Gambrio engine. See, New Vegas is a game that has aged incredibly well in some categories and not so much in others, particularly in how the game runs on modern hardware. If you're like me, you may have played these games on consoles during their initial release, a scenario that could lead to its own slew of problems like memory leaks leading to longer loading times and eventual crashes. I'm looking at you, Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion on the Xbox 360. Maybe you started on the PC with these games or move from consoles onto PC for a better, more modular experience. The nice thing about Bethesda games is how easy they are to mod and how interested people are in modding them, leading to a slew of original content and even fixes that the developers may have never thought of. But with PCs comes new upgrades every few years. The PC you had back in 2010 most likely has been completely overhauled in 2021. And with new hardware, drivers, and OSs, etc., certain games become more and more difficult to offer an enjoyable experience out of the box. Bethesda games are one such example of this. New Vegas is fairly unstable on modern hardware and prone to crashes incredibly often. It's thanks to modders that the game is even in a playable state at this point, with guides like Viva New Vegas offering a means of creating an experience that is both vanilla and almost guaranteed to be stable. Even then, you're still not guaranteed to see zero crashes or graphical issues because the Gambrio engine feels like it's been created using Gorilla Glue, masking tape, and chewing gum. The engine felt like it was on its last legs with the release of New Vegas in 2010, so it's surprising to see it manage to live all the way up to 2015 with the release of Maple Story 2 of all games. The story of New Vegas and its development begins in 2004 when Bethesda bought the rights to publish Fallout 3 specifically as well as two sequels. Keep in mind that this was not a purchase of the entire intellectual property of Fallout as a series, although they would purchase this some three years later. Bethesda, at the time, was potentially best known for the Elder Scrolls series, specifically Oblivion, which was released in 2006. The studio had made a name for themselves in terms of open-world RPGs to the point that they were so influential we began seeing copycat games being developed like Two Worlds in 2007. Although that's up for debate. If you've never played Two Worlds or its sequel, good, don't. If you did, I'm sorry. The games are similar in mechanical concept, but Two Worlds has some of the most uninspired and unimaginative gameplay to the point that playing it is a chore. I got into the Elder Scrolls series with Oblivion and not Morrowind. I know this is seen as a fatal flaw to some of you watching this, but fear not, I have gone back and played the majority of Morrowind, if only to say I did. While Oblivion was my first foray into the series, there are reasons it remains my favorite. While Morrowind is superior to Oblivion through its many mechanics and open-endedness, Oblivion came with a certain charm and sense of immersion that was able to better hold me throughout the experience. And while the logic and writing within the various quests were not always the best, they were so unique and involved that I found it a requirement to complete every single one. Oblivion didn't just impress me as a kid, it changed my perspective on what video games could be. I was but a baby boy, unaware of what was possible within games, and Oblivion showed me that there was so much more than I ever could have expected. So needless to say, when when Fallout 3 was announced, I was at this point very impressed with what Bethesda had to offer. Oblivion had quickly become one of my favorite games at the time, and to hear we would be getting what was essentially Oblivion with guns gave my immature mind a shot of so much serotonin that I had to have it. I was obsessed with playing this game, even though I knew nothing about the Fallout series going into it. And that's another point we should briefly talk about. Fallout 3 is not the same game as Fallout 1 or 
Port 2, which are essentially top-down turn-based RPGs, a genre I would get heavily into much later into my life. And there was a lot of blowback from traditional Fallout fans about the direction the series was going, but this video isn't about that. I didn't, at the time, play Fallout 1 or 2. I've since played 1 at the very least, but the previous entries have never swayed my opinion on 3 onward. When Fallout 3 did release, I was once again in love with what I considered a revolutionary experience at the time. Fallout truly felt, to me, like I was playing Oblivion in a modern setting. Well, as modern as the 1940s to 60s could imagine the future to be. And looking back, a lot of the writing and choices you could make within the game were fairly shallow in design. Sure, there's commentary on your choices, are you doing good or evil, or are you somewhere in between? But Fallout 3 had a tough time actually delving into these concepts of what makes something actually be good or not. When you blow up Megaton, there's no real punishment for doing so. No overarching commentary about your actions. If anything, it's played for spectacle. Most players probably blew up Megaton just to see it happen because it was a huge selling point in terms of choices within the game. The only real punishment you run into is hostile NPCs near the blast site as well as your father giving you a bit of a scolding later on. It's very mild for the essential genocide you just committed. The impact of certain events are not portrayed as important as they should be. This is something New Vegas improves on in a way I'll discuss later, but only slightly. I enjoyed my time with Fallout 3. I even enjoyed my time with its various DLCs despite how shallow they actually were. Operation Anchorage, The Pit, Point Lookout, and Mothership Zeta were all interesting additions to the open world of Fallout 3, even if they were their own instanced areas, and Broken Steel was possibly the first time I've ever seen an ending to a game be remade in order to continue the storyline. Needless to say, I was very happy with Fallout 3 upon release, and played it consistently alongside Oblivion over and over again as DLC released. Once I was informed of New Vegas's development, however, I wasn't jumping for joy by any means. Around the time of Fallout 3 and New Vegas, we were just coming out of an era where games would generally get multiple different versions with the same title across various consoles. You'd see this most in licensed products like Spider-Man or Harry Potter. You could tell that the console or PC release was the main selling point and all of the other titles were cheap reimaginings at best. And it's understandable why. It's not like the Game Boy Advance could do what the PS2 could. I was of the mind that this was still in practice, that a game would be released and then we may see a spin-off or port, if you can call it that, that is nothing like the game that preceded it. With New Vegas releasing so close to Fallout 3's end of development, although this was two years later, I figured my perception of spin-offs was going to account for this new release. So imagine my surprise when New Vegas releases and I see that it is almost exactly like Fallout 3. Obviously there's a new setting, but the engine and mechanics are almost all one for one at a surface level glance. Add in the ability to use iron sights, better use of skill points within dialogue, and many other minimal features that help lift the RPG experience and you get a product that looks overall like an improvement on its predecessor. Almost like a true sequel, at least that's how I thought of it at the time. But the development of New Vegas is rife with turmoil, a game not created by Bethesda themselves but outsourced to Obsidian Entertainment, a developer known for their writing staff as well as members who had worked on Fallout 1 and 2 as well as the original concept for 3 titled Van Buren. Everything sounds great on paper, but pressure from Bethesda as well as the gaming market in general would ultimately lead to an unfinished product that still managed to shine brighter than anything Bethesda themselves could have created to this day. Fallout New Vegas is a once in a lifetime experience, but one that you get to have over and over again. There's potentially never going to be another game like it, even with rumored sequels up in the air. It's a game that tries to do a lot with a little and manages to succeed for, you know, the most part while being rough around the edges. Today I'd like to analyze what made the game so good in my eyes, the commentaries it presents, how it presents them, and the overall gameplay experience as a whole. New Vegas is a game of factions. It's a game about war and capitalism, revenge and justice, about the strong using the weak for personal gain, and the DLC is so phenomenally strong at expanding upon this that it allows the entire package of New Vegas to feel like one cohesive set of stories. You could consider New Vegas a television show with multiple seasons, followed by sequel films in the form of 
of DLC. New Vegas is open-ended, but it's here to tell a story, one that you get to shape much more than you could in Fallout 3. As I'm writing this, I'm seeing how long this script could potentially be. I imagine this will be one of my longer videos, as there's just so much to discuss and go over. So if you love New Vegas, or want to learn a lot about it, please feel free to sit back and listen. This is a game that can appear small on the surface, but manages to pack so much within you're prone to finding something new within every playthrough. For that reason, I want to be clear, this retrospective will go over a lot but not absolutely everything. We'll focus on major aspects of the game, such as the various factions within and how the player can interact with them. We'll look into how the player shapes the story and what these choices can lead to in terms of endings. We'll look at each DLC separately as its own section, as I believe they are unique enough to warrant it. And finally, we'll go over the themes, gameplay, and mechanics throughout. Not necessarily in that order, but you get the idea. If you enjoy videos like this, please consider liking, comment, commenting, and subscribing, as it helps me continue to make this content. With that out of the way, I'm Super Rad, and this is the big Fallout New Vegas retrospective. Will you get it over with? Maybe cons kill people without looking them in the face. But I ain't a fink, dig? You've made your last delivery, kid. Sorry you got twisted up in this scene. From where you're kneeling, must seem like an 18 karat run of bad luck. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. So let's get one thing out of the way here. Fallout New Vegas hasn't aged particularly well when it comes to running on modern hardware. For this reason, I'll be using various stability mods in order to make the game perform properly and crash as minimally as possible. To make this happen, I have used the Viva New Vegas mod list and guide to set this up while skipping all of their gameplay specific modifications. The goal of this retrospective is to talk about New Vegas as it was on release, and the best way to do this is to keep it as vanilla as possible. In fact, within this list, the only thing I have installed that may lead to visible gameplay changes at all are Ice Dewey AI's tweaks and engine fixes, and things like visual modifications. Even within the tweaks, I have almost all of them disabled. Slightly better lighting and meshes here and there, slightly better animations, and the inclusion of weapon sway while moving. These, in my opinion, add a breath of life to the game without taking away from the core vanilla experience. The Pip-Boy is going to open a little faster for the same of it. Explosions aren't going to shake my entire camera, but instead just shake the HUD. And things like the HUD have been cleaned up and upscaled to look better on higher resolutions. Weather stays the same, and various additions like being able to sprint or changing the recoil have been left not included. If any of these additions are a problem for you, I apologize. You can think of this retrospective as a look into New Vegas Vanilla Plus if you want, though I do believe the changes to be fairly minimal. This means things like bug fixes are going to be the most prevalent. While it is important to acknowledge that Bethesda games are generally rife with bugs, we've already done so. Bethesda games are hardly future-proofed, and the sandbox environment alongside the Gambrio engine, for example, can lead to a slew of issues. Oblivion is a key example in this, one that was fixed as best as it could be by modders, and you can find a list of said bugs online. The same can be said for New Vegas. For recording purposes, it'd just be too much trouble to go through all of the game and its DLCs with the countless problems that could arise. So we'll acknowledge that they exist, but we'll also do our best to avoid them for the sake of the video. The opening scene of New Vegas sets the stage for the greater conflict at hand within the Mojave. Years after the bombs fell, the individuals who survived through living in the various vaults surrounding the wasteland emerged to build new societies, villages, and through this various tribes. Tribes especially are a large driving force in terms of New Vegas' narrative. It's interesting that New Vegas uses the term tribes here. Whether it properly fits or not, I'm not completely sure. A tribe is a group of individuals who have over the years adopted a shared culture and ancestry, maybe their own language. 
this can take generations to develop, and considering the bombs dropped in 2077 and New Vegas begins in 2281, it's not absurd to think this type of social development did happen, especially when many of these communities were first trapped within the vaults. Alongside these tribes came the New California Republic, a union of the American Southwest that is meant to portray American values, including militarism, their views on justice, law, and community. Regardless of how these old school American values may have been flawed, how they believe they are the greater good because a greater evil exists, and if you are not with them, you are against them. The NCR is notorious for collecting communities and absorbing them into the NCR whether they like it or not. Easy Beat is potentially one of the first NPCs you can talk to who points this out. The NCR provides safety and security from tribals and raiders that threaten those within the NCR, but outside of that it's not so simple. In fact, the NCR has a lot more going on behind the scenes that paints a more nuanced picture of their diplomacy and politics and shows the cracks within. Regardless of what the NCR potentially does wrong, they are the driving force that keeps the Legion at bay. The NCR are potentially meant to be viewed as the good karma faction, but as I mentioned, and it's much more nuanced than that. We'll get more into the NCR later, as well as the various tribes, but the Legion, or Kaisar's Legion, are an army situated on the other side of the Colorado River, the two sides being connected by the Hoover Dam, a key point of power that dictates who is within control of the Mojave. The Legion is a conglomerate of 86 tribes that were created through conquests that led to a community of slaves to be used as weapons and fodder for the will of Kaisar and his generals. The Legion wants the dam as the dam is one means of generating a large amount of electricity, and with electricity comes power. With power comes the Mojave. They are the counterpoint to the NCR, the bad karma to the good karma, and it's much less nuanced here despite how Kaisar may lead you to believe through some of his dialogue. The Legion is evil, slavery is evil, and they wish to encroach onto territory that doesn't belong to them in order to spread evil. It's been four years since the NCR had to hold the dam against the Legion, in which they were successful at doing, but unsuccessful at fully wiping them out. This led to the Legion managing to recoup their losses over time and strengthening their military to the point that they have a strong presence within the Mojave itself, even if they don't fully control it. There's various patrols and camps situated around the desert in which the Legion used to capture slaves, to punish individuals, and much more. The third major faction within New Vegas is Mr. House, a genius individual who predicted the bombs dropping in 2077 and planned for it ahead of time, allowing Vegas to remain relatively unscathed within the main strip of the city. House has used his influence in mind to create a new Vegas, in which has allowed him to rehabilitate various tribes of the Nevada that now all situate themselves within the strip. Not only tribes are on his side, however, House also holds the control over the enigmatic Securitrons, his automated robotic police force that holds a bigger part to play within the grand narrative of New Vegas as a whole. House is the embodiment of capitalism, and how power can lead to a monopoly. As strong as the NCR and the Legion can be, they still have to live within House's world. He is what capitalism and a monopoly can ultimately lead to, an authoritarian who keeps out those he does not deem fit to enter his world and those that do must bow down before him, even if they've never seen him in person before. In this way, we can can consider Mr. House to be similar to the Legion. He is an evil that exists within the world of New Vegas. He is the embodiment of capitalism and authoritarianism, creating his own slaves within. People within this strip may live a life of luxury, but they are hardly free, and you'll see that as we progress through the main quest line and various side quests. It's really a pick your poison type of choice in terms of who you wish to side with within New Vegas. The Legion are explicitly evil. They are the villains that are there to allow forces to unite and take them down in the name of all that is good and just. But is House evil as well? Is he some necessary greater good, or is he simply instilling his will through a force that isn't as visible as how the Legion does it? The NCR takes whatever they want, whether you like it or not, because they believe they have the moral high ground to do so. Everyone is corrupted here, some more than others, and you see why this is and hear their excuses as you play throughout the game, ultimately leading to one conclusion that I believe is the best course of action in terms of how you finish it. So who are you within this setting? In Oblivion and Morrowind, you were a prisoner. In Fallout 3, you grew up within a vault. 
they give you very restrictive narratives that can hinder your overall role-playing experience. New Vegas does this as well, but much less so. In terms of being a prisoner, you have to consider how you got there. Was it just or unjust? Would you even want your character starting in a prison? Could it even possibly make sense for this situation within your personal narrative? Questions like that show how the overall immersion can take a hit slightly within the opening scenes of a Bethesda product. They want to hold your hand within some means, either through the beginning steps of the narrative or through the whole thing. In Morrowind, you're basically free to do as you please the moment you're off the boat. In Oblivion and Fallout 3, you are more on a railway track following a much more present narrative, making it harder to justify straying away from it. Obsidian Entertainment looks to fix that in some capacity. The main thing you know about your character, the only label placed on you is that you are a courier. You are within the Nevada and you have taken up a job. When you exactly started said job doesn't matter. Who you were before that job is completely up to you. Why you took that job is up to you and after the opening scene, the fact that it was your job doesn't matter at all until a very specific DLC later on. The main narrative of New Vegas opens up with your first introduction to Benny, who is part of one of New Vegas's strip tribes known as the Chairman. You're also introduced to the Great Khans, a raider tribe who work within drug trafficking, leading to their own assortment of problems. You as a character are tied up within the cemetery just outside the town of Good Springs. Benny has one of the Great Khans digging your grave while producing a gambling chip from his suit's inner pocket. We'll discuss why you are in this situation later on down the line and the motivations of Benny for capturing you. However, in the present situation, Benny pulls a gun on your character and and ultimately shoots you in the head, starting the adventure that is New Vegas. The first major step in terms of gameplay is the character creation process. This is probably the best time to point out that the characters within New Vegas, or really within any open world Bethesda product, are known to have some pretty atrocious faces and textures. Oblivion characters look like an assortment of potatoes, yams, and squashes of various shapes and sizes. Meanwhile, Fallout 3 and New Vegas characters are in a perpetual state of looking like they are melting. There's mods to fix this, and I wouldn't say it's inexcusable that they look so bad. They look good enough in a sense for the time, regardless of how well or not they have aged, but since this is a vanilla retrospective, it's worth pointing out just how terrible almost every character in this game can and probably will look. Luckily, there's a bit more of an opportunity for you as the character creator to make your character look a little more conventional than the rest of New Vegas's population. Before we even reach the character creation process, we are spammed with various add-on DLC. Many of these DLCs are bonus items that were provided to players who pre-ordered the game from specific stores. These included the Caravan Pack, the Tribal Pack, the Classic Pack, and the Mercenary Pack, and all of these were bundled together later for an optional purchasable add-on known as the Courier Stash, which was released alongside another item pack known as the Gunrunner's Arsenal. The individual item packs will spawn notification menus for each one immediately as you load into the character creation process. It's a bit grating, but is also a staple of Bethesda design, one that Obsidian didn't seem keen on fixing. Gunrunner's Arsenal gets a notification a bit later on, but just to point out, it's a more in-depth mod than the individual item packs themselves, adding in new unique weapons to find and purchase within the game as well as an assortment of new modifications for weapons. New Vegas improves the Fallout 3 experience in numerous ways. One of the ways is the inclusion of weapon modifications. Specific modifications can be added to specific guns to offer various stat boosts and visual changes to the weapon itself. And Gunrunner's Arsenal adds to this with an assortment of new modifications for players to try out. Modifications aren't a game changer by any means, but the added customizability and freedom is a welcome improvement. The player is introduced to Doc Mitchell, the Doctor of Good Springs, a village within the Mojave. He saved you from a bullet wound in the head after Victor, a Securitron that lives within Good Springs, ultimately dug you out of a grave in the Good Springs Cemetery. The narrative here here gives good enough reason for why you are setting the stats of your character and customizing your appearance. Surgery was performed on you, a pretty heavy surgery at that, and this could lead to a few visual changes or mental differences from who you were before the bullet and who you are now. Mitchell asks you to essentially look in a mirror to see if he made any mistakes, and it's within this mirror that we can create our character. Afterwards, we move on to the Vigor Tester, which is the excuse used to determine our special stats. Special is a a Fallout staple. It stands for Strength, Perception, 
endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility, and luck. From a role-playing standpoint, many of these stats can help you dictate just how smart or strong or overall talented you are. In terms of overall gameplay, these stats are an incredibly important factor in terms of your build and how you will experience the journey throughout the game. Take intelligence for example, if you care about skill points at all, or care about maximizing at all, a high end stat is almost a guaranteed necessity as the level of your intelligence factors into how many skill points you receive per level up at a rate of 10 plus half of your intelligence. If you have 9 intelligence, you'll receive 14 skill points in your first level up, with the additional 0.5 carrying over into the next one. On the opposite end of usefulness is Charisma, which is universally known to be a dump stat. Players can progress through the game with one Charisma and never really worry about filling it up at all. The only thing Charisma affects outside of bonuses to some skills initially, like speech or barter, is the effectiveness of companions. Companions are special NPCs PCs in the game you can have tag along your journey after recruiting them. They have their own storyline, questline, and perks that can be unlocked by engaging with them, and their effectiveness or companion nerve is dictated by the charisma stat, starting at a 5% boost to damage and armor, leading to a 50% boost at level 10. However, companions are ultimately still useful and effective at one charisma. In terms of maximizing the player's effectiveness, charisma is essentially useless outside of the role-playing aspect. It should be noted that luck will specifically specifically affect how good you are at gambling within New Vegas' various casinos. A high luck stat can make the process of getting kicked out of a casino much easier, but at the cost of various other stats. Once you're done with the Vigor Tester, Mitchell will comment on your overall stats, specifically if you are an all-rounder or if you have one stat that is particularly high or low. The next step is to sit down with Mitchell as he throws some psychological questions at you in order to determine your tag skills. The question process is inherently arbitrary. It's, it's made to be arbitrary. Its only inclusion is for the role-playing aspect, as regardless of what you choose, in order to better define your character's personality, you can still choose whichever three tag skills you want. Tag skills are three skills you can select out of your total skills to give a 15-point boost to at the start of the game. This can be used in subsequent playthroughs to make sure you meet certain skill checks early in order to optimize quest progression and experience gained, if that's your thing. I want to take a moment to point out one specific set of questions Mitchell presents to you. At one point, Mitchell begins a Rorschach test in which you are shown an assortment of symmetrical ink drawings, and are asked to explain what you perceive the picture to be. What do you perceive this picture to be? If you've never played this game or never played the DLC, take a moment to pause the video and let me know what you think it is. Now take a look at the options that were provided to you for an answer. Was your perception expressed within one of these options? If not, wait until the Honest Hearts DLC section where this will be brought up again and you'll hopefully feel a little more validated. Following this, players get to choose up to two special traits. You don't have to choose any at all, and the reason for that is that most traits provide both both a bonus and a detriment to the player. For example, you can get an additional point of agility to your special stats, but will also be crippled more easily in battle. That's really not that bad within the gameplay of New Vegas, so it's more a positive trait to pick overall. That being said, I generally choose two specific traits for every playthrough, those being the skilled trait as well as Wild Wasteland. Skilled provides five extra points to every skill you have, at the cost of taking a 10% EXP hit for the remainder of your playthrough. This can be immediately remedied within your first level by taking the first level of Swift Learner perk, which provides a 10% bonus per the amount of times you select it, that being a maximum of 3. So the real cost of the trade is either 10% of your EXP through the total playthrough or one perk, and in terms of what's more useful, you're getting a total of 65 skill points which you could consider a perk in itself when comparing it to the around 14 to 15 you'll receive normally. Once all of the questions have been answered and all of your stats set up, the player is given some clothing and a pip boy before being sent down their way. The Pip-Boy is another staple item within Fallout as a series. In New Vegas and Fallout 3, it acts as your main menu to see stats, interact with your inventory, check your map and quests, and notes like a journal. This is how the player is able to properly navigate the world, fast travel, and keep track of what they're supposed to do. As a mechanic, the Pip-Boy fits right in with the world of Fallout. It adds a sense of immersion to the traditional menu concept and allows players to properly roleplay 
play their character as if they were looking through their own set of logs and statistics. It's like a big, clunky Fitbit. There's still a necessity in terms of suspension of disbelief, of course. The player wouldn't realistically be carrying 20 guns and four different outfits while trekking it through a desert. But the added level of immersion, no matter how small, is always a benefit to a series. Before leaving, the player is offered the ability to turn on New Vegas's unique feature of hardcore mode. The main features of hardcore mode include stim packs healing over time, having weight assigned to ammunition, and requires the player to eat, drink, and sleep regularly, otherwise they will suffer various status debuffs that can eventually lead to death if unchecked. The idea of hardcore mode is to add a sense of realism and simulation to New Vegas, something I don't think fits particularly well within the game's design and engine. New Vegas at least tried to make it worthwhile by adding the ability to cook food and survive off of the land. Survival is even its own stat in the game. It's so tied to hardcore mode, however, that playing on normal effectively makes this skill useless. There's virtually never a time when cooking food is even mildly a necessity. And what is the reward for keeping this mode enabled from start to finish? An achievement. Even the developers say this mode isn't recommended, so for that reason we'll be playing on normal, which I consider the intended experience. On a related topic, work and reloading benches also exist for similar purposes. Players can convert ammo from one type to another, or craft various usable items like weapon repair kits. Within all of my years of playing New Vegas, I don't believe I ever found this to be immediately necessary within any capacity. What New Vegas threw in as a bit of flavor to help players feel more involved with their inventory is just that a bit of flavor. It's overall something you can completely ignore within your playthrough and never realize it was even a mechanic to begin with. You may start to question why you have so many empty ammunition casings, however. This would later be greatly expanded upon in Fallout 4, to its own detriment, but that's a topic for another video potentially. Upon exiting the house, the player is met with another set of DLC notifications. These include all four major story DLC as well as the notification for the Gunrunner's Arsenal which I mentioned previously. Each of these major DLC raise the player's level cap by 5, meaning they go from a cap of 30 to 50, which is still relatively small considering how much experience you are going to be gaining if you plan to take part in all of the game's content. That's another reason I don't mind taking the skilled trait. There is an abundance of EXP to be had and hitting level 50 isn't very difficult to do. That being said, you may find that you hit 50 early on before taking part in a large portion of said content, and that can seem oddly limited limiting in a way, but I don't think it's a bad thing. Take a game like Dark Souls for example, you can level up essentially infinitely, but there is a soft cap on how much each stat increase will be based on how much you've already raised it. This encourages you to raise specific stats to certain thresholds and better specialize your character in a certain small subset of skills. It's the same in New Vegas, although much more simplistic. You level 50 times, meaning you have to decide what you want your character to specialize in ahead of time so that you aren't left with the inability to finish off your preferred build. If you want your character to be good in guns, lockpicking, and medicine, you'll probably want to focus on those early on, and then spread out excess skills once you've met certain goals. The limiting factor of the leveling system makes it so that you have to specialize, and through specialization you will find yourself strong in one scenario and less so in another. This allows for dynamic challenges based on the build you have decided upon. Dead Money, for example, is a very melee-centric DLC, but it doesn't have to be. That being said, if you haven't built for it, it's going to be quite the challenge for you. You're going to have to work your way around the map of the Sierra Madre Resort in a way that is going to be a bit more challenging for you over a stealth-based melee build, for example. Good Springs is the start of what I consider, you know, Season 1 of New Vegas. It's very easy to place certain aspects of the game's narrative and adventure within the mindset of a television series. Y you don't have to do this. It's just something I've thought about in the past. In a way, Good Springs and the Journey to Freeside is the first big story arc or season of New Vegas. Following that is the player's exploits in and around Freeside leading into the Strip. Finally, you have the story arc centered around the Strip itself, as well as Mr. House and his rehabilitated tribals. Within the final arc, you can fit in the four DLCs, which I suppose you could consider movies that get released during the lifetime of the show. New Vegas lends itself very well to this line of thinking. The storytelling and 
writing are paced exceptionally well if the player takes the intended route to get to their destination, but they don't have to. And we'll talk about that a bit in a minute. The first NPC players will run into is the Securitron Victor, who has the image of a friendly cowboy on his CRT. Victor is the individual who saved you, and there's not too much to really get out of him at this point in the narrative. Victor lives in Good Springs and ultimately manages to save you from an untimely demise. Various individuals within the town have their own opinions on Victor. Easy Pete, a retired prospector, holds no ill will towards him, while Trudy, a kind of town leader, is overly suspicious of him. At this point, the game is completely open to the player. They don't need to interact with Good Springs at all. If you want to go and explore the Mojave, you can. But if you want to learn more about the man who shot you, if you are interested in information or even revenge, which is most likely, you can head into the local tavern to begin your inquiries. Before that, however, it's good to note that the cemetery is very close to your current location. Stopping by allows you to find the grave you were buried in, as well as one of the several collectible snow globes. These are somewhat similar to bobbleheads from previous entries, but instead of giving you stab boosts, can be sold off to Mr. House for small sums of caps, around 2,000. Add-on content can even have globes as well, which will automatically provide the sum of caps upon collecting them. Around your grave, it's also possible to find a pile of cigarette buds around, which can be used later in dialogue options to implicate the individuals who put you into the ground. So I want to set some ground rules for this retrospective, specifically the route and destinations we expect to run into. New Vegas is very open-ended, but it'd be wrong of us to not follow the main storyline like many other players would be doing on their first playthrough. Additionally, one of the major choices you make at the start, how you'll get to New Vegas, is designed to suggest the player take the longer of the two routes, which we will be doing, although we'll stop by the faster route to discuss it somewhat. With that in mind, our first stop is the local tavern in town where we are immediately met with Sunny Smiles and her dog Cheyenne. Sunny effectively acts as an optional tutorial for the game, one that I think is rather well thought out overall. There are multiple steps to the tutorial that start with teaching the player how to shoot, how to use the game's new iron sights mode, something that wasn't in Fallout 3, and how to hunt, gather, and cook. Many of these steps can be stopped along the way if the player feels they are not necessary. In fact, the entire tutorial doesn't need to take place outside of maybe the shooting range. But if you do take part in each step, said steps will provide various rewards like items or payment. This is an incredible improvement on the tutorial segments of Fallout 3, which were on rails to an extreme. The player had to learn how to shoot, they had to learn the various mechanics of the game through their stay in Vault 101 as they grew up, there was no room for freedom within this section of the game, and said introduction was fairly long. After completing the tutorial, regardless of where you decided to end it, you're asked to return to the saloon and introduce yourself to Trudy as she's essentially the town leader. Doing so has you run into Trudy while she's in an argument with a man named Joe Cobb. Joe Cobb is looking for someone, and he believes said individual is somewhere in town. Trudy isn't up for giving him any information on the subject. This is your first true exposure to the idea of factions. New Vegas is littered with small and large factions. The NCR are a fairly large faction, while Good Springs is a fairly small one. Joe Cobb belongs to a faction known as the Powder Gangers, a group of chain gang prisoners who were brought to the Mojave to build a railroad. Road, only to turn against their captors when given dynamite for the job. Players can choose to help Good Springs in this situation or help the Powder Gangers, and there's a clear karmic line between the two. Good Springs represents the good karma side of the choice. You can help individuals who are being bullied and attacked by the bad karma side, aka the Powder Gangers, and will for the most part be following these altruistic options when we can. Good karma choices will generally be the options we take the most, but we'll mention the bad karma options when possible. Talking to Trudy informs you that Ringo, a caravan, is holed up in an abandoned gas station just behind Doc Mitchell's house. Visiting said gas station introduces you to Ringo, who holds you at gunpoint. With no skill checks, the player can simply say that they mean him no harm, and he will immediately put his weapon away and trust you. I always thought this would have been the perfect time to offer a mandatory skill check, with some option of dialogue to get out of it if you didn't meet said skill check, but no, Ringo just trusts you. An outsider of the city that is not a Good Springs resident, and very well could be be a powder ganger. This is also your introduction to Caravan, an in-universe card game that can be played and one that I don't plan on going into too much detail with. The idea is that you construct a deck
deck and create caravans with said deck in order to beat your opponent in bids for various contracts. That is a very light explanation. I never enjoyed playing Caravan, especially not as much as I enjoyed playing Pazak in Knights of the Old Republic or Gwent in The Witcher 3. Offering to help Ringo sets you on a quest to get help from various key good spring citizens. Sunny Smiles will join you no questions asked, believing that the Powder Ganger is to be a problem that needs to be solved sooner rather than later as they will eventually attack the town regardless. Some of the other individuals you need to convince require a bit more work. Trudy is one of those individuals. There's two ways to convince her to bolster the morale of individual unnamed citizens so there's more hands for the battle to come. This is potentially your first introduction to skill checks. In Fallout 3, almost every skill check was possible to pass regardless of your skill, as it was percentage based and you could metagame through save scumming in order to get your desired effect every time. New Vegas answers this issue by making the skill requirements a hard number, meaning if you do not have 25 speech for example, you're not going to be convincing Trudy of anything. But the game throws you a bone here. If you can't convince Trudy through charisma or speech, maybe you can convince her with a well thought out plan that requires a sneak check. If you're looking at the footage at hand, you'll see that I meet neither of these. Even with magazines, a temporary skill boosting item, I still am one off from meeting the speech check. This is where things can get a little more nuanced. An item like a stealth boy can raise your sneak skill to 100 to make you near invisible to enemies. It's a means of allowing you to get out of sticky situations or sneak in somewhere when your skill for it may not be up to the task. But if our sneak skill is 100, wouldn't that mean we can now pass the dialogue skill check with Trudy? Probably not, right? The stealth boy isn't providing you with any mental knowledge of stealth, it's just making you invisible and the 100 plus to sneak is a mechanical side effect of that so the enemies won't notice you. But the game doesn't see it that way. Your skill through effects is your skill in dialogue, regardless of if it doesn't make sense, meaning we can stop by the Good Springs abandoned school, play through the hacking and lockpicking minigame, grab a stealth boy, use it, and then return to Trudy and convince her to help us. Obviously skill bonuses need some sort of category or flag to dictate if they carry over into specific skill checks like dialogue choices. It really makes no sense to be able to use a stealth boy and suddenly have master level knowledge of stealth, essentially turning you into a post-apocalyptic Sam Fisher or Solid Snake. That's not what should be happening here, and it feels more like an exploit than a smart play that was an intended mechanic. Skill books permanently raising skills by one makes sense, kind of. Reading a magazine to help you convince somebody of something or help you repair something makes sense, kind of. Regardless, Trudy is convinced to help and the next stop is Easy Pete who can provide dynamite via an explosives check. Moving on is Chet who runs the local general goods store and requires a barter check in order to provide leather armor to the citizens that are going to take part in the fight. Finally, Doc Mitchell will offer up stim packs without a fight, but the player can get a bit more out of him with a medicine skill check. I believe New Vegas' skill check system is overall an improvement on the one that was introduced in Fallout 3. It allows the player to meet certain requirements and forces them to fail if others are not properly planned out. This means that the player is generally not going to be able to hit every check unless they come back later, and that sometimes isn't an option. Subsequent playthroughs allow you to plan ahead for this, to maximize the amount of checks you'll pass as you reach them if you desire to. But this is generally not what will happen during an initial playthrough and can lead to the loss of bonuses and experience as successful skill checks provide them. You get bonuses for what you put your stats into, and you also miss out on certain aspects for those same choices. It's balanced in that sense. Before returning to Ringo, this is a good time to talk about the karma system in New Vegas. Outside of a role-playing aspect, the karmic system isn't super noticeable outside of what notifications you receive for actions you perform. In fact, it's very easy to get full good karma in this game regardless of if you make multiple bad karma decisions. Let's use Trudy's saloon as an example. Near the entrance is a second entrance that is locked. Picking this lock to exit leads to bad karma. There's also a terminal inside that also leads to bad karma if you access and hack it, which leads to a safe unlocking that will also lead to bad karma when accessing it. These are essentially four to five negative karmic checks within this one room alone, but if you're playing a good character who makes good choices, this will never matter. You can steal, pickpocket, and access anything that isn't yours and it will be overlooked and pushed to good karma based on the major choices you make throughout the game. Making a good morality system is difficult, and using the one that Bethesda provided in Fallout 3 is more surprising than anything else. Killing fiends and ghouls can provide plus 100 karma per kill, and that's to a maximum of 1000. It's comically easy to max out this stat, and much harder to lower it unless killing civilians. And outside of one companion in the game, 
potentially leaving you due to low karma, there is no real effect on the overall mechanics outside of your role-playing experience. In Fallout 3, your karma dictated which companions you could recruit. In Fallout New Vegas, this is almost a completely useless mechanic. Obsidian looked to fix and improve on a lot of what Bethesda offered, so it was surprising to see this mechanic be effectively turned useless. That being said, they did improve on it in their own way, and that was through the reputation system. Reputation is the player's social standing within any given faction. By completing quests for a faction or just doing nice things for them, the player will rise through the ranks of potential reputation levels by gaining fame. Tracked separately is the player's infamy level, which raises when they perform insidious acts, like killing civilians or getting caught pickpocketing or stealing. The player's standing is then gauged based on the values of each of these stats combined. If you're within a high fame threshold and have no infamy, you can be raised all the way to idolized status, but if your infamy begins to grow alongside your fame, you can move down to dark hero and eventually wild child. These are neutral reputations in a sense, as you've done so much good, they sort of overlook your bad, but you can lose out on bonuses this way. Additionally, getting too infamous with little fame can lead to factions becoming openly hostile. Bonuses and the range of fame and infamy are dependent on the faction at hand. Helping good springs can lead to discounts from Chet and Trudy, and you can even lock yourself out of Ringo's questline if you manage to build up enough of a negative reputation beforehand. Maybe that's why he's so willing to trust you early on. You technically have a fairly neutral standing with good springs at the start. Overall, the reputation system is a very welcomed mechanic that I believe should have replaced the karmic system entirely. Instead of karma, people judge you based on a combination of actions and inaction. I can even believe that the only reason the karmic system is still in this is because Bethesda most likely demanded it. Returning to Ringo and informing him of whether or not you managed to convince the individuals I mentioned previously will trigger Sunny Smiles to show up and inform you that the Powder Gangers have arrived. Depending on who you convinced, you will have various different experiences overall. With everyone convinced, your citizens will be armed with weapons, dynamite, and leather armor, making the shootout fairly trivial. The less you convince, the harder the fight will be, and the easier it will be for you to suffer losses. Overall, the questline is a fantastic example in terms of introducing the player to how Obsidian likes to handle quest progression and player choice. Every aspect of the quest, once accepted, has a level of modularity to it. Various bonuses can be attached to the quest in order to make a better result overall. You don't even end up going through with this quest as you can choose to side with the Powder Gangers instead. This has less options within it overall, but offers a clear choice right at the start and still allows the player to be introduced to several skill checks and moral choices regardless. The character you built and how you plan to roleplay them will dictate what is available to you by the climax of this quest, and many other quests within the game are tailored to follow a similar ideology. Upon defeating the Powder Gangers, as we have chosen to do, Ringo will praise the player for his help, offer him a reward in caps, and ultimately offer a greater reward when we run into him again later on. In terms of interaction and quest lines, Good Springs essentially becomes stale at this point. Everybody goes back to exactly what they were doing before, except Ringo is no longer there and the Powder Gangers are no longer a threat. So where do we go from here? Well, asking around about Benny and the people who helped in your attempted murder points you in the direction of the Strip but it's not so easy to access it, and I'll explain why shortly. Benny knew this as well, and therefore took a different path. If the player is to follow them, they are directed towards a neighboring town not far off known as Prim. There's a choice presented to you by this point in the game. You can head south and follow Interstate 15 in order to take a long route through various settlements that will lead you along the quest for revenge and answers in terms of the men who shot you in the head. Alternatively, there is the opposite direction of the I-15, an option that is the road less taken. Despite New Vegas being within sight of Sloan, the construction camp beside the local quarry, approaching Sloan has players stopped by Chomps Lewis, who informs you that the road ahead is infested by Deathclaws. If this is your first foray into the series, you may not know what Deathclaws are, and that's excusable. Deathclaws are ruthless creatures, ones that can attack you while ignoring your armor rating. Sure, you can kill the odd young Deathclaw stragglers around the area, but one adult is most likely going to be too much for you at your current 
level, with the area ahead infested by them. Deathclaws are potentially the biggest wild threat within New Vegas and Fallout in general, but New Vegas has one or more species that we'll look into later, and said species can give Deathclaws a run for their money. So south it is, and while there aren't Deathclaws infesting the roads ahead, there's plenty of powder gangers for us to deal with, and they're less than happy about how we treated their friends back in Good Springs. This is where faction armor becomes a more prevalent mechanic. Generally speaking, I don't think I ever actually found myself using faction armor all that much within my general playthroughs of the game, but it does have key advantages here and there, the most obvious of those being its ability to set your infamy rating back to neutral while wearing it, meaning if you wear a set of powder ganger armor, NPCs that would originally be hostile to you will no longer attempt to attack. In fact, this allows us to enter the NCR correctional facility down the road without worry of being shot on sight. It makes sense to stop by said facility early on as well as it is directly connected to one of our main destinations, Prim, which we will be heading to shortly. On the way it's good to mention the atmospheric quality of the game's OST and sound effects. New Vegas, without any radios, gives off an eerie feeling of isolation within the Mojave. The groans and moans of the instruments leave you feeling defensive, and every interaction you make with various NPCs on your travels can feel a little threatening in their own right. Are people who they say they are? Are they looking to help you or stab you in the back? A lot of people are out there for themselves and themselves only, leading to a lot of confrontations throughout your travels where individuals are far less than genuine in how they present themselves to you. None of that matters, however, as most players are going to be navigating into their Pip-Boy and turning on Radio New Vegas, baby. New Vegas has two major radio stations, Mojave Music Radio and Radio New Vegas. Mojave Music Radio is a non-stop station purely for playing some old-timey country and western tracks, stuff you'd expect to hear in a time before the bombs fell back between the 40s and 60s, although some of these songs were made as early as 2003. Radio New Vegas is a little more than that. Similar to Fallout 3's Galaxy News Radio, Radio New Vegas is hosted by a DJ, that being Mr. New Vegas, whose soothing voice and character charismatic attitude is used to draw in listeners. Mr. New Vegas is an example of a mechanic within multiple open world games where the player's actions can be seen to have taken effect through news stories on the radio. Grand Theft Auto was probably the first to popularize this, and it's been a staple of open world games with radio stations for years to come. The effect of the radio in New Vegas, in my opinion, removes all of the intended atmosphere from traveling the Mojave wasteland, but not necessarily for the worst. Rather, it's a choice that the player gets to make. Do they want the feeling of isolation and danger throughout their travels, or do they want to trek along Highway 95 while listening to Johnny Guitar, Jingle Jangle Jingle, Blue Moon, and many others? It's up to the player, and while on subsequent playthroughs I like to experience the isolating nature of the desert from time to time, I always find myself returning to the radio and blasting Big Iron throughout. Approaching the correctional facility with powder ganger armor attached prevents you from being attacked, but it doesn't necessarily fool the guard at the front gate, who will still need to be paid 100 caps in order to enter peacefully. Within the visitor center are multiple no-name powder gangers alongside Myers, whose sole purpose is related to a prim quest line we'll come back to later. We're not here for Myers or any of the small-time powder gangers anyway, we're here to meet Eddie. Eddie runs things around the facility after the powder gangers took over, and he has some jobs for you to take care of as an alternative to him killing you right then and there. I Fought the Law is a short quest line where you help the powder gangers with a few various tasks before ultimately leading to an NCR assault on the facility. It starts simply enough with Eddie asking you to deal with another powder ganger named Chavez, or former powder ganger I guess you could say. Chavez has broken off from the main group within the NCRCF and is shaking down travelers on his own with a few other deserters. If your speech skill is high enough, you can convince him to leave the area. If not, like Super Rad Jr. here, you're forced into an altercation, leading to either your death or theirs. Regardless of how Chavez was dealt with, you can return to Eddie who has another task for you. This time there is a merchant looking to sell around the facility and he hasn't been run off yet which is suspicious to Eddie and he tasks you with investigating. It's around this point I ran into Barton Thorne who claims his girlfriend is being attacked by geckos up by a nearby ridge. Heading over to the location he mentions and dealing with the geckos brings you to a stash on top of a cliff and our first encounter with the Wild Wasteland trait. Wild Wasteland's entire function within New Vegas is to cause weird, scripted sequences to take place. 
Shortly after leaving Good Springs, for example, you can find a fridge with a hat similar to that of Indiana Jones, which references a scene from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, where Indy hid in a lead-lined fridge to avoid being killed by a nuke. It's pretty absurd, and this is a way for the developers to poke fun at that. Similarly, on the ridge we're met with a corpse of Johnny Five Aces, a character from an abandoned video game concept called Zyborn Clock, something that was mocked constantly on the Something Awful forums. With the area safe, Barton approaches you and explains that this was all a ruse so that he could kill you and take the stash. A fight ensues and then we quickly move on towards the merchant we were here for in the first place. An intelligence check of 6 or a speech check of 30 allows you to dig into the merchant's business business within the area. He admits to being a bounty hunter and can be convinced to be sent on his way, though I ended up killing him anyway, I don't think there was a karmic reason not to. Again, not that karma really matters in this game. Returning to Eddie for a potentially final time has him inform you that he is worried about the NCR potentially coming to take back the facility and tasks you with heading to Prim to find out information before reporting back. This is why hitting up the NCRCF early is a nice way to pace the player towards Prim. It gives a second, additional reason to head there outside of chasing Benny, and in a way helps the role-playing experience for people that want to head to Prim, but don't necessarily want to follow the main quest line. Approaching Prim alongside the highway, you're stopped by an NCR soldier, informing you that the town has been overrun by powder gangers who have broken off from the pack. When asked if they will be attacking the correctional facility, the soldier has no idea, and informs you that Lieutenant Hayes may have more information. When asked why they aren't protecting the town, you're informed that they aren't under NCR jurisdiction, and even if they were, the NCR are too short on supplies to do anything about it. This is an interesting situation that we'll touch on in just a minute as it helps better paint the priorities of the NCR and showcases how they aren't necessarily the good guys they portray themselves to be despite performing good from time to time. In terms of finding out about the correctional facility, there's multiple ways of going about it. Lieutenant Hayes won't tell you anything unless you pickpocket a trooper for military orders, but there's another way of going about this that involves heading further into the actual town proper. Heading across the bridge to Prim, you can watch out for and disable mines along the way. After dealing with a few powder gangers turned escaped convicts, you can head into the Vicky and Vance casino where the remaining townspeople are held up and armed to the teeth. Seriously, I'm pretty sure if the town felt like it, they could easily take the neighboring hotel back without any issue. Something the NCR could do as well if they wanted to, though they claim they can't. Instead, it's in the hands of you, an individual, but not just yet. Instead, we can talk to Johnson Nash for a variety of important topics, those most obvious being information on Benny and the cons who attacked you. Johnson will inform you that the sheriff has been murdered, but his deputy who was captured in the hotel may have information that you're looking for, thus encouraging you to head inside and save both the deputy and the town. Nash works for the courier service, and handing over the order for the platinum chip you were carrying allows him to give you more details about how the delivery came to be. It turns out Victor, the cowboy securitron from Good Springs, was the one to put in the request, along with five other orders. Six couriers were hired to deliver various casino-related goods. You had a chip, another individual had a pair of dice, another courier had a chess piece. The more interesting dialogue is about how you weren't the first one who was asked to take the package. Instead, another courier saw your name next on the list and turned down the offer, demanding that you take it instead. I looked into it and asked around because I didn't remember this dialogue being in the original game before the DLC. The courier in question is an individual named Ulysses, who is the main antagonist of Lonesome Road, a storyline DLC that takes players into the Divide. Originally, Ulysses was going to be a recruitable companion character, but that never panned out further into development. Still, one of Obsidian's and New Vegas's greatest strengths is tying narratives together, and so getting some insight into a character from a DLC I would consider almost a second finale to the game is rather thrilling upon additional playthroughs. We'll learn more about Ulysses near the end of the video, but in the meantime we still need to ask Nash about the NCR's plans for the correctional facility, either through a bribe, which we can cheapen, through bartering or through convincing him with a speech check. I've mentioned it before, but this is one of New Vegas' greatest strengths within quests. Regardless of your skill level, there's always hidden paths or possibilities that can help you get to your desired outcome. Nash was just a means of doing this, but we could have pickpocketed a trooper like mentioned beforehand. Nash informs you that the NCR are planning a raid on the facility, which sounds a little silly when you take a second to think about it. Due to jurisdiction and chain of command, the NCR are unable to help the innocent civilians 
Harding and Prim, who are openly under assault by individuals from the same facility that the NCR managed to lose due to giving dynamite to convicts. They don't have the supplies to help Prim, but do have the supplies and manpower to attack the correctional facility. It doesn't really add up, or rather, it shows the motivations of the NCR, shows what's important to them, their property. The NCR doesn't own Prim. It isn't under their jurisdiction, and therefore it is of less value to them. Human life is less valuable to the NCR over the property that was taken from them, especially when said property was simply a prison used to perform slave labor on a railroad. And that's exactly what this is. Slave labor. The convicts are cartoonish in a way within New Vegas, but they're still humans. Still individuals. Ones who don't necessarily deserve to be worked against their will. It's odd to see the Legion portrayed as villainous for owning slaves and pushing their will on the Mojave, while the NCR is doing the same thing, just under the social construct of laws and justice, rather than the social construct of an empire. Both of these individuals are inherently doing harm to humanity, but the NCR does it in a way that we, as a society, value more. We value innovation and progress, and we see that through the construction of these laws and imaginary systems we create to better control civilization. Law is made up, capitalism is made up, and we choose to accept it, and many choose to see it as naturally good because it can lead to innovation, something that many also consider naturally good. Whether innovation is truly a natural good for the evolution of the human race isn't the point of this video, but it showcases that the NCR and the Legion are much more similar than the NCR would have you seem. We just accept the NCR's will a little more than the Legion's. The NCR doesn't care about helping civilians, they care about getting their slaves back, and that's something you can help them with if you choose to. This isn't a defense for the powder gangers. Even with their freedom now, they still instill harm onto others. They shake down civilians, try to take down towns with violence. We've already seen this in Good Springs and have to decide how we're going to handle their existence or if it's even our problem. These are a lot of assertions without fully expanding upon them, and that's because the politics of the NCR and their comparison to the Legion isn't the entire point of the video. Rather, I want to look at the key points throughout the game that are designed to make you question just how morally good a militant force actually is. New Vegas is a game designed around making you question the politics and militarism of our everyday lives. It's a mirror of our society that we can look into and form observations of our own. We have two options within the scope of the game. We can warn Eddie about the oncoming assault or we can help the NCR. Warning Eddie leads to the assault taking place and no reputation lost with the NCR. However, the troopers who assault the facility will be naturally hostile to you and engaging with them could lead to a rise in infamy. Instead, we're going to side with the NCR in this one for the sake of it, both due to the danger the powder gangers impose and due to the fact that they become less prevalent to the point of not mattering at all very shortly afterward. Heading over to the correctional facility and talking to Sergeant Lee will begin the assault, with NCR troopers spawning in and swarming the grounds after a breach in the gate. The only actual individual that has to be killed is Eddie, but all of the powder gangers along the wall will be hostile. Surprisingly, the gangers in the visitor center will not be dealt with by the NCR, even after the fighting has ceased, meaning entering it is still hostile territory, although Myers won't fight you as he is still quest relevant. With Eddie taken care of, NCR troopers will now loiter around the area. You can return to Lieutenant Hayes to deliver the news, and he'll congratulate you for it, but there's still the issue with Prim, which the NCR still isn't willing to deal with, despite the facility not being a factor anymore. To get more information on Benny, we need to save Deputy Beagle, who is being held hostage within the Bison Steve Hotel. There's a few ways you can enter the hotel proper. A broken down set of roller coaster tracks can allow you to get in through the upper level balcony, but the front door is as good an option as any, especially with a surplus of stealth boys and silenced weapons. Skyrim wasn't the only Bethesda game to popularize the ranged stealth build, let me tell you. Traversing the hotel is simple enough. There's a few convicts to take out along the way, and if you have the lockpicking skill for it, you can open a door that will take you straight to Beagle without needing to deal with too many hostiles. Though, we'll be taking them all out anyway for the experience and items. It wouldn't be a Fallout slash Elder Scrolls game without looting every corpse we come across. We can convince Beagle to tell us about Benny right then and there if we can pass the skill check for it, but most likely you'll be releasing him first and maybe convincing him to help you kill the remaining convicts. Regardless of how you did it, once Beagle is outside, he will tell you about how Benny and the cons moved on from Prim and began traveling towards the next town over, that being Nipton. We're not done in Prim just yet, however, 
however, there's still one more quest for us to take care of, as well as the ability to unlock our first companion. Prim is sheriffless, and Beagle is both unfit for the role and also refuses to take it, meaning it's up to you to find someone to take care of the town in your absence. There's three options for this, one of those being Myers from the correctional facility. Since Myers is one of the potential candidates, he isn't openly hostile to you when shit hits the fan during the raid, and regardless of your reputation with the powder gangers in general. In order to get Myers to take on the task of sheriff, he needs to get a pardon from the NCR. Alternatively, you can ask Hayes to have someone from the NCR take over and officially put Prim under their jurisdiction. If you've been following my views on the NCR in general up to this point, you might think both of these options sound less than desirable. Luckily, there is a more neutral alternative. Within the Vicky and Vance Casino is a Protectron known as Prim Slim, who can be reprogrammed through a science skill of 30 or with specific miscellaneous scrap items. This allows Slim to become the sheriff of the town and also leads to Beagle losing his deputy status. I'll let you figure out which option we chose. With the town considered safe, there's one more stop we can make, right by the corpse of one of the six couriers who has been shot dead. This specific courier was carrying the pair of dice I mentioned earlier. Within the Nash residence, which also seems to be the building for the courier service, is a damaged enclave iBot named Eddie. Players can repair him with a very high repair check of 65, but can lower this with a similarly high check of science at 50. This lowers the repair check to 35. Alternatively, items can be used to repair him instead. Eddie is most likely the first companion you'll run into within Fallout New Vegas. You can have up to two with you at one time, one pet companion and one humanoid one. There's two pet companions in the game, the first being Eddie, and the first humanoid companion will be meeting shortly, although they won't be joining us immediately. An important mechanic of companions is their related quest lines that each comes with. How these are triggered and progressed is unique to each companion, and worth doing for each one due to the various rewards granted to the player, as well as upgrades to the companions themselves. Eddie, for example, has a set of logs within his file system that can be triggered via hearing specific keywords. There's plenty of NPCs that you can talk to who act as said triggers, and these logs lead into the greater quest arc for Eddie specifically. In the meantime, the next destination for you is Nipton, but there's one detour to make along the way, that being the NCR's Mojave Outpost. Around this point in the game, there's a good chance you've obtained at least one Sunset Sarsaparilla Star Cap. Like in Fallout 3, drinking soda bottles provides you with the cap that was attached to said bottle since within the universe Universe, caps are used as the main form of currency. Sarsaparilla is specific to Fallout New Vegas, though Nuka-Cola still exists as well. What makes Sarsaparilla special is the 5% chance of you receiving a cap with a blue star underneath it. Once the player has collected at least one of these through drinking the beverages until they find one or finding one in the wild, the player will trigger an event where a man by the name of Malcolm Holmes will approach them. Malcolm starts off the conversation under false pretenses. He acts as though he wants to trade with you, but this excuse quickly crumbles crumbles as he doesn't find himself to be a good liar. The true reason Malcolm approached you is because he witnessed you getting a star cap. How this is possible is unknown, as there are many locations where you could receive the cap that Malcolm simply couldn't have been able to be there at the same time. This requires another suspension of disbelief from the player. You're forced to play along with the idea that Malcolm saw you get one of the star caps, even if you were inside a building that Malcolm couldn't realistically have been in at the same time. It's a jarring occurrence and not the only time this happens. Excuses like this from the developers can temporarily pull you out of the roleplay or immersive aspect of the game, while you have to mentally justify that this is somehow a logical setup for a quest, even though it clearly is not. Malcolm gives you the rundown on the mechanics involved with star caps. There's a legend that collecting 50 of them will lead to unimaginable treasure guarded by an enigmatic individual known as Festus, who we'll meet later. People will get so riled up about the legend that they'll actually attack one another if they know you have star caps. Asking Malcolm if he is a collector leads to him denying that he collects any more and ultimately wouldn't tell you if he was anyway for his own safety. That being said, killing Malcolm reveals that he does have caps on his person, so whether he collects them or not is still up in the air, but he doesn't seem too willing to give them away, suggesting that he is still actively collecting, but isn't someone who would kill another for it. I generally have this interaction with Malcolm immediately after leaving Prim, assuming I received a star bottle cap within that time. Near Prim is a highway patrol station, and within one 
one of the cells is a corpse with a star bottle cap. Further down towards Nipton, you have the opportunity to witness an altercation between two individuals, Thomas and Jacqueline. It's up in the air who will kill who and can be different every playthrough, or determined by your intervention. Both will tell you the same story, however, that they were attacked by the other for their star bottle caps. Thomas, however, has a journal on his person which sheds a bit more light on the subject. It seems he ran into Jacqueline who began seducing him on their travels, only to ultimately attempt taking his lucky star cap necklace, suggesting Thomas didn't actually have any knowledge of their perceived value. There's more to the star bottle cap questline once you've reached New Vegas and obtained 50 caps for yourself, but that'll be saved for further down the line within our adventure. Before reaching Nipton, there's a good chance you'll make note of a large statue off into the distance of two members of the NCR, specifically a desert ranger and a Nevada ranger, acting as a symbol of their unification into the NCR. This is in front of the Mojave outpost, used as a base of operations for some of the NCR, as well as a stopover for caravans that want to go further south. No one's going anywhere south, however, as the roads are essentially closed. There's a lot of frustration emanating from this area, not for the player necessarily, but for the NCR and the caravaneers that are stuck there. The Mojave outpost is understaffed. Their job is to protect the interstate and those traveling along it, but after the prison break at the NCRCF and the establishment of the outpost at Prim, NCR forces have been stretched thin. You'd think that this would mean our interventions at Prim and the NCRCF would lead to the outpost being fully operational again, but this isn't the case. While Prim is still not under NCR jurisdiction, and while the NCRCF has been taken care of, one can reason that after the battle there's still a lot of manpower that would need to go into getting said facility operational again, meaning that the outpost at Prim may still be considered necessary even with Lieutenant Hayes leaving after everything is said and done. The lack of manpower has led to a lot of danger surrounding the interstate further south and a backlog of caravaneers who are stuck and frustrated about this fact. Rose of Sharon Cassidy, aka Cass, is one of these frustrated individuals as well as a potential companion within New Vegas, although we can't recruit her just yet. Talking to Cass allows her to explain how her caravan was hit and destroyed with nothing taken, leading her to believe it was the Legion who are making more and more of a presence within the West. Now, with nothing to do and nowhere to go, she's stuck at the outpost and drinking her sorrows away, which only seems to frustrate her further. She suggests that you check out the Crimson Caravan branch south of Vegas if you're looking for work. We'll come back for Cass later, but there's a few things we can do to both boost our supply and gain some fame with the NCR. Talking to Ranger Jackson gets us a job involving exterminating some giant ants down the road. It's nothing special, but it's on the way to Nipton and coincidentally, Ghost, a sniper on the roof of the outpost, would like us to go recon the area, considering no one has come out of the town for some time. Nipton is more of a spectacle than an actual town. It's set up for you to arrive at and essentially witness a stage play performed by the Legion, with this most likely being your first interaction with them upon starting the game. You're first met with Oliver Swanick at the entrance of the town, an ex-powder ganger who can be seen cheering in victory. Approaching Oliver has him inform you that he's won the lottery, but doesn't go into much detail further than that before running off and out of the town. Right beside the two of you is the Nipton General store, and inside is another powder ganger by the name of Boxcars, who is forced to permanently sit down due to having his legs bashed in by hammers. What exactly happened here? Boxcar explains that he and a group of other powder gangers arrived at the town and made a deal with the mayor to hold travelers hostage and essentially strip them for everything that they have before turning them loose. Nipton is considered a bit of a cesspool to the surrounding inhabitants of the Mojave. It's a known stopover for individuals looking to partake in what Nipton is truly known for, sex work. The mayor saw this as an opportunity to make some money by essentially trapping travelers who showed up for it. But then what happened to Boxcar and the rest of the town? Enter the Legion and the Lottery. The town was taken over by Legion forces, and as an act of judgment on the town, Volpez and Kulta, the leader of the group of scouts and spies known as the Frumentari, handed out lottery tickets to every individual within Nipton at the time. First came the lucky losers, who would die a quick death if their number was called. Following this was crucifixion, for those called next. It's important to point out that this isn't exactly like the popularized imagery of the crucifixion of Christ, 
just for the most part it is, but the developers seem to have opted for tying individuals to a cross rather than nailing them to it. And this is still fairly accurate to the capital punishment that took place all the way back in the 6th century before Christ. There's nothing you can do for the individuals at the time. All of the NPCs on crosses within Nipton are so near death that to remove them would be to simply kill them anyway. So you can choose to leave them up there to die slowly or put them out of their misery. It's your call and ultimately doesn't affect any part of the narrative, though it would have been an interesting choice to give the player in terms of karma, and where the developers think the act of mercy killing lands on the karmic dial, if you can even classify it as that. Remaining civilians were killed, enslaved, and Boxcar, who was second place, was ultimately set free but not before having his legs broken with hammers. Oliver was then essentially the true winner of this system, being the last one standing. So you can better understand why he was so happy to be free and less interested in being classified as a powder ganger any longer. As a side note, you can attack Boxcar here and he will simply stand up from his chair fully able to walk and attack you. It's not that he was lying, but more that this just didn't seem to be accounted for by the developers. I'm sure they knew about it, but most likely didn't care. We want Boxcar alive anyway, as he is a key NPC within a side quest, one that I am unsure will be featured in this video. Approaching the town center, you're met with the Legion who have control over Nipton currently, with Volpez and Kulta, the leader among them. You can fully converse with the character as he has bigger plans for you at the time, and attacking that many Legionaries at once is less than likely to end up in your favor. Volpez explains his motivations for the actions that took place in the city, calling it a town of whores that had no moral standing for the individuals that walked through it or partook in its services. This gives us a bit of an outlook into Legion values. Kaiser's Legion centers around purity and being holier than thou, seeing acts of weakness and cowardice as things that need to be punished and determining it is their duty to punish those that fall under these categories. While many saw Nipton as a cesspool, but ultimately not a danger or a problem, the Legion sees a virus or blight, one they don't want to see spread, and one they feel a moral obligation to stamp out, in such a way that no one should ever try it again. They hate cowardice and weakness, but look to instill fear into the people of the Mojave, to exert their will, absorb communities by any means necessary, and ultimately punish those who fight back to the point that they no longer exist. It's oddly contradictory. The Legion cares about strength and purity, but kills those who don't fight back and kills those who do in an incredibly violent manner in order to send a message. What the Legion really seems to care about, or what Kaiser himself may seem to care about, is power. And to obtain that power and to create his empire, he has used violence, totalitarianism, and brainwashing slash intimidation to exert his will. And those in power within his regime have drunk the Kool-Aid. Those who don't either don't rise through the ranks or get punished to the point that it will most likely lead to their death if not intense physical punishment. Remember how I said that the Legion is inherently evil? This is what I'm talking about. They are meant to stand as a moral contrast to the NCR even though we can see some similar structure between the two. Both the NCR and the Legion utilize slavery. Both the NCR and the Legion exert their will and take what they want by force. The Legion will commit atrocity after atrocity to send a message and the NCR will do little to help those individuals unless they are under their jurisdiction. You may not think the NCR are as bad as the Legion, which I believe to be true as well, but the comparison shows you the cracks of the NCR's moral high ground, how they are not an inherent good within the Mojave, but may not be an inherent evil necessarily either. Well, except for the slaves. They do have slaves, and that's pretty evil in my eyes. Vulpus instructs the player to deliver a message to the NCR back at the Mojave outpost, specifically that they are here in the Mojave despite not having control of the dam and are spreading. He wants you to instill fear into the hearts of the NCR with this news of what happened to Nipton, how the town outnumbered the Legion but all were too scared to fight back against them, simply waiting and hoping that their time would not come in terms of the lottery, something Volpez sees as an unforgivable weakness and also how he views the rest of the Mojave. The psychological factors that go 
into people standing up to an oppressive regime are not so easily labeled as weakness, even from a man that gets erect when he burns a mayor alive on a tire fire. There's not much more to do within the outpost. We can pass Volpes's message along, which forces this one NPC to go down a depressive spiral, we can report back to Ghost, who is sorry to hear about Nipton, and we can report back to Jackson, who will give us a service rifle. With Nipton out of the way, we need to keep moving further down the I-15 to find Benny, and this will take us to a new town and our first human companion. Heading to Novak is when you'll most likely start running into various patrols around the wasteland, specifically NCR and legionary patrols, but also groups of merchants and doctors sprinkled in between. Legionaries are openly hostile to anyone, including you depending on your fame and infamy with them. By this point in the game, you most likely haven't done anything to openly aggravate them, meaning they won't be hostile towards you, but that shouldn't matter. The legion patrols the Mojave and attacks anyone on site regardless of if they are NCR or simply merchants. Yet you, someone considered as much a neutral party as a doctor in the wastes, are not targeted at all. Our first interaction with Volpez makes sense. He had a task for us, and he let us live to complete said task, but these patrols realistically shouldn't know who you are, nor care by this point. If the Legion is pushing into the Mojave, capturing civilians, creating slaves, and attacking the NCR, you should be just as much a target as the rest, especially since you most likely have NCR fame by this point. This isn't a huge detrimental flaw within the reputation system, and you'll see later that we end up pissing off the Legion anyway and immediately rectify the situation. The only real issue here is their seeming neutrality towards you doesn't seem to make a ton of sense based on what we have been presented within the setting of New Vegas. Close to Novak is a large, more traditional town off in the distance known as Camp Searchlight. It was originally occupied by the NCR but ultimately attacked by the Legion who set off some sort of radiation bomb that heavily irradiated the entire area, both causing feral ghouls to spawn as well as hostile NCR ghouls on top of them. Searchlight is littered with ghouls and there's a few ways you can deal with that but before entering the town proper, players can enter the cellar of the local church and run into several scavengers who are looking around in there. Logan, the leader of the group, informs you that he's looking for radiation suits so that they can pillage the town and ask for your help if you are computer savvy in any way. A minimal science check will allow you to hack into the nearby computer and see that a shipment of radiation suits were ultimately taken around Nipton by individuals who didn't look like NCR troops. This is where Boxcar comes into play and ultimately the reason he hasn't been killed yet, if that's what you're looking to do. Boxcar is the only one left alive who saw the shipment and points you along your way to a cave that is housing the suits you are looking for, as well as one individual suit for yourself. You can bring these suits back to the scavengers and ultimately take them with you while shooting your way through the town. You make two stops along the way, one in the local police station and one in the local fire department, looking to grab items and miscellaneous parts labeled as NCR. Once you've found everything, the group turns on you and you ultimately have to kill them. There's not much to this quest, I most likely wouldn't have even mentioned it if it wasn't such a large town leading up to Novak, as well as the connection to Boxcar I mentioned previously. It's an excuse to make your way through an irradiated town, there's even a giant rad scorpion fight to go through if that's your thing. You can tell that there is no real layering or choice to the quest that is missing here since killing Logan doesn't fail the quest like Boxcar would have but instead completes it. There's a few other quests relating to Searchlight we'll go over later on in the journey, but one can be completed now. All of those ghouls you've been murking with Logan and the gang were NCR soldiers, and as such have dog tags attached to their person. The player can talk to Sergeant Astor about the radiation and searchlight, and he will ask you to collect dog tags of all of those turned feral. One of the soldiers is actually still sane, just chilling in a house minding his business. You can kill him, convince him to go attack Astor, or convince him to give you your tag to get the final one before returning them all to the sergeant. Novak, or no vacancy, if you didn't see that on the sign before, entering the town is a community centered around a motel and a tourist attraction giant T-Rex. Asking around about Benny points you towards one of said snipers, a man named Manny Vargas, but there's something we can do within the town before that. Talking to Nobark, the resident crazy person if you can call him that, allows you to learn about how the cattle of Novak have been getting periodically attacked by invisible creatures. Talking to the owners of the ranch informs you that this happens almost every night around midnight 
midnight, and taking the time to watch the cattle around midnight allows you to witness the approach of a nightkin concealed by a stealth boy. Nightkin are a type of super mutant, individuals that have been turned into Hulk-like creatures and lost the greater part of their intelligence and reasoning skills. Nightkin specifically are super mutants addicted to stealth boys, and prolonged use of stealth boys have led to even more neurological issues within the nightkin specifically, including schizophrenia, which we will get an example of later. By killing the nightkin and informing the ranchers that their cattle is now safe, you'll gain enough fame in Novak to be recognized by the population. In fact, talking to Jeannie Mae Crawford, who runs the motel, you can get her room for free due to your reputation. There's still plenty to do here, however. Talking to Manny about Benny, for example, will have Manny ask us to help him out first as a means of trade. Turns out there's an infestation of ghouls at the local Repcon facility, and he wants them cleared out so the community can salvage the area for parts as this is their main source of income. Manny is the day shift sniper within Novak. The night shift sniper is a man named Boone who happens to be the first human companion we can actively recruit, but he has some work for us before that's possible. Boone has lost his wife. She lived in Novak with him, but ultimately was taken away by slavers. He knows this to be true, and so this isn't an investigation about what happened to her, but rather an investigation into who set it up. He asks you, an impartial stranger to the community, to begin looking into it as it should raise less suspicion this way. Boone gives you his beret, and asks you to bring an individual you believe to be the culprit to the front of the giant T-Rex with his beret equipped. This will be the signal that they are the culprit and he will take care of the rest. Asking around about Boone's wife informs you that she was essentially hyper-privileged and let people know it. She came from a posh society, and wealth and living in Novak wasn't in any way what she was used to, something she would rudely voice fairly often. It can be pointed out to the player that this was perceived as a coping mechanism to handle the harsh life of the Mojave, but that doesn't change the fact that it may rub some of the other civilians the wrong way, and ultimately seem to be what led to her demise. While this may have been the cause, this doesn't mean it was deserved, especially when the individuals that purchased her were members of the Legion. The easiest way to find the true culprit is to head into the reception area of the motel where there's a safe that can be picked. Alternatively, you can steal the key from Crawford. Inside of the safe is a bill of sale, acting as evidence for the sale of Boone's wife between Crawford and the Legion. You can bring Crawford to the front of the giant T-Rex at night, equip the beret, and then watch as her head explodes via Boone shooting her dead. There's a few things that point to Crawford being the culprit. Culprit, mostly how hostile she can become when the town is talked down on in the slightest. This is something you can see right away when talking to her for the first time and have the ability to apologize for. With it so easy to set Crawford off, it'd be no surprise that she was the one to orchestrate the events against Boone's wife who was so openly against Novak as a whole. Everyone else in the town comments on her attitude but ultimately reasons why she is the way she is, through the tough transitional period of privilege to the harsh reality of the wastes. The only other suspect is Manny, who who was known to be openly hostile and argumentative with Boone's wife, to the point that Boone and Manny had a falling out within their friendship. Since there's two major suspects, the only way to be sure is via hard evidence, which we get with the bill of sale. It's an interesting quest, and ultimately allows you to do a bit of asking around at detective work before snooping around. You even have the freedom to frame some of the inhabitants of Novak and have them murdered instead, but this leads to a karma loss and ultimately locks Boone out of being a companion. Speaking of that, returning to Boone allows you to explain to him how you knew it was Crawford and then ask what he will do from here. You can offer for him to travel with you and speed up the process with a high intelligence check that mentions how snipers work in pairs. This is a good point to discuss a few more mechanics about companions. First are their bonuses, with Boone offering the spotter perk and Eddie offering the enhanced sensors perk, both of which are fairly useful moving forward. Players have access to these perks as long as their companions are in their party. Spotter causes enemies to glow red when using iron sights and enhanced sensors essentially gives the player a 10 in perception, allowing them to notice both hostile and non-hostile NPCs on their HUD from the maximum distance possible. It also allows you to target cloaked enemies and vats, which is normally not possible and will force a 0% chance to hit if you try. I mentioned earlier how Eddie has a set of triggers that will unlock playback of logs he has saved on his drive. One of those triggers is from Old Lady Gibson at Gibson Scrapyard, and we'll be stopping there during our quest to clear out the ghouls within the Repcon facility. Boone, on the other hand, is more complicated. He 
has a mechanic known as history points. Players that have Boon in the party and complete certain tasks will get a predetermined set of points, with five being necessary to unlock his companion quest and relative upgrades. Boon hates the Legion as an ex-member of the NCR and for what they did to his wife, doing things like completing certain anti-Legion quests and helping the NCR against the Legion in specific quests can help build his history points throughout your journey. This game even lets you kill the Legion leader Kaisar at any point you deem fit and that alone gives you two history points with Boon. There's one major flaw with this mechanic however, the individual has to be in your party when you complete these tasks and said tasks may not be completely obvious in terms of offering these points. If you don't recruit Boon or if you have another companion with you at the time and complete all of the possible events that would raise his history with you, you ultimately lock yourself out of his progression quests. Ultimately, it's understandable why they decided to do it this way. If the individuals aren't with you, how would they see your actions and ultimately build rapport with you? But for gameplay's sake, I think there needed to be some sort of alternative here. If you clear a camp of legionaries for the NCR, or if you are the person to kill the leader of the legion, you should be able to at least convey that through dialogue and maybe evidence to Boone so that he can still build up to his side quest. Before heading out to Repcon, you may be surprised to run into Victor, the cowboy Securitron here. Victor doesn't know why he's here when you ask, simply feeling compelled to travel the path towards New Vegas, and essentially meaning you will see him on your travels as you progress as well. Additionally, Novak is home to one of the first unique weapons you may find on your playthrough, that gun. Unique weapons are generally a completely new weapon or a reimagining of existing weapons with several bonuses. That gun, for example, offers an incredibly high critical boost, but was ultimately difficult to repair without the jury rigging perk or the release of the Gunrunner's Arsenal DLC, as there was no weapon similar enough to it that it could be broken down. The Repcon test site is for testing rockets specifically, and comically designed ones at that. It's also infested with both ghouls and nightkin, as you will see shortly. You can find several corpses along the way of ghouls in robes and dead nightkin. At the entrance of the site are several feral ghouls that can be taken care of before heading inside. Once inside, you are immediately met with the voice of one sounding like a ghoul over an intercom, who gives you instructions to reach a point in the facility where you will meet with them. Not all ghouls are feral. Several of them remain sentient and can live through radiation as well as many years longer than typical humans. Making your way through several more ferals will eventually lead to the back of the building and up multiple staircases to find the hiding spot of several sentient ghouls and one human. The human, Chris Haversom, is a unique individual due to him believing he is a ghoul while clearly being perceived by everyone else as a human, even by the ghouls surrounding him. Further into the back of this area is Jason Bright, a sentient glowing one, ghouls so full of radiation that they glow a green light. Jason is seen as a messiah to the ghouls surrounding him. They follow him in what could ultimately be considered a religion, or more so a cult if you want to be overly pessimistic about it. Thoughts on religion versus cults aside, Jason clearly believes in what he preaches, that being visions he has for the far beyond, in a radiated sanctuary for him and all of his followers where they will get to live in peace. Jason sees you and Chris as individuals sent to him by an enigmatic figure known as the Creator, who will help him and his flock essentially make it to the far beyond. The main reason Jason needs your help currently is because he and his group are trapped within the upper levels of the facility due to demons, those being several nightkin who attacked them on sight. One of said demons interacted with their group through the intercom and told them to stay put for their own safety. They've been stuck up there ever since, and Jason is asking for your help in solving the situation by any means necessary. Heading into the basement, the player will run into several hostile nightkin unless they take a more stealthy approach. In fact, taking out too many nightkin along the way locks the player out of resolving the conflict via a more peaceful approach. As you progress through the basement, you will come into contact with a non-hostile nightkin by the name of Davison. While not hostile, Davison is still suffering from the effects of the stealth boys, to the point that he believes a nearby deer skull named Antler can talk to him. Antler appears to be the reasoning side of Davison personified into an inanimate object, a way for his rational thought to be conveyed to him. Antler informs Davison that the player may be of use to them as they were informed through a shipping manifest that there is a large shipment of stealth boys delivered here. There's only one room left for them to search, but it is being guarded by several traps and a ghoul who is hostile towards the nightkin and has killed several of them. Additionally, if you kill too many nightkin along the way, which you will likely be forced to if caught, Davison will be openly hostile with you and lock you out of further peaceful progression as I mentioned previously. This might sound like an annoying requirement for you as a player, especially if you haven't 
haven't been leveling up your stealth stat, but the developers accounted for this. You're in a testing facility full of dead nightkin. It makes sense that you would find several stealth boys along your exploration through the facility, and that's exactly what happens. The player can grab several stealth boys specifically to help them with this task and prevent them from running into the nightkin before they are no longer hostile. Davison gives you a key to the last room to search, and upon entering, you're met with Harlan, a ghoul mercenary who doesn't necessarily buy into all of Jason's religious mumbo jumbo, but ultimately appreciated the company and, through his own omission, seemed to protect the group so he could sleep with all the women there. After the initial attack of the nightkin on the ghouls, Harland and several others were pushed into the basement where they ran into even more nightkin, thus sealing their fate. However, Harland managed to make his way into the room at hand and ultimately seal himself in with several traps scattered about. Harland also refuses to leave unless you do something for him, that being finding out if one of his friends is still alive after getting kidnapped and jailed by the nightkin. The answer is, she isn't, and effective use of stealth boys will allow you to head towards the jail and ultimately kill the jailer to get a key and find their dead body. Once you deliver the bad news to Harland, he'll abscond, but you also could have simply killed him and been done with it. It's up to you as a player. Regardless, you can now navigate over all of Harland's traps to reach the shipping log computer and find out that the stealth boys were sent in error and ultimately returned to sender. Informing Davison of this irritates him, but Antler believes you and the knight can ultimately leave peacefully. Returning to Jason has all of the ghouls, including any ferals you didn't kill within the interior of Repcon, head into the basement and towards the launch pad of three rockets that Jason plans to use to launch him and his flock to the far beyond. Now, it should be noted that Jason's feelings about this are genuine, but it should also be noted that this is the dumbest idea from any NPC potentially within the entirety of New Vegas. It's so unimaginably stupid to think that these rockets are going to go anywhere other than the ground. Well, they'll fly, but not very far and not for very long. The ghouls also get these silly spaceman suits, and you can pick one up for yourself as well. Talking to Jason here allows you to inquire a little bit more into Chris. Originally, the ghouls tried to convince Chris that he was human, but ultimately failed in doing so. After realizing how technologically adept he was, they planned to allow him to work for them under the assumption that he would be joining them, but the radiation surrounding the launch and expected to be within the far beyond would kill him, meaning Jason has lied to Chris about all of this. You can choose to chew Jason out about using Chris, but ultimately, in my opinion, this is what Chris always wanted, and you can convince him of this fact after breaking the bad news to him. A speech check of 50 lets you get through to Chris about the fact that he is truly human. In fact, the only reason he believed he was a ghoul was because he grew up in a vault and was bullied. Ultimately, it was the loss of his hair that acted as the final straw that broke the camel's back, and had him go full goblin mode, or ghoul mode. Chris is pretty livid about this revelation because he feels used, but Jason didn't mean any ill will towards him over this, to the point that the ghouls revere Chris as a saint in their eyes, and you can convince him of this and also convince him to move to Novak after all is said and done. There's some maintenance to be done on the rockets before they can launch. In particular, Chris needs thruster modules designed specifically for the rockets as well as Isotope 239. The thruster modules are easily found within Gibson's scrapyard. You can pay for them, barter for them, or use a perk to get them for free. You can also simply steal them after picking picking a lock. Since Gibson is the first person we talk to with the Eddie trigger, this will begin his first recording. The isotope is a little more open-ended. The giant T-Rex shop in Novak actually has several rocket ships which contain some sort of irradiated component. Five of these rocket toys will be enough to continue the quest, and this is usually how I go about it. However, you can follow a quest marker that takes you to a dead pack Brahmin and find a sealed isotope out in the open. Returning these items to Chris allows him to get the rockets ready to fly. If you went the other route, and allowed Chris's rage to lead to revenge, you could instead gather items to sabotage the rockets, but we're nice people and ultimately going to send these dudes on their way. Once everything is set up, you can head to the launch tools and pull the lever to start the process. An intelligence of four or less will allow you to mash the buttons on the machine until you ultimately sabotage the launch. A science skill of 55 or higher will allow you to actually improve the launch slightly, though this doesn't really matter outside of a karma bonus. Once the launch is complete, Chris will head to Novak and you'll gain a large chunk of fame with the people there. Talking to Manny will complete the quest and have him divulge that Benny and the cons were headed to Boulder City, further north of here, giving
giving you your next destination. It's good to talk to Benny about Boone here as he will explain their history as snipers of the NCR, as well as the massacre of Bitter Springs, which is required dialogue to start Boone's companion quest later on down the line. We'll talk about Boone's past more as we come to it. In the meantime, we're going to head north. Boulder City is a decent distance away from your current location, and there's a few key areas worth stopping by before we get there, namely Nelson, Camp Forlorn Hope, and Helios 1. Nelson is a mining town taken over by the Legion after they fought off the NCR in the Battle of Nelson in 2281. Now the town is used as an outpost for the Legion and also a location where they keep NCR prisoners. Approaching the town has you stopped by an NCR ranger named Milo who needs help in sneaking in or around Nelson in order to put several crucified NCR soldiers out of their misery as a mercy killing. If you recall the Nipton section, I talked about the concept of mercy killing the settlers and powder gangers who were crucified within the town and how the developers may look to explore that or place it on the karmic dial. Luckily for you, this is the exact quest that looks to explore this. While the individuals in Nipton were too near death to save, there's more you can do for the NCR prisoners within Nelson. Despite not being able to dissuade Milo in his plan, Milo's thought process makes sense. He has troopers with him, but as he is a ranger, he has no leverage over them, and the troopers are too green and terrified of conflict to be of any help anyway. Saving the prisoners is too dangerous for one or even two individuals, with the game not accounting for the fact that you have Boone and Eddie by your side. Considering how the Legion treats their prisoners through violent torture and slavery, Milo believes that the only course of action is to put said prisoners out of their misery, and this is therefore the only thing you can agree to if you plan on helping him. Milo agrees to cover you while you go down there and put an end to the lives of the NCR prisoners, but Boone can comment on how you should forget that plan and simply save the prisoners while taking out anyone who gets in your way, and this is possible. No matter how stealthy you are, however, the minute you save one prisoner from crucifixion, you will be immediately targeted by Legion soldiers in the area leading to a firefight. You don't have to worry about the prisoners in this quest after saving them though, as it's you and only you who are targeted by the Legion's attack. This quest is pretty straightforward. You can either save the prisoners at the cost of a firefight or quietly put them down. The end rewards of the quest don't really change based on your actions, but this quest does provide history points with Boone, those being one point for killing them and two for rescuing them. New Vegas normally does a good job of putting you in a hard to choose situation when it comes to doing the right thing. Sure, you can save the NCR prisoners, but they're in the middle of a well-guarded settlement, at least in theory. Mechanically, outside of a role-playing reason, saving the prisoners is incredibly easy and trivial. Players simply need to interact with each of the three and untie them. From that point, they're flagged as saved. More difficulty in keeping the prisoners safe and the actual threat of the Legion in the settlement would have provided a more impactful decision for the player, as keeping three unarmed NPCs alive against a large number of Legion soldiers would be much more difficult. Returning to Milo allows him to mention how you're a hero and he has some egg on his face. Within the actual setting of the game, Milo is pretty justified in not wanting to engage against such opposing numbers, so he takes it on the chin when congratulating you. Completing this quest along with everything else we've done for the NCR nets you enough points to be recognized by the NCR, and this is a good time to point out how we have been doing a lot for them, while simultaneously doing nothing at all for the Legion. The Legion is an interactable faction in New Vegas. You can complete quests for them and gain fame, but due to our choices thus far, we have a rather high level of infamy for them that we get an opportunity to absolve later on, and we'll use that as an opportunity to interact with the Legion slightly and explore their methodology and quest design before ultimately moving on from them. In the meantime, there's many more opportunities to deal with the NCR as they are the prevalent force within the Mojave. Nelson is directly tied to Camp Forlorn Hope, an NCR base of operations not far north of the settlement. Stopping by with our current fame allows the NPCs to welcome us with open arms, happy to see someone that has been such a useful friend of the NCR show up at the time we did, especially since there's so much going wrong at the camp at the moment. What's most interesting about this location is the morale system. The main questline, Restoring Hope, tasks you with completing various assignments that culminate with an assault on Nelson in order to take it back from the Legion. The morale system is raised by completing local quests in the camp that can raise the morale from 0 to a necessary maximum of 9. The more morale the player has by the climax of Restoring Hope, the stronger their forces will be when retaking Nelson. It's a good way of conveying progress to the player, watching the camp go from being a rundown mess of tired soldiers to a little better off and even successful in why they're there to begin with. In the main quest proper, you're first tasked with finding a lost supply shipment that didn't make it to the camp and are directed towards Helios 1 to find out more information about it. You can talk to Lieutenant Hagrid 
Haggerty there for more information on the shipment, but it's ultimately unnecessary as you can find the shipment not far off surrounded by dead NCR troops. Picking up the supplies triggers an ambush that you have to fight your way out of before returning the supplies to the camp. Following this, the next task is to help Dr. Richards with several wounded soldiers in the nearby medical tent. What's nice about this section is that you can complete everything easily with a high enough medical check, up to a maximum of 75 I believe. With the check being so high, there's an alternative involving the use of various medical equipment, most of which can be found around the tent. The only thing you can't find in there is one super stim pack and two out of the three required medics. Luckily I ended up remembering seeing some medics near the Repcon entrance and I had plenty of super stims from, I'm assuming, the DLC. After some backtracking, it's fairly simple to save each of the patients. You can attempt to help the patients through medicine with a low skill, but will ultimately end up killing them in the process. These two major tasks are the only thing you need to complete before being sent off to Nelson for an assault, but as mentioned, you can raise the morale of the camp through several other tasks that aren't part of the Restoring Hope questline. I didn't opt to do that here, and even with simply succeeding in the main quest, we still have enough troops to be more than enough, especially since you've already dealt with Nelson yourself earlier. Once you've taken out the Legion leader within Nelson, you can report back to the camp for fame and experience. This is also around the point you may receive an NCR radio for having such high fame with them. The radio can be used to give you a temporary follower who can die unlike your normal companions. It's usually for things like assassination attempts or when accidentally running into raiding parties, but overall the NPCs are so slow to show up that the fight is usually over by the time they get there. Moving on to Helios 1, we get our first introduction to a faction known as the Followers of the Apocalypse. The facility is a giant solar plant at a glance, but there's a bit more to it than that, with the NCR ultimately fighting for the location against the Brotherhood of Steel who fought tooth and nail to keep it before being pushed to retreat. Lieutenant Haggerty points out how the plant isn't generating as much power as it's worth in guarding it, especially after taking it from the Brotherhood of Steel, a faction known for their proficiency in old world energy weaponry. Heading inside allows you to meet with Ignacio of the Followers of the Apocalypse. You can talk to him and convince him that you're a neutral party, which makes him more comfortable in divulging information to you. Ignacio is only there out of curiosity. He observes that the Brotherhood fought harder than you would expect to hold this facility when it is seemingly only a power plant, and there are documents and logs suggesting there's more to the plant than just that. If the Brotherhood were here and defending it as they did, there's most likely weaponry involved, and Ignacio would like to see the plant up and running again in order to stop the NCR from poking around and finding something that could potentially be too dangerous. Ignacio mentions a keyword that keeps coming up, Archimedes, and we will see this name come up again shortly. Ignacio isn't the one in charge though, that's actually an individual by the name of Fantastic, who somehow convinced his way into the position despite being a drug addict with no real experience for the job. Talking to Fantastic informs you that the targeting mirrors are misaligned currently, meaning that the plant is working at minimal productivity. By getting two terminals outside to talk to the mainframe in the tower, we can then head to the tower and align the mirrors to begin producing a large amount of electricity. Fantastic mentions that if you are to head to the mainframe, make sure to send the power to the right place, and there's a few choices for that we can look into when we get there. But Fantastic wants power diverted to the New Vegas Strip and the NCR's Camp McCarran, as this is what will get him paid. Each of the terminals has their own issue in terms of being interacted with. The first terminal is covered in traps, and the second one has rabid NCR dogs that attack on site, though killing them won't result in fame lost. Once both terminals are set and talking to the mainframe, you can head inside the tower, but before that it's good practice to grab all of the scrap mirrors lying around as they can be used later when we finally interact with the boomers. The issue with the tower itself is that its defense mechanisms are online, and there's both turrets and robots for you to either fight against or disable on your way to the elevator that will take you to the mainframe. Once through, there's still the issue of fixing the connection to the mainframe, and this can be done in a few ways, either by fixing the generator or powering up a nearby robot to fix it for you. Once the mainframe is fixed, we can choose where to divert power, with the options being McCarran and Strip, which is the NCR option, Fremont and Westside, which would power the poorer areas of New Vegas, the full region, which gives power to everyone but leads to frequent brownouts, or the full region at emergency output levels, which will overload Helios 1 and make it non-functional. Finally, there is the Archimedes 2 option, which will divert the power to a space satellite that has a giant laser attached to it. For the sake of bringing it up later, we're going to choose the Archimedes option. This is good for the retrospective, but also pleases Ignacio as the NCR will stop poking around and he has no idea where the power actually gets diverted to. Personally, I would normally choose the full region option as this is the most good you can do within
in the quest in my opinion and also allows you to get the most rewards from Ignacio. No matter which option you choose outside of overloading the plant, you can choose to also arm the facility's defense systems, which will fire a giant laser down onto all of the NCR below, leading to a large infamy gain and no real rewards. This is kind of like the Megaton choice in Fallout 3, where you decide whether or not you will nuke the town, but ultimately this is more of a side option overall rather than the crux moral choice we saw in the previous game. We're gonna put a pin in Helios 1 for now, but we aren't far off from learning what we've just accomplished there and how it can help us in the future. Now it's time to continue on to Boulder City and see if we can finally track down Benny. During the Battle of Hoover Dam, Legion soldiers were led into Boulder City by the NCR as a trap before the NCR ultimately blew it up. It's considered one of the more major events to take place during the battle, and a lot of NCR soldiers lost their lives during the conflict. In particular, you run into one soldier, Private Kowalski, who lost his brother while attempting to save civilians. Kowalski hangs out in front of a memorial that looks to honor those lost in the battle, including his brother. An interesting mechanic that you may not expect is the ability to shoot at the memorial only to be reprimanded by Kowalski. You have the ability to speech check your way out of this, but Kowalski doesn't seem like he'll talk to you further afterwards. Further into the town is Lieutenant Monroe, who isn't letting anyone into the city's core due to a standoff between the NCR and several members of the Great Cons. NCR troopers heading from Novak came under fire by the Cons and ultimately were taken hostage. Now reinforcements are attempting to get them back, but fear that the Cons will simply kill the hostages if they advance. You can offer to help with the situation, which Monroe will agree to, but not before pointing out he has no idea who you are. I was taken a little aback by this dialogue due to our involvement back at Camp Forlorn Hope. The developers seem to take care in making sure that the player is recognized for their efforts when helping a specific faction, to the point that the NCR quests may have additional dialogue where the individuals you interact with recognize you, but this isn't the case here. To Monroe, you're nobody and he's never heard of you or your exploits despite the fact that several people high up the chain do. It seems like an oversight on the developer's part, but you can explain away the issue by assuming Monroe was a little too busy to know about one do-gooder in the Mojave Wastes. Regardless, Monroe accepts your help and you get to enter into the town proper as a neutral third party, technically. There's a lot you can do here depending on how you want to handle things, especially since the cons involved within this conflict are some of the ones who dug your grave and ultimately were complicit in your attempted murder. You essentially have three major options here. We either free the hostages via negotiation, free them through violence, or kill the NCR to help the cons. Considering you've been chasing after the cons and Benny for all of this time, it makes sense to at least interact with them first before making your decision. Heading into the con hideout brings you face to face with Jessup, who was eagerly awaiting your demise in the opening cutscene of New Vegas. He's justifiably shocked to see you here, as you are effectively a ghost he watched die back in Good Springs. One of the other cons seen in the cutscene, McMurphy is also in the hideout, but ultimately seems to have succumbed to his wounds, implied to have been inflicted by the NCR. Talking to Jessup, you can ask him a bit about the Platinum Chip and Benny. Ultimately, Benny betrayed the cons and ran off with the chip before paying them, and Jessup has no actual idea what the chip is or what it's supposed to do, questioning why someone would make one out of Platinum. Benny apparently has made his way back to the Strip, and this is ultimately our final destination in terms of locating him. This doesn't mean we're going to reach it anytime soon, however. A speech check of 45 lets you convince him to release the hostages so the NCR can escort the cons out peacefully, which he will agree to without much of a fuss. In turn, he provides you with a signature glider that belonged to Benny and seemed to be dropped on their journey throughout the Mojave. Returning to Monroe leads to a new problem. He's just received orders to attack the cons, hostages or not. What is it with the NCR and their willingness to let hostages die as soon as any situation gets a bit hairy? It's not like the cons are legion either. They're considered raiders, sure, but there's more of a chance to reason with them over the legion by a mile. This is a non-issue anyway, as you can simply convince Monroe to let them go as the plan has already been made and agreed upon. There's no checks here either. It's a pretty laid out, can I go against my orders moment for Monroe, and all you need to do is say, yes, Obviously, you moron, you silly fool. Of course you can go against your orders here in order to save all these lives. Why would you listen to your higher-ups over this one, you bootlicker? Okay, maybe bootlicker was harsh. Or maybe it isn't, since the dude had to consider if he was going to wipe out an entire group of individuals who agreed to a peaceful conclusion. That's the NCR for you. Listen to orders no matter how dumb they are until a wandering superhuman courier shows up to tell you otherwise. With the cons leaving and the hostages safe, we can start making our 
our way closer to New Vegas, but there's a lot of hiccups along the way. First and foremost is our third run-in with Victor, who is also making his way to New Vegas. After briefly discussing what happened with the cons as well as Benny, he'll be on his way and we can choose to follow him if we want, but it's ultimately unnecessary to do so. Instead, we're going to walk north slightly to the 188 trading post, just ahead where you meet another potential companion, and one of my personal favorites, Veronica. In terms of the overarching story of New Vegas in the DLC, both Eddie and Veronica have the most involvement within. Neither can actively accompany you into the DLC, in fact, no companions can, but there is a similar Eddie model in Lonesome Roan we will meet later, and Veronica has strong ties to an individual we will run into during Dead Money. It's really cool to see, and I will take a moment to praise how well New Vegas ties its DLC storyline into not only the base game, but between the DLCs themselves. Characters from one DLC may have had an impact on other DLC, and it's one of the most interesting aspects about them, seeing how everything weaves between one another. Veronica looks like a settler and not much else. She has a cheery personality, which is a big contrast to Boone, but there's more to her than meets the eye, and she explains that to you after offering to join you on your adventure. Veronica comes from a bunker, and she wants to see the world in order to build her own perspective of the world and societies that live within them. You can take Veronica with you by swapping out one of your human companions, but we're not going to do that just yet. Boone already has two history points, and he's hopefully going to get two more shortly after. One major line of questioning Verona asks you about is your feelings towards the Brotherhood of Steel. It's pretty obvious that she is a member. She makes remarks about living in a bunker with a big family, all of whom can handle themselves, and even if she's not at home, there's plenty of others who can take care of themselves out there and provide. Veronica will stay here for now, but we'll be back to see what she has to offer us in terms of storytelling. New Vegas is in sight, but as you can probably see from the footage, there's plenty of surrounding areas to explore and plenty of quests for us to deal with before even reaching Freeside. One such area is known as the Aerotech Office Park. Here we meet Frank Weathers as well as Captain Parker. Frank has lost his family after trying to strike it rich in New Vegas. He lost them to Legion slavers after running away, something you can find out after completing an intelligence check questioning why he's alive. Captain Parker, meanwhile, has a few issues of his own. There's people going missing around the park, and there's an individual named Keith in the community both selling drugs and cheating people out of their money via rigged gambling. I potentially wouldn't even talk about these two quests in particular, but Franks is going to take us to Cottonwood Cove, a Legion stronghold, and Parker is going to shed further insight into what the NCR is really like. We're going to backtrack a fair bit here after agreeing to help Frank find his family. Family. First, we're going to head all the way back to Prim so we can discuss a major feature in New Vegas, gambling. The Vicky and Vance Casino is not functional upon your first visit, but after dealing with the events there and then dealing with some NCR deserters, it does eventually become operational once more, and so now is the perfect time to discuss gambling before it's all we're doing in New Vegas proper. Gambling in New Vegas isn't fair. At all. It's completely based around the player's luck stat, which is honestly a nice touch. A luck stat of around 5 probably allows you to play what feels like a fair hand of blackjack, while anything lower will see you losing more often than not. A luck stat of 10, however, makes you the best gambler this strip has ever seen. Players can land on 19 in blackjack and then choose to double down while still managing to get 21 somehow. It's that powerful. To offset this, players can only win so much before being permanently locked out of gambling entirely, this being true for each casino. Every functional casino in Vegas has a limit on the overall earnings a player can make, and multiple checkpoints that can be reached that will ultimately interrupt your gambling so they can bestow upon you various prizes on the house. Think of high rollers getting comped food in hotel rooms. You're probably spending a lot of money there, and they want to keep you doing so, as generally the house always wins. Not Mr. House, though. He'll get what's coming to him. This is all good and fine until your overall earnings reach a certain positive threshold, in which a manager will run up to you and inform you that you can't gamble there any longer as you are costing the casino too much money. They may say this fairly meekishly or more aggressively depending on the casino. Generally speaking, there are three major choices in terms of gambling. You have slots, roulette, and blackjack. They all function as you would expect them to, and you can alter your bets based on how much you'd like to spend per game. My personal favorite to play is blackjack. I find that even without a high luck stat, you can still come out on top more often than not by playing the game at least somewhat smart, although I'm no expert on its intricacies. But New Vegas cheats you based on luck anyway, so there's only so much you can do. After taking Prim for all it's worth, it's time to head back towards Camp Searchlight and a little further east to reach Cottonwood Cove. Cottonwood 
Fort Cove is a Legion stronghold and slave camp. The only reason we weren't here earlier is because it directly relates to quests from both Camp Searchlight and the Aerotech Park. In fact, completing the Searchlight quest in a specific way, the way that we will be completing it, ultimately causes the quest with Frank to fail before we even meet him. The best course of action for this quest is to simply discover Cottonwood Cove without being detected and then teleport back to Searchlight as Sergeant Astor will now have new dialogue for you, asking you to go plant a bug within the camp and find various pieces of intel so that they have a better idea of what is going on in there. If you're chummy with the Legion, which we're not, you can side with them and give false information to Aster, but since they are hostile on site currently and we don't really like them, we're not going to bother. After sneaking around with your abundance of stealth boys, planting a bug on their radio, and getting several pieces of intel, you can return to Aster, who thanks you for your service and a job well done. There's more you can do here, however, as you can offer to wipe out the camp for good and completely remove the Legion presence by yourself. Aster thinks you're a little crazy, but, you know, in a good way, a little quirky death machine sort of way that the NCR really appreciates because they love killing dudes. I think there's actually a clip I have of an NCR dude being a little too on the nose when he says the streets will bleed red from anyone that disagrees with us bringing peace to the Mojave, or something along those lines. If I find it, I'll clip it here. Nelson will serve as example. We'll bleed the ground red with anyone who opposes our peace. <laughs> There's a couple of ways you can deal with Cottonwood Cove. The most efficient way, and the one that gets you the highest praise from the NCR, is to locate a nearby radioactive truck and unload a set of radioactive barrels from it. That will irradiate the area and kill anyone in the vicinity. This, in turn, can fail the quest for Frank Weather and is the reason we waited until now to do it. So first things first, you head into Cottonwood Cove, via stealth or not, and reach the prison where multiple slaves are being held, including Frank's family. When engaging with this family, Mrs. Weathers explains that, while not ideal, being a slave is still better than being with Frank because he was both a drunk and also highly abusive to them. You can free them, but ultimately they will not go back to Frank and you can break the news to him later. In the meantime, it's time to deal with the camp properly. Before activating the barrels, I personally like to take out the leader of the camp, as doing so while at this point in the quest should theoretically give Boone another two history points, meaning we only need one more to start his quest and we will get it shortly after this. Once the leader is dealt with, you can drop the barrels to kill the rest of the camp and then report to Aster for an additional reward. This quest, eye for an eye, is interesting for multiple reasons. Most prominent is how it ties directly into another quest and without prior knowledge or proper footwork on your part, you could essentially fail the quest by killing innocent civilians who are trapped by the Legion. There's multiple examples of this littered throughout New Vegas. Sometimes helping one faction locks you out of dealing with another. Sometimes your actions can kill people or cause consequences that will ripple in a way. They lock you out of previously available quests. It's something you have to live with, unless you're a save scumming meta player like me by this point. I doubt this would matter to the NCR anyway, since they seem to be so gung-ho about mercy killing anyone who brushes shoulders with the Legion. We can return to the Aerotech Park to let Frank know his family is safe, but ultimately not coming back. A speech check allows you to convince him to try and get clean. He says he'll attempt to do so as maybe being clean will bring his family back. I always thought that was a bit of a damaging thought process for him. There's no real guarantee that his family would come back at all after what he has done, especially with the abuse. Better for someone to move on for themselves rather than for the reunion of something he lost due to his actions. But Frank is a damaged man, and even when attempting to do the right thing, doing it for the wrong reasons kind of tracks. Now we get to deal with Parker, and oh boy, I cannot tell you how much I hate Parker. He's just one of the most spineless NCR members you'll run into during your journey. Parker has a few problems. One of those problems is a local resident named Keith who I mentioned happened to be selling drugs and scamming people out of money via caravan. You can go talk to Keith, and with a high enough speech check and barter check, you can get him to admit to both offenses and sell Jet to you. This isn't enough proof, however, and you need more to show he's been doing what he says he has. Luckily, there's a locked desk in one of the adjacent rooms holding his marked cards. Funnily enough, you actually lose karma for taking these. You actually lose karma for stealing from the Legion in Cottonwood Cove too. Really great mechanic you have there, guys. Once the evidence is presented to Parker, you can opt to join him in arresting Keith. Parker attempts to do so, but Keith refuses to go and insults Parker in the process, using the fact that his wife left him as ammunition. And this is where things take a weird turn. 
Parker doesn't simply arrest Keith here. He guns him down, an unarmed man, before simply walking off and being done with it. You can bring this up to Parker, pointing out he killed a man in cold blood simply for insulting him. He simply blames Keith for pushing his buttons, claims no one will miss him anyway, and pays you for your services. What the hell is going on with the NCR that is allowing this kind of conduct to happen? Genuine question. We've seen a lot of questionable things on their end, but killing someone in cold blood, someone you were to arrest, and there's unfortunately nothing for you to do about it. Even if you could mention it to another NCR member, would anything be done? Probably not, and the quest line ends here, so there's not much more to explore. Still, it's another look at the corruption that exists within the NCR. It seems anyone can join the NCR, and they don't do much to keep their ranks in check. We're not done helping Parker just yet, however. Despite his actions, there's still innocent people going missing, and we can choose to look into it for him, which we will do by beginning our journey along the outskirts of New Vegas towards the town known as Westside. On our way to Westside are a lot of attractions and sites that could stop us along our way, but there's two in particular I want to focus on, first of which is the Sunset Sarsaparilla Factory, where the soda is made. Heading inside, we're greeted by a mechanical NPC known as Festus. Turns out the reason he has persisted all these years is because he wasn't human and just a programmed guide to offer history lessons on Sunset Sarsaparilla. If the player has 50 blue star caps, they can deliver them to Festus to receive the big prize slash treasure for their endeavors. Unfortunately, the prize is simply the story of how Sunset Sarsaparilla came to be. It doesn't matter too much, but the synopsis is that the creator of the soda got the recipe from a random individual he met at a bar, and the story goes on to say that the stranger died soon after, so the owner made the soda in his honor. While I don't think it's confirmed anywhere, it's much more likely that the creator of the beverage simply killed the man who owned the recipe so he wouldn't have to pay him anything in order to use it and then concocted a story around his death to feign innocence. Obviously, this is a rather lackluster prize, but it's almost an expected outcome. Festus was created in a time before the nukes fell, and the company actually only created the contest by accident when people began to believe the star caps led to a prize. This was actually a misunderstanding the company decided to double down on as it was driving up sales by 300%, so the reward was kind of a last minute decision from a greedy corporation who probably didn't want to give anything too expensive to an individual who brought 50 caps to the plant. You can complain to Festus about this, and it seems several others before the war complained as well, as there is a set of doors further in the plant you are directed to that will have a proper prize waiting for you. The proper prize, he mentions, is a fake sheriff's badge that was mass-produced and equally as lackluster as the story we were fed by Festus. The real reward for the player is a bit further into the room, where you can find the corpse of Alan Marks, an individual who we were warned about earlier on who hunted down individuals for their star cap. Listening to a hollow log, it seems Alan managed to collect at least 50 caps before ultimately getting locked inside the prize room and suffocating to death. Kind of a messed up way to go, but I'm not going to shed a tear over a dude who is hunting people down for special bottle caps. You can take a unique laser pistol from his corpse called Pew Pew. It does enhance damage than a typical pistol, but costs 5 rounds per shot, so overall an okay reward for your efforts, but still fairly lackluster for the amount of work you have to put in to get 50 caps. Think about how much soda you'd have to drink. If you're going to give me diabetes, at least reward me properly for it. Right in front of Westside's entrance is a manhole with a label of the thorn above it. Heading inside introduces you to the arena of New Vegas, where you can bet on individuals fighting against irradiated wildlife and monsters, anything from rad scorpions to death claws. You can even participate to earn some caps, but it's nothing crazy. The real reason for being here is a quest I'm not going to go into great detail about. The proprietor, Red Lucy, wants you to collect various eggs from around the wasteland of various monsters. Doing so ultimately nets you caps and EXP, but the actual final reward is the ability to sleep with Red Lucy. It's a weird reward to receive for completing tasks around the wasteland and ultimately is useless outside of giving you the well-rested perk temporarily. We'll periodically grab eggs for the thorn as we progress through various other quests, but it's not particularly necessary to do so, nor is it incredibly relevant to the overall plot of New Vegas. Westside, on the other hand, gives us a glimpse of what living outside of Vegas is like, particularly a direct contrast of the high life within the New Vegas Strip, and the lows of poverty and the difficulties that arise with it. This is something we'll see a lot. Westside has its issues, but it's managing as best it can. People around Westside, not so much. Even Freeside, which we'll see much later, is particularly worse in comparison to the Strip, but overall much better when 
compared to other surrounding areas like Westside. The main point of interest within Westside is the Casa Madrid apartments, and in front of them is a super mutant named Mean Son of a Bitch. Mean lives within Westside doing various jobs, but mainly he deters raids by killing any fiends who wander into the town. The apartment proper is run by a man named Marco. Marco houses the rooms out to anyone, but it's the prostitutes pimped by Pretty Sarah that truly make the apartments well known throughout the wastes. There's a few other residents, including Tom Anderson of the Followers of the Apocalypse, who we will talk to later for Veronica's questline as one of the optional triggers to begin it. More importantly, Dermont and St. James live here, known around the area as simply scavengers. However, some investigating around the rooms within the apartment building reveal a ledger that details how the two have been kidnapping families and selling off their children, developing a routine to the point that they kill the parents along the way and only sell the kids. You can report to Parker with the evidence in hand in order to complete the quest, but you can also optionally confront the two men over their deeds, which turns them hostile. Killing them doesn't actually turn anyone else in the city hostile, though a few residents will complain that they're dead, in particular Marco, who is out to paying tenants. While Aerotech Park has been mostly taken care of, this is far from your last run-in with the NCR. While I mentioned it previously, it seems timely to remind you how the game structures itself. While you can interact and help the Legion along the travels, the progression of the game feels naturally inclined to provide more opportunities for you to interact with the NCR. They're stationed at Prem, the Mojave Outpost, Helios 1, and many other locations that are on your way throughout your journey, so it makes sense that you're going to be helping them and aggravating the Legion through natural progression mechanics within New Vegas, unless you make a conscious effort to not do so. And while New Vegas is still an open-ended experience, it'd be disingenuous to say it's not a guiding hand within some capacity. Many trails are designed to have you stop by key points that frame a narrative for your character and their progression and influence throughout the Mojave. You can bypass a lot of this, but it makes progression through the game harder than it would normally be. They give you the option, but punish you for taking it. Examples being the Deathclaw route earlier in the retrospective. Trails and routes are very deliberate as well, to the point that trying to bypass the mechanics of the game by using the mountainside, similar to Oblivion, is near impossible due to invisible walls that prevent you from doing this. New Vegas wants to give you a choice, but they also want to push you in the right direction so you see as much as possible within the story beats that make sense. But this also means you're more likely, as a general player, to be pushed towards the NCR, which the game likes to comment on fairly often. You see the best and the worst of the NCR through your journey, and it ultimately culminates within the endgame quest lines within the strip. Seeking out the Legion isn't necessarily easy. You don't actually get an invitation to meet with them until you deal with Benny, and even when you can help them, you're more likely to run into the NCR first, such as when we approached Nelson. The game wants you, at least on your first playthrough, to see as much of the NCR as possible, and this is most prevalent within Camp McCarran, an NCR-controlled airstrip base where you'll be spending a large amount of your time. Camp McCarran is realistically falling apart at the seams, something that seems to be a trend with the NCR. No matter where you go, the NCR's morale is low and logistics, or the Legion themselves, are effectively dismantling them until your intervention. It's the same here, plenty of issues around McCarran that you can involve yourself in to make the base an overall better place. Major Daughtry is one of the first NCR members you can run into, and he tasks you with taking out three fiends who have been terrorizing the area. In fact, it's not the Legion at all that's a problem around New Vegas, but raiders like the fiends that are stirring up trouble nearby. The fiends are drug addicts turned merciless raiders. They look to push territory and buy more and more drugs to keep their habit maintained. The three fiends you are asked to take out are Violet, Cook Cook, and Driver Nephi. Each of them are considered leaders within the fiends and unique within their own way. Violet, for example, has a pack of dogs she keeps close to her, one you can kill to take the brain of for use later. Don't ask me why yet. It'll make sense. Taking out two of the fiend leaders is enough for Daughtry to send out the first recon sniper squad from Camp McCarran to Camp Forlorn Hope, where we've already been. They can help you by offering advice when hunting the fiends, but it's ultimately unnecessary. We do want to interact with them at least somewhat before leaving, however, as there's a quest to convince one of the members, Corporal Betsy, to consider therapy for trauma she experienced at the hands of Cook Cook. I won't go into detail as to what happened to her, but the quest is an interesting one for the major reason of allowing progressive thought to be narrated in regards to mental therapy. In particular, the player can convince Betsy to seek help by explaining how a mental wound is similar to a physical one and requires professional help and support in order to heal. Obviously, there's more to it than that. Mental health is something many struggle with and may even feel makes them weak where a physical injury may not. People don't always take mental trauma seriously, and it's only been 
in recent years that we've seen a true popularization and normalization of therapy through means such as psychologists for even individuals that may consider themselves mentally healthy. This is something I always found New Vegas particularly good at, expressing progressive values around some time when it wasn't particularly popular to do so. This game came out in 2010. This was four years before the events of the Gamergate movement slash harassment campaign that everyone online was swept up into whether they liked it or not. The concepts of progressiveness and feminist critique were considered to be encroaching on what was considered to be a boys club for many and this was attacked under the guise of ethical conduct within games journalism. Ultimately, it culminated in an explosion of long-running social attacks and harassment from hashtag gamers against various women who were visible within the video game media scene. The reason I even bring this up is because I remember seeing many problematic individuals point to New Vegas as progressivism done right, but for the wrong reasons. Many of these individuals would often complain about in-your-face representation of marginalized groups. It was considered annoying, offensive, and disingenuous to them when any form of marginalized individual was featured in a game or any piece of media really that was more than just a passing reference. People would often point to one of your companions, Arcade Ganon, who mentions offhand how he is homosexual but doesn't make a big deal out of it. It made these individuals uncomfortable to be faced with the idea that marginalized groups of people could be front and center within the media that they consume. And the fact that their marginalization affects them and should or could be brought up within said media and this led to the backlash that we now know as Gamergate. But this is a gross misinterpretation of New Vegas' values. New Vegas doesn't actively shy away from the fact that the marginalized are disadvantaged due to the values of previous generations and their effects on the current population of our planet. How different cultures affect and ultimately limit or discriminate against marginalized people. You can have a conversation with Veronica, for example, about her first love, how this was a woman and it was actively looked down upon by her community because they had such high value in internal procreation. People that were considered homosexual could be forced to procreate with someone of the opposite gender or ultimately be shunned out of the community. New Vegas points out these issues. It shows that they exist, and that's what makes the writing of this game feel so strong in certain points. It allows the normalization of the marginalized within everyday life while still pointing out the plights that they have to deal with, even when a modern civilization is considered to be accepting of them. To claim that New Vegas handled progressivism well simply because Arcade isn't loud and proud of his homosexuality to the player is a gross misinterpretation of what the game is trying to convey to you. It's one example of many that are not so cut and dry in comparison and it's disingenuous at best, but ultimately shows how easy it is for certain individuals to contort the perspective of a work in Tunnel Vision one aspect of it, so that it fits within their narrative. It's ironic because that's exactly what the game is trying to explain to you is wrong, that the law isn't inherently good, that the community's best intentions may be wrong or damaging, as we'll see with the Brotherhood and as we have seen with the NCR, that there's still more growth to be done, and we have unfortunately locked ourselves into this capitalistic and religious trajectory that is ultimately hurting those around us that don't subscribe to the established norm. McCarran is one of the main ways to enter New Vegas. It has a monorail system attached to it that takes you into the strip proper, and this is actually one example of the options the player has in regards to getting in to hunt down Benny. It's a bit of a central focus for the quest lines within the camp, and we'll start these off with an interrogation against a Legion prisoner. Lieutenant Carrie Boyd has a very rare occurrence on her hands. Generally speaking, when Legionaries believe themselves to be on the verge of being captured, they'll kill themselves as to not divulge any info. However, a Legion Centurion opted to not do so and is now within the hands of the NCR. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, Boyd isn't having any luck interrogating him and can't resort to less pleasant measures due to those crummy prisoner of war laws that they have in place that require them to treat human beings as human beings. Really pesky logistics there, but what do we have here? A courier who is not affiliated with the NCR has appeared and somehow does not fall under the rule of these laws despite the fact that the legionary is still an NCR prisoner in an NCR base. So moral and ethical observations out the window here, you've officially been hired on as a consultant for the NCR and are introduced to the Centurion Silas before heading into the interrogation room. Said interrogation can go one of two ways. You either beat the shit out of Silas or you trick him through cunning and tomfoolery, more colloquially known as speech or intelligence checks. Beating him up is pretty straightforward. You unleash the fury on him over multiple intervals until he talks. You then get the option to have him tell 
you what he knows or kill him out of sheer rage or just so you can. It's a dumb route to go down in my opinion, but beating him senseless might also be your only option if you don't have the proper skill checks. On the other side of things you have speech and intelligence checks, each of which goes down a separate road to the same conclusion. Speech checks generally belittle Silas until he is so angry he feels inclined to explain his superiority to you through the information he has. Intelligence is probably the most interesting as you can convince Silas you're a legion agent sent to assassinate him. Initially, Silas won't believe you, but through various intelligence checks you can convince him to the point that he fears for his life, even calling for the lieutenant to rat you out. Not that it matters, as you aren't actually a Legion spy. Talking with Silas long enough gets him to accidentally divulge the information you're looking for before you admit to him that he was simply tricked. Bamboozled even. He was a foolish fool who fell for our genius brain trap. The information that Silas is holding isn't much, it's mostly just that there's a Legion plant within the base, but that already seems to be obvious to the higher-ups there. This is merely one step in finding out who said plant is and stopping their plan if you so choose. And you do because I do, and I need to show all of you what's happening so we can talk about it. There's a few small things you can do during this period. One individual who runs the supply shack is selling supplies on the side, and a particular trooper is requesting you get her husband's corpse back from the fiends, so he can be properly buried, which leads to this segment, since the devs probably didn't have the time to program in a proper animation for picking up a body. What we're most interested in is what Colonel James Shu has for us within the camp itself. Someone is getting the word out of patrol room routes for the NCR allowing the Legion to attack and put pressure on NCR forces around New Vegas. If you completed the interrogation by this point, you already know this, but you can offer to look into it and Shu directs you to Captain Curtis who is actively working on the investigation himself. There's a few people you can talk to about suspicious activity, but the main individual who actually knows anything is Boyd who will inform you of someone accessing a nearby control tower late at night for what she assumes is a romantic rendezvous between two troopers. Issue is, they aren't breaking in, meaning it has to be someone higher up who has the access. Boyd can give you access to investigate, and since the rendezvous are happening late at night, you can perch yourself behind some aircrafts and wait until midnight. Waiting a little bit earlier will let you see Captain Curtis, the lead investigator on the case, walk into the tower by himself. Sneaking into the tower allows you to overhear a discussion with Curtis and an unknown legionary. The main takeaway from the conversation is that the monorail I mentioned earlier has been rigged with a bomb and is set to blow within a few minutes, and it really will blow up if you aren't quick enough to defuse it. You can either sneak out without Curtis noticing you, or engage with him which will have him turn hostile. I believe you need to wait for him to attack you, otherwise you can turn various NCR NPCs around the area hostile, a bug slash limitation that is ever present within Fallout 3 in New Vegas. If the player can run to the monorail within enough time, head inside of it, and locate the bomb within the air vent, then pass either an explosives or science check, they can save it. Otherwise, the monorail will blow up and make it inoperable. This quest actually has a complete opposite side to it if you are working for the Legion and still on decent terms with the NCR, either through fame or by wearing their uniform. In this retelling, you confront Curtis and inform him you know who he is and that you are an ally with the Legion. You then plant the bomb yourself while framing another NCR member, guaranteeing that the monorail will be destroyed. The quest is, in a way, another look at how far the Legion has infiltrated not only the Mojave but the NCR themselves. Themselves. Curtis wasn't some new recruit, but an established member of the NCR, a captain with a history. If he was Legion, it means any others could be, and lays out an air of suspicion on the entirety of the individuals around any NCR base. These are dangerous times for the NCR and the Mojave in general. Legion aren't just a band of savages. Well, they are, but they aren't just that. They have an active spy network, and highly intelligent soldiers who have the ability and dedication to not only dedicate their lives behind enemy lines, but actively kill themselves to prevent the NCR from having any tactical advantage. They are highly dangerous through both dedication and ability, and if not for your intervention specifically, may have seen the NCR wiped off the face of the map. Maybe not with Mr. House there, but he still needs the platinum chip which is in the hands of a certain casino chair member who shot you in the head. Killing Curtis acts as the final history point for Boone. Throughout our journey and through collecting these points, Boone can slowly open up to you in dialogue about the death of his wife, which happened to be by his own hands after tracking her down to a Legion slave camp that he couldn't infiltrate. Being the only one out there and out of options, Boone chose to shoot his wife 
dead from a distance, something that haunts him to this day, but he feels he ultimately deserves for past transgressions involving the massacre of Bitter Springs that he was involved in. Boone feels rightly responsible for what happened there, and he believes that misfortune is now destined to follow him until his ultimate death. These conversations will eventually have Boone want to head back to Bitter Springs to see if it makes him feel anything or clears his head slightly. The journey there is actually fairly out of the way and off most of the main roads, meaning there's a lot of wildlife to run into, and in particular, you're going to run into a creature more frightening than even a Deathclaw, Cazadors. No, 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 wait, 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 Cazadors are a mutated insect created by Dr. Boris within the Big Mountain Crater, the central location of the Old World Blues DLC. They are fast, erratic, and incredibly poisonous, making dealing with them particularly nightmarish in large groups. As you level up, they become overall less intimidating from a mechanical sense, but their sheer speed is incredibly terrifying, even when compared to Deathclaws. Once you arrive at Bitter Springs proper, Boone wants to have a look around. He mentions a nearby ridge he was holed up during the conflict, where he goes into more detail about the events that took place. Bitter Springs was thought to be a base of operations for the raiding tribe the Great Khans, who had been attacking a nearby settlement. Due to the connections of one of the settlers, the NCR sent everything they had from Camp Golf over to Bitter Springs, thinking they'd be entering into a large conflict with the Khans. This wasn't the case, however, as Bitter Springs was more a home for Great Khan non-combatants than a gang hideout, meaning there were plenty of civilians such as children and elderly living there at the time. NCR soldiers engaged in conflict with the Khans after being spotted, ultimately pushing the civilians out the south end of the camp, where Boone and his spotter were stationed. As women, children, and the elderly began pouring out, they radioed in to confirm their orders, only for their major to freeze at the news, leading to a miscommunication that ultimately ordered the first recon to take out anyone and everyone that came out of the camp, resulting in the Bitter Springs Massacre. After Boone tells this story to you, you can respond in one of several ways. One of these responses can console Boone by telling him he was simply following orders, a rather damaging and problematic ideology that suggests soldiers cannot question the instructions of their superiors. The chain of command must be upheld until told otherwise by someone even higher up the food chain. If the NCR are simply following orders, no matter how misinformed those orders are, how are the individuals within the NCR any different than those of the Legion? The Legion has an evil leader and engages in evil actions, but the individuals within the NCR aren't innocent either. We just saw Parker kill a man in cold blood for talking back to him. Who's to say how many soldiers are going unchecked, and not just soldiers but higher-ups, who may be using their power to impose their will no matter how questionable it may be. To follow orders then is to be complicit. It may seem unfair to constantly be criticizing the NCR when, you know, the Legion is right there, but that's exactly what this game allows us to do, they set up an unmistakably evil faction to act as a mirror to the NCR, but what we are shown is that the NCR isn't this direct opposite they want us to think it is. The NCR is corrupt and not the ultimate good of the Mojave. The military and government in the real world is not ultimately good. Politics, individuals of power, greed, capitalism, and much more are factors that play a role within the individuals that govern or possibly control us. And this leads leads to ethical questions, moral questions, and ultimately corruption. There is evil in the world, but our leaders are not some unquestionable good in comparison. They're just not as awful sometimes. That's why you can question Boone on this, asking him how he could possibly kill people like that and Boone will point out that it's not necessarily that cut and dry. That from the eyes of a scope, you don't necessarily know who is a danger and who isn't, especially with the Great Cons. Although you weren't given any examples of kids or the elderly attacking NCR outposts, so it's ultimately a moot point. Realistically, Boone and many other soldiers ultimately feared for their own safety and used the excuse of orders to secure the situation and ease their own minds, something Boone realizes and questions every day. It's something that haunts him to the point that he believes he deserves to suffer until his death. Boone wants to sleep at the ridge for the night to think about his past, which you agree to, but are ultimately woken up to Legion raiders approaching the camp, potentially the largest amount you've ever encountered, and Boone points out that defending the camp will most likely lead to his death, giving you the opportunity to leave while he sacrifices himself. He believes this to be the karmic conclusion to what he did here in the past, and the 
end of his life. Helping Boone fight off the Legion isn't the easiest affair, but it's ultimately not that bad either, especially this far into the game. You most likely have enough offensive skills to deal with the various members that sprout up. Once they're all defeated, Boone is surprised to be alive, and is now ultimately confused as to what is supposed to happen to him. I think the best thing you as a courier can convey to Boone here is that he ultimately is what he does within the world. If Boone is looking to repent, then he needs to do good. You are only what your actions make you out to be, and Boone ultimately wants to help people. No one is punishing Boone for his actions at Bitter Springs. They're all in his head. All he can do is persevere and continue doing good in the wastes. He can be set on a better path for the future, although this doesn't excuse his past. It's similar to real life. Your past bad actions and behavior may have hurt people, and while you may have changed for the better, ultimately the people you hurt do not owe you forgiveness. Life forces us to live with our actions and the consequences. It's up to us to move on and do better, just like it is now up to Boone. Boone unlocks a new set of armor for this, which you won't see in the footage here because I have him wearing the much more iconic NCR Ranger combat armor that is used as the mascot for New Vegas as a game, as well as being featured on the cover art. This is the end of Boone's greater storyline within the game, and gives us the opportunity to temporarily send him back to Novak so we can head back to the 188 trading post to pick up Veronica. But there's a few quests we can complete in the immediate area first. Bitter Springs Lake Camp McCarran is falling apart. It's a refugee camp once run by the Great Khans, but taken with extreme force by the NCR, as we've just seen and heard. As we know, the NCR are spread thin as it is, meaning there is little to no troops to help out around Bitter Springs, and they're running out of supplies, including medical. The doctor, Lieutenant Markland, is also ill-equipped to deal with the psychological trauma a lot of the children around the camp have been experiencing. To top it all off, an individual has been sniping the refugees and stealing supplies every night, so there's a lot going on here to say the least, but it doesn't take very long to deal with. Starting with the supplies and sniper, these are another two birds one stone situation, as the individual mentioned lives within one of the three nearby supply caves we will be visiting. For the most part, the caves are uneventful. It's not until the third farthest cave from the camp that we run into a lone great con, Oscar Velasco. Oscar is a con out for revenge. Rather than moving with the rest of his tribe to Red Rock Canyon, he opted to stayed behind and periodically attacked the NCR and their refugees after what they did to the cons during the Bitter Springs Massacre. After passing a speech check of 50 where you can mention that it's not the fault of the refugees in terms of what happened to his people, Oscar will ask what he's supposed to do. You have two options at this point. You can convince him to go attack the people actually responsible at Camp McCarran, or to finally let this go and move to Red Rock Canyon to be with his people. Sending him to McCarran will undoubtedly get him killed, so it's best to send him back to his people to hopefully lead a more peaceful life. Oscar represents the other side of the massacre. At this point, we have only managed to see the guilt of the perpetrators, the NCR, after killing innocent civilians during the assault. Afterwards, the NCR decided to take the spot over as their own, effectively through immense bloodshed, which was not equatable to what the cons had been doing to their supply lines. Oscar is the other side of that. We have a man, suffering due to the NCR, who lost his family to the massacre at Bitter Springs, and because of this conflict, in effect the NCR's revenge against the cons, Oscar is now exacting his own revenge against the NCR, continuing the cycle of violence that would see no end until either party was wiped out or someone was to intervene and stop the conflict altogether. You get to observe the cycle of hate and violence, see how it affects both parties on both sides, regardless of who is at fault, and ultimately you have the ability to put an end to it, which is exactly what we've chosen to do here. Once we have all the supplies, we can return them to the camp, but our job isn't done just yet. Bitter Springs still needs more medical help as well as some troops sent their way from McCarran, Forlorn Hope, and Camp Golf. We haven't been to Camp Golf yet, but heading over and asking for the troops with our reputation is all it takes to get some sent over. McCarran and Forlorn Hope have had our help already and are willing to send them over without much fuss. Camp Golf shows that there's always an opportunity for the NCR to properly manage each of their camps and make sure that there's enough troops per area. They just choose not to, or set their priorities elsewhere. The minute someone with a bit of class
clout shows up, the NCR will bend the knee and do whatever they ask, so why don't they simply send more men when it's requested by the camp itself? It's not a priority to them. Prim wasn't and isn't a part of the NCR, and Bitter Springs isn't actually useful to the NCR as it's simply a camp full of refugees who need help. And help isn't something the NCR gives unless absolutely necessary, even when the area falls under NCR jurisdiction. While at golf we can talk to a squad known as the Misfits, it's not a particularly interesting quest, just a series of speech checks to get the squad to work together, but it does earn us some NCR rep. We'll be returning to Camp Golf a bit later after dealing with the Brotherhood. As for the Doctor, we can make our first but not last stop at the Crimson Caravan just outside of New Vegas. We can buy the medical texts here from a merchant and return them to the Doctor at Bitter Springs who will use them to study up on psychology and trauma to better utilize his skill set at the camp. Once the supplies, troops, and medical needs have been delivered, you've officially stabilized Bitter Springs slightly as a camp and earn some more NCR fame for your effort. When Veronica agrees to join us, she also divulges her association with the Brotherhood, just in case it's a problem for the player. Having never met the Brotherhood and only having a passing understanding of them, it doesn't seem like a problem to bring her along. Activating Veronica's side quest is one of the easier to do at this point. Veronica wants to see the world to get a broader perspective outside of what she is taught in the Brotherhood. In order to achieve this, there's various areas to explore and people to talk to that will trigger a reaction from Veronica. The player must trigger three of these reactions in order for Veronica to want to return to the Brotherhood, so she can attempt to convince the Elder there that the Brotherhood will die out without intervention. Coincidentally, one of these triggers is at Helios 1, and we can use this as an opportunity to return there and talk to Ignacio about Archimedes. Eddie's trigger requires a five-day cooldown, so now is the perfect time to kill two birds with one stone and get the second audio log out of him through your dialogue with Ignacio. After the second audio log from Eddie, you have to wait a three-day period in order for someone to contact you through Eddie's transmission system. Unfortunately, it's one way so you can't communicate back, but Brotherhood Knight Lorenzo manages to get through to you and asks you to bring Eddie to a nearby patrol so that they can examine him as his technology interests them. During an earlier gameplay segment with Repcon headquarters, I actually already ran into a Brotherhood patrol that had been murdered, which speeds up the process of the quest line and immediately directs you towards the Brotherhood base at Hidden Valley. However, as you near there, another individual gets in contact with you from the followers of the Apocalypse. They understand that the Brotherhood is interested in the tech, but they wish to study it so that the technology may be available for all. The followers are essentially the major contrast to the Brotherhood when it comes to technology. The Brotherhood wants to hoard all old world technology because they believe it to be a danger to civilization. They believe they have a duty to protect the outside world from old world tech while preserving it. But this gets warped in a variety of ways depending on the chapter and who is leading said chapter at the time. The followers, on the other hand, preach a different ideology. They look to explore the various technologies of the old world and new while keeping it free for all, meaning out of the hands of powerful groups like the Brotherhood or even the NCR. Take Ignacio, for example, who worried about a super weapon potentially getting in the hands of the NCR, and would rather see the power plant used for wide-reaching energy for everyone. The followers generally want to utilize technology for civilization as a whole. The NCR wants to utilize technology for weapons and defense, and the Brotherhood wants to keep it all for themselves for fear of what civilization could do with it. We'll head to Hidden Valley soon, as it will allow us to continue Veronica's questline and ultimately learn more about her and the Brotherhood, but before that, there's one major quest to take care of within McCarran. Thomas Hildern is the director of OSI, or the Office of Science and Industry. When you approach him, he assumes you're there for a job he's hiring for, and you can lie or tell him the truth about why you've run into him. Either way, Thomas can explain his needs for a mercenary to head to Vault 22, a vault overgrown with plant life due to a scientific study and experiment that took place there. He needs the data of said study in order to reproduce or research the results for the future of the Mojave or of the world in general. At least that's how he puts it. Really, Hildern just seems like someone trying to capitalize on an opportunity to advance his own career. However, even with such selfish intentions, the possible good that comes out of it seems hard to pass up. You can agree to take the job, but on your way out you're stopped by Angela Williams, also of the OSI. She explains that multiple individuals have been hired to head to Vault 22 and none have come back. Most recently, a ghoul by the name of Keeley was sent and also hasn't come back. Angela is worried about Keeley and asks you to find out more about her status, which is an optional aspect of the questline, but very important. This is a good time to mention the concept of vaults. Vaults are a key component within the setting and lore of Fallout's universe. They were advertised by the Vault Tech Corporation as a set of bunkers that civilians could use as 
shelters should a nuclear war take place. There's a big history involving vault tech and their mismanagement and corruption in the creation of the vaults themselves, but the biggest factor of them is how the majority of the vaults were designed with some sort of experiment in mind, sometimes an experiment on a concept or on the inhabitants themselves. In this way, almost every vault is unique in comparison to the last. Take Vault 22 as an example. We are traveling there due to experiments on agriculture so that we can get the data surrounding it. Meanwhile, a Vault Lake 11, which we will visit during the Brotherhood questline, is more a psychological experiment on the individuals living within. There's many vaults in New Vegas and the series in general, generally all with some sort of catastrophic failure that led to the death and suffering of their inhabitants. I won't be going over every vault in New Vegas, but instead the ones that are more relevant to the quests at hand. However, the ones we do explore I believe to be not only interesting from a lore perspective, but sometimes incredibly mechanically interesting as well. Approaching Vault 22 is a bit imposing. For one, you have to make your way through several Cazadores again, only to be met with a cliffside covered in green vegetation. Typically, this would be a wonderful sight to see. Even Fallout 3 had a similar area where life was once again thriving in the nuclear wasteland. New Vegas likes to use environmental storytelling this way to convey how the actions of an area have affected its surroundings. Sometimes these are creative ways, such as the grass leading up to Vault 22, with several orchids and mantises attacking you on your way in. Sometimes it's more on the nose, like within the same area having a sign that says stay out, the plants kill. It's hit or miss depending on the location. Still, I think Vault 22 is one of the more unique vaults out there, consisting of five levels, all of which are not only covered in vegetation, but also home to hostile plant-like humanoids that come out of the vegetation to attack you. Players can make their way down the vault via the staircase or bypass the majority of the location by repairing the elevator. For the sake of exploration, we'll take the stairs, although I fixed the elevator anyway for use later. The data you're looking for is on level 5, the deepest point of the vault, and getting there the normal way is no small feat, as you'll have to work through countless enemies on the way there. The bottom level, pest control, is blocked off via the staircase as well. The only way through is via a cave tunnel that connects to the lower levels, and the only way to get through there is with an ID card you find in the living quarters. While exploring all of the facilities of Vault 22, you can find various terminals that Keeley has been using to keep observations of the surroundings. In fact, once we have the data, you can head further into the tunnels attached to the vault to find an incredibly open cavern full of hostiles. From orchid mantises to giant Venus fly traps, once dealt with, you can find Keeley in an indent off to the side of the cavern. She'll remark on how it took us long enough to get there, and you can explain to her that you were sent there by Hildern, but were only asked to look for Keeley thanks to Angela, which she is appreciative of. Keely Keely heads back to the upper levels of the vault, where she explains that spores are being produced which are poisonous to humans, and if they don't stop them, they will take over the Mojave. Her plan is to gas the source and ignite them in order to clear the facility. The only issue is that this needs to be done at the source, meaning you need to go down there to cause an explosion that will ignite the entire level of the vault while also surviving. The best way to do this, in my opinion, is to throw a grenade near the vent that is producing the gas and quickly close a nearby door to prevent the blast from reaching you. Unfortunately, your companions may not make it in time, leading to them comically going unconscious temporarily. Once successful, you can return to Keeley, who mentions she will delete the data on the computer in order to make sure no one can cause this situation to happen again. However, since we have taken the data already, Keeley notices that it has been accessed very recently and questions you on the subject. You can lie to her, but ultimately telling her the truth is generally the best option in my opinion. Initially, she will ask you for the data, which you can refuse and have lead to some hostilities, but a science check of around 70 will allow you to convince her that the failures of this experiment are as useful as the experiment themselves and will allow scientists to make sure that they don't produce the same mistakes moving forward. With the data at hand and Keeley convinced, she'll unlock the doors of the vault and allow you to exit. When you return to McCarran, Angela will inform you that Keeley called Hildern and laid in to him about the dangers of the vault and his own incompetence. You can then deliver the data to Hildern in order to complete the quest while while warning him of its dangers, to which he ironically says, we're the government, have a little faith in us, as if they didn't cause the near extinction of humanity already. With the major events of Camp McCarran dealt with, we can turn our sights on 
Hidden Valley to deal with both the Brotherhood and Veronica's quest line. Hidden Valley is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunker hidden within a fenced off valley that can be covered in an artificial sandstorm to deter scavengers or anyone from approaching. There's various reasons you could end up here, from Eddie or Veronica to actions within the strip, or just random exploring, and how you manage to approach will affect your first interaction with the Brotherhood as a whole. While not shown here, entering the bunker without Veronica and attempting to contact the inhabitants within will ultimately lead to you being trapped inside and met with a series of paladins with weapons drawn. You still get to enter the bunker after some dialogue, but it's not a particularly welcoming greeting. On the flip side, bringing Veronica allows her to contact the guard within and gain access hassle-free. This will allow most to remark on the fact that Veronica brought you here, with even the Elder mentioning how you are ultimately her responsibility. There's a lot to do within the bunker as an outsider. You gain certain liberties that the actual members of the Brotherhood do not have, such as the ability to walk freely in and out as you please. The bunker is in a state of lockdown, meaning only very particular members like Veronica and scouts within the evening are all allowed to head outside only to make sure that the bunker continues to function. This is for a variety of reasons, mostly because Elder McNamara fears for the survival of his chapter due to their failure to hold Helios 1 from the NCR as well as the losses they suffered while attempting to do so. What's interesting about this is Veronica's main struggle in her quest line, where she sees the trajectory of this lockdown and the Brotherhood's values leading to their ultimate demise. As they refuse to leave and refuse to interact with any of the actually active settlements within the wasteland that may not be thriving, but are at least managing. Veronica's problems are with the values of the Brotherhood as a whole, but her main conflict is with Elder McNamara, who refuses to lift the lockdown which will ultimately kill off the Brotherhood. Yeah? After an initial visit, Veronica tries to convince him to change their ways, which he ultimately shuts her down on. Still, Veronica feels McNamara's heart is in the right place and may ultimately need convincing to show the potential of them opening their doors. This is where Elder Elijah comes in. Elijah ran the chapter before McNamara and Helios won. McNamara only took over after Elijah disappeared and the Brotherhood ultimately had to retreat from the NCR. Elijah was different from your typical Brotherhood elder. His interest in Old World tech wasn't in its procurement and preservation, but instead in the function of Old World weapons specifically, to the point that he was obsessed with Helios 1's potential. I know we haven't actually seen the potential firsthand yet, but we will get to it, I assure you. Elijah is a man with a mission, one that tends to ruin him mentally as he hyper-focuses on finding ultimate power within the Mojave Wasteland. This ultimately culminates in a meeting with him in the game's first DLC, Dead Money, and your interaction with him sheds a better light on his ideology, his mental state, and his relationship with Veronica after the fact. The reason I even bring him up at this time is because Veronica was very close to Elijah, to the point she knows of a secret shack where they can find his research on various advanced technologies across the Mojave Wasteland. As you exit the audience chamber, you're met with a set of paladin zealots who don't like that Veronica is both questioning the Elder and seems to be actively trying to persuade him to turn from the teachings of the Brotherhood. They ultimately leave you alone for the time, but not without threatening you should you continue on your path with Veronica. One of these involves the vegetation technology we found in Vault 22, meaning we already have the ability to continue the questline and present the technology to McNamara, making a plea for him based on the advantages of making the Brotherhood self-sufficient so they don't die out. Other other technology you could find include a pulse gun that deals additional damage to robots and power armor, or a device that is tied to Helios 1 which we are saving for later. Returning to the Elder no matter what technology you bring alongside you ultimately leads to the same outcome. McNamara isn't willing to research the technology as it goes against their teachings, and when presented with the idea that they will die out otherwise, he explains that he is aware of this, but still unwilling to do anything about it. This is enough for Veronica to realize she was wrong about him, and question what she is doing within the Brotherhood to begin with. You can suggest for Veronica to either stay with the Brotherhood or leave and join the followers of the Apocalypse. If you convince her to stay, she'll ultimately do just that and gain the Bonds of Steel perk, which increases her damage threshold. If you convince her to leave, it's a little more involved. When exiting the bunker, you're met with the same group of paladins who once again threaten you. You have to deal with them regardless of Veronica's choice, but if she has decided to leave, they will tell her to never come back and she will not enter the bunker with you in the 
the future. There's a followers outpost not far from that that you can take Veronica to. You can ask the staff there if she can join, but the lead doctor isn't around and won't be for 24 hours. Leaving and waiting 24 hours before returning leads to the paladins killing all of the doctors within, accusing Veronica of sharing Brotherhood secrets, and ultimately attacking you and her, leading to a battle where you have to take them out. Veronica believes this is her fault, but you can convince her that the actions of others are not in her hands. If anything, this is enough to strengthen her decision in leaving and end the questline by giving her the causeless rebel perk, which increases her unarmed attack rate by 30%. I think what's most interesting about this quest is ultimately how it failed to tie itself into the main faction questline for the Brotherhood, as you can actually succeed where Veronica failed, and we'll explore how now. There's a few major issues taking place there, first and foremost being a virus that is ruining their data store. George Costanza here will explain to you that a virus has infiltrated their system and is hopping from terminal to terminal. You can suggest an attempt to partition off the virus, which leads to a minigame of sorts where you have to find where the virus was hopped to over several terminals and lock it out three times. You have limited time to do this, but once one of the three segments is partitioned, it stays partitioned over multiple attempts. After the completion of the task, the data store becomes available for you to read up on various Brotherhood-related information and history, although only as much as an outsider would be allowed to see. You require progress in the Brotherhood questline to unlock more along the way. You're being watched, so don't get any ideas. There is no such thing as a coincidence. Elder McNamara has some tasks for you. Mainly, he's worried about three patrols he sent out into the waste that have yet to return. You can track the patrols, but only from outside the bunker, meaning an outsider such as yourself is generally the only means of making sure these members are okay. And if they're not, you are tasked with at least retrieving the data they collected. We actually already found one of these groups, as I mentioned earlier, within the Repcon headquarters, but there's two others. It should be pointed out that this quest is rather dynamic based on how you enter the bunker with Veronica. A few steps are omitted as the Brotherhood already trusts you enough as it is, even if it's only a little. If you are purely a stranger upon the first visit, you're actually equipped with an explosive collar that will detonate if you stray too far from the radius of the bunker, leading you to completing a few tasks to prove yourself, such as removing an NCR Ranger from a neighboring bunker. Once you're set with your tasks, either for the Ranger or skipping directly to the patrols, Paladin Harden will stop you as you exit the Elder's Chambers, inquiring about your involvement with McNamara. Funny enough, Harden shares the same sentiments as Veronica in terms of the lockdown, but probably not for the same reasons. Hardin wants to get paladins back outside and patrolling the Mojave, and believes the lockdown will doom them if they don't find enough evidence to essentially overturn McNamara as the Elder and replace him with Hardin. This sounds like the right course of action, right? We know McNamara is somewhat stuck in his ways out of fear of what happened at Helios 1. He's worried about the NCR and seems frozen to the point that he's dooming his people, and this is understandably making many of the Brotherhood go a bit stir-crazy. Well, it's not so cut and dry. Hardin makes a good point, but we'll see as we progress, McNamara is as Veronica always assumed him to be, more open-minded than we give him credit for, just with the need of being properly persuaded. Hardin wants updates on the task that the Elder gives you, but these are essentially optional and not required. As for the two other missing patrols, we can find one of them very close to the bunker in an irradiated pit surrounded by mutated monsters. One of them is a unique creature named Mo. The final patrol isn't so simple, however. East of New Vegas is a town that looks like it was hit by a bomb, or rather several to be more precise. This is the territory of the Boomers. The Boomers are a group of vault dwellers from Vault 34, which had a social experiment involving a large quantity of weapons being available to the residents. As they emerged from the vault, they were incredibly talented marksmen who were able to deal with raiders at ease. This led them from Vault 34 to Nellis Air Force Base, which was still in good condition after the war. Now the Boomers protect the base with missiles and fire upon anyone that comes even mildly within the radius of the area, leading us to our friend George here. George wants to make a bet with you, that if you can make it to the front gate of the Air Force base, he will pay you double what you give him in caps. The challenge is that missiles will rain down on you constantly as you make your way over, almost assuring your death, but George has a way of dealing with this, which he will divulge to you as long as you pay. You can barter him down from 300 caps to 200, but since you aren't going to die, as this is a video game where you get to 
to retry each time, going for 300 is more optimal if you want a larger payout. According to George, it's all about timing. As long as you stay relatively close to all of the collapsed structures, it should be impossible for the missiles to hit you. And I'm going to be honest with you here, I don't think I've ever done this successfully without getting launched by at least one missile. Once you're safely at the gate, you'll be met with a shocked resident of the base who doesn't understand how you could have possibly navigated through their bombardment. This leads into a meeting with the eldest member of the boomer's mother, Pearl. Pearl essentially tells you that they've been waiting for a wastelander to make it to their base and believes you are some sort of prophesized individual who will allow them to complete a task that we will revisit later. That's right, we're not actually done finding all of the patrols, and the only reason we dealt with the boomers this early is to make it so that they wouldn't attempt to blow us up while we explored the area. Just like the previous two, the paladins have been killed, most likely by the boomers, and you can now return to McNamara with all of the quest data or report to Hardin first to let him know what is going on. You can also spend some time investigating ways to rid the Brotherhood of McNamara if you want. Within the databanks of the bunker, this leads you to the concept of the chain that binds, which all of the Brotherhood follows. Essentially, it means you always listen to those above you no matter what the order is, and failing to do so could lead to severe repercussions. More specifically, orders must be passed down through the chain in order to make everyone along the chain aware of what is to be done. This leads to a bit of an issue, however. McNamara has given orders to paladin patrols without informing Hardin, who is the paladin superior, thus breaking the chain that binds. If you bring these reports found on the dead patrols to Hardin and explain the concept of the chain being broken, it's enough to have McNamara ousted. But we're not going to do that, and I'll explain why soon. Once you give McNamara the holotapes, you now need to get the reports of three scouts watching over NCR facilities. Luckily, all of these scouts are actually alive, and you're given a passphrase that will let them know you are not hostile. Coincidentally, all of the scouts are observing NCR-related areas that we've personally explored slash dealt with already, including the NCRCF, Nipton, and Nelson. For Nipton, the NCR seems to be doing nothing about the Legion terrorizing a town in the NCR's own backyard. For the NCRCF and Nelson, both were issues for the NCR until the intervention of a third party, in effect, you the courier. It's a very rewarding feeling having people within the game actually actively observe your contributions to the various locations in the Mojave, something Obsidian is particularly strong at conveying. You can return the reports to McNamara, which makes him realize that the NCR may not be as big of a threat as he perceived, and this is both true and not. The NCR are greatly stretched out, but there are a lot of them. A dedicated group of them could most likely outnumber and overpower those in the bunker. On the other hand, the Paladins do have old world tech and power armor on their side, which is a big benefit to them within the conflict. Additionally, the main reason the NCR were even able to take over Helios 1 is because it's one of the worst bases in terms of defending. Helios 1 is a very open, fenced off area with one small building in terms of cover. It is incredibly easy to have it surrounded and essentially besieged, giving the NCR much more leverage within their fight against the Brotherhood. But now McNamara is seeing the cracks. He's seeing that the NCR weren't the threat he thought they were initially. It was just the poor judgment of Father Elijah keeping them at Helios 1 that cost them so much in the end. There's one final set of tasks we need to complete for McNamara within the quest line. The filtration system wasn't designed to handle the heavy loads of sand created by the storm device and is slowly breaking down, meaning it will get to a point where oxygen will run out within the bunker. You're tasked with visiting several vaults around the Mojave in order to collect various parts that would lead to its repair. You can get a list of pieces by talking to Knight Lorenzo, and I need to point out that it's best to not even have Eddie in your party at this point if you haven't completed his quest yet, as Lorenzo gets to a point where he will only comment about Eddie and softlock you out of completing the current quest line until you remove him from your party. The first set of items we need have already been found within Vault 22. There's six HEPA filters for the filtration system, and you can see how playthroughs can almost be optimized in a way due to their overlap with various locations. Vault 22 comes in handy for several quests, all of which need you to explore it, so getting it out of the way early helps speed up the process. Vault 3, on the other hand, is going to require a few visits to make the most use out of. Vault 3 is run by fiends, but it doesn't have to be a bloodbath. Yet. You do need to fight your way in, but once inside you can pass a speech check convincing them that you're a drug merchant, and they'll let you walk freely around. This actually allows you to 
very easily save any prisoners within plain sight of the fiends and even an NCR ranger that locked himself away from the fiends after getting injured. You can clear out the fiends, including their leader, but it's better to do this later after we complete a quest for the Great Cons, otherwise the quest will fail before we even get a chance to start it. Exploration within the vault will lead to you finding the reverse pulse cleaner, and now there's only one more vault to stop by, and it's one of my favorites. Vault 11 is one of the best social experiments in the game. Upon being locked inside, the overseer of the vault was informed that a sacrifice was to be made periodically, otherwise all of the inhabitants would be killed off. This led to the first overseer being chosen as said sacrifice, followed by an election system that would nominate and then elect one of several nominees as the new overseer who would live out their term before ultimately being sent to the sacrificial chamber. The election system is actually fairly involved. It had multiple parties, reasons for choosing one block's nominee over another, and ultimately devolved into levels of corruption including bribery, drug trafficking, and blackmail. There's a lot that went into the process, but one overseer, Catherine Stone, created a new rule that the election was to be randomized, which led to a violent insurrection of sorts. As you explore the area looking for a differential pressure controller, you'll eventually reach the overseer's office. Gaining access to the computer allows you to enter into the sacrificial chamber yourself, which is legitimately a means of killing you. Your path is through a large tunnel meant to simulate the light one sees before death, and ultimately you sit to watch a slideshow meant to calm you before your ultimate demise, in which the walls surrounding you collapse to reveal several hostile robots that will attempt to kill you. Honestly, if not prepared for this event, like I wasn't the first time I reached this vault in the past, you can be so easily overwhelmed by the robots that it can feel impossible to deal with. Luckily, things like stealth boys help you completely outmaneuver the robots, and if you are prepared, the ensuing fight isn't too much trouble. This is by far one of my favorite vaults in the game, the psychological and sociological aspects of it, the commentary on the election process, and the underlying corruption that seems inevitable, and the cherry on top in finding out that none of this was necessary. Once the robots are dealt with, you can head further into the chamber and learn that once the vault was down to five individuals, they ultimately refused to sacrifice anyone any further. As it turns out, all of this was a test to see if this would happen. And instead of killing the vault dwellers, they were ultimately congratulated and set free, meaning that if they had done this from the start, no one would have had to die. Incredible. Just an incredible sequence of events to witness after the fact. Once you bring the components to Lorenzo, you can return to McNamara, who, shocker, will lift the lock down now that he has a better understanding of NCR developments. Meaning you have essentially produced what Hardin wanted anyway without putting him in charge. I think the biggest failing of this questline is not finding a way to tie it into the Veronica questline. While the lockdown isn't the only problem Veronica has with the Brotherhood, it's a major one and could have led to a more peaceful resolution. In the event that you help the Brotherhood before even attempting Veronica's companion quest, you essentially lock yourself out of it and prevent her from being able to unlock one of her two reward perks. In a game that is so good at interweaving various quests and storylines, you'd think they would have accounted for this in some capacity. Regardless, the Brotherhood lockdown has been lifted, and you may ask yourself, why McNamara and not Harden? The simplest answer is for a decision we need to make much later into the end game of New Vegas. McNamara is the only option between the two leadership that can actually lead to a peaceful resolution resolution between the Brotherhood and the NCR, as we will see later. So that's the Brotherhood of Steel, but we aren't quite done yet. On top of getting a key to the Brotherhood safe house that has various weaponry, ammo, and armor for us, we can actually apply to join their faction, which is possible for outsiders who have done exceptional deeds for them, which we somehow haven't done yet despite all the work we put in. McNamara does have a task for us, however, and it involves infiltrating Black Mountain, a super mutant refuge run by a schizophrenic radio DJ. McNamara wants us to head up to Black Mountain so that they can tap into its radio capabilities. There's only one issue, however. Black Mountain has become a sort of super mutant haven and openly hostile to any humans who show up due to the radio broadcasts. Black Mountain Radio is one of the options on your Pip-Boy when within a certain vicinity of the location. It's hosted by a Nightkin super mutant named Tabitha, but technically hosted by a character made up by Tabitha named Rhonda. Using the broadcast, 
asked Tabitha talks on the radio over various mutant-related topics while pushing in anti-human sentiment. As you approach the mountain via the main road, you'll be stopped by a friendly super mutant named Neil who warns you of heading up any further due to the army of super mutants that live there. You can convince Neil to help you as he is somewhat tired of Tabitha's shenanigans, and he'll run off ahead only willing to do anything if you can prove you can make it to the mutant village to begin with. After sneaking or fighting your way to the village, Neil will explain that Tabitha's base of operations is surrounded by invisible nightkin and offers to distract them for you by sending them into the village, meaning you need to hide out until they run past and then make your way back up. Once at the summit, there's three ways of dealing with the situation. You can either break into the broadcasting room to kill Tabitha, save a ghoul named Raoul which will provoke Tabitha, or fix up a robot also named Rhonda which is considered the good karma option. We'll start with fixing Rhonda in a nearby storage building. Doing so will have Tabitha exit the broadcast room to meet you and see that Rhonda has been fixed. Rhonda is a friend of Tabitha's that has been her companion on a long journey and Tabitha is beside herself to see her fixed. Rhonda will explain how you fixed her before she begins to drag Tabitha off to continue their adventure. This is the most peaceful way to handle this. Next you can go to rescue Raoul who is locked away in a makeshift prison by Tabitha and forced to act as her repairman. Raoul is a ghoul and a potential companion. He's the only ghoul companion in the game, in fact, not counting Dean Domino in the Dead Money DLC. With everything taken care of here and Raul easily persuaded into joining our party, we only need to install the transmitter for the Brotherhood before returning to the bunker. Once back at Hidden Valley, Elder McNamara will officially offer you a position within the Brotherhood of Steel, with additional privileges as an outsider and effectively a hero to the people, such as being able to come and go as you please. He will also teach you the perk that allows you to use power armor if you wish. This is basically the end of the Brotherhood storyline and Veronica's storyline for quite a while, but we will return as we finalize things for the end of the game. So who is Raul? For the most part, he's a mechanic, and simply having him in the party makes it so that your weaponry degrades at half the speed it normally would. Incredibly useful considering how expensive repairing can be if you don't have the parts yourself. Raul grew up before the bombs fell with his family in Mexico. Confrontations with some refugees led to his house being set ablaze and his family perishing, while Raul managed to escape with his little sister, Rafaela. The aftermath of the war ghoulified Raul, but he still managed to look after his sister until he fell ill one day, and she was unfortunately, ultimately, captured, mutilated, and murdered while out scavenging for supplies. By this point, Raul was a talented gunslinger known as the Ghost of Mexico City and chased after the individuals who killed his sister so he could do the same to them. Later on in his life, he met a prostitute named Claudia who reminded him of his sister, weird, but kept his distance while protecting her the best he could. Unfortunately, Claudia too was captured and eventually murdered, leading to Raul going on a second killing spree. After these events, he traveled to the Mojave and settled in a shack before offering his services to Tabitha who ultimately imprisoned him as a reward. There's more to the story than that, and you can hear it all from Raoul during his companion quest. There are three NPCs you need to talk to in order for Raoul to share these stories with you. The first is Loyal of the Boomers, followed by Corporal Sterling at either Camp McCarran or Forlorn Hope, and finally Ranger Andy back at Novak. Once Raoul is finished telling you his story, he mentions that he believes he is now too old to be an effective gunslinger, and will continue giving it up to be a repairman instead. With high enough speech skill, you can convince him that his gunslinging abilities are still very sharp, and he should consider actively making use of them. Should you convince Raul, he will pick up the old Vaquero outfit from his stories, and gain the old Vaquero perk which raises his firing rate. If you convince him to be useful in other ways, he will instead gain a new maintenance outfit, and your weapons will degrade 75% slower rather than 50%. Raul's story is an interesting one, and one that I don't do justice within this retrospective. I highly recommend picking him up up as a companion and hearing about it for yourself firsthand. Since we're here, it's time to start a series of quests I've waited on until we have visited a greater portion of the Mojave. Specifically, Ranger Andy asks us to check out Ranger Station Charlie since he hasn't heard from them in some time and he's worried about them. We've actually been to Charlie on our way to Repcon back when we dealt with Jason Bright, so it doesn't take too long to get there. Unfortunately, we find all of the station dead at the hands of the Legion, with a holotape left over from them stating that this is what will happen to all of the NCR 
are no matter how far they run. We can return with this info to Andy who is upset but ultimately thanks you for being the messenger. So why are we doing this now? Well, getting Charlie out of the way allows us to continue a quest line from Forlorn Hope for Tech Sergeant Raze. That ultimately leads to Camp Golf, which we have now just visited. Raze is getting a mismatch of incorrect communications sent from various ranger stations around the Mojave, and you'll have to travel to each station to offer up a set of new security codes as a means of trying to fix the issue, considering Raze believes someone is listening in and intercepting information. After traveling to each station, of which there are many, Raze will give you three stations to return to, which are all offering intel which makes no sense. Things like super mutant legionaries and such. All of these stations, once visited, say they never sent such communications, and ultimately leads Raze to point out that all of these miscommunications have been signed off by Chief Hanlon back at Camp Golf. Golf is a regional headquarters for the Rangers, and Chief Hanlon takes care of them there as well as having the location act as a communications hub of sorts. While the Rangers sit pretty in their worn down resort building, troopers live in camps on the field beside it, leading to a bit of a hostile environment between the two groups. Hanlon sits atop the balcony of the resort, and when you accuse him of manipulating information, he brings you to his office to discuss it privately. Hanlon goes on to explain that he sees no way for the NCR to make it out of this war without sapping all of their resources, including the people themselves. The NCR will suffer great losses defending the Hoover Dam and New Vegas to the point that they most likely won't recover. For this reason, Hanlon began spreading misinformation to try and scare the NCR higher-ups into retreating out of the Mojave and saving as many NCR men and women as he could while abandoning the locals. Hanlon's actions bring up a few moral questions. We can choose to let him continue, or we can attempt to arrest him, but you have to ask yourself what the best course of action is here. To start, with this attempt to make the NCR retreat even work? Hanlon's attempts at miscommunication have actually led to the death of a few NCR soldiers, meaning that even if this is an attempt to save many, he used the lives of a few you to make it happen, and again, this is for a plan that he doesn't even know will work. But say it did, and the NCR decided to drop the dam and pull out of the Mojave, what happens then? All of the locations under NCR protection suddenly aren't. Refugees, towns, and even the Strip may be left at the hands of the Legion. Plenty of innocent people would suffer, and these are the people the NCR agreed to protect, most likely after forcibly taking it over. It seems like a lose-lose situation, and one that has already cost the lives of people that didn't deserve to die. You can choose to let Hanlon go, and the quest will complete with the experience reward. But if you choose to arrest him, there's a little more to it than that. As you tell Hanlon you're turning him in, he suggests you go grab a ranger to make the arrest official. As you leave his office, the door will close behind you and you'll be locked out. Hanlon will then come onto the speakers, leading to the following scene. Messed up. Made a mistake. I thought I could help us get out of here, but it, it didn't work out. Even Rangers get injured all the time. It's part of the job. But if you lose a few fingers and get a bad break, that's it. You step down. We rely on each other too much to let our infirmities become a liability. A ranger knows when it's time. Even if only I didn't. Somewhere along the way, something broke inside. First me. recon's in Camp Forlorn Hope. Get I some rangers in there too, way out of this and desert. it'll be a damn First impregnable in fortress. I wrestled with it, and it took me down a dark road. I wish I could explain it to you. The old chief's finally at a loss for words. Send me all the legion you can. I'll be waiting for him. That See, shot came from the chief's office. Retired. Oh, sorry, boss. Bad choice of words. Uh? After his death, a ranger will run into Hanlon's office to find his corpse, his unique gun by his side. The weapon is still linked to his inventory and therefore it's considered stealing to take it and will lead to karma lost. So we're just gonna let the rangers grieve for a bit before taking it for ourselves. The question of whether Hanlon was right or wrong is up to you. Personally, I think the cost of innocent lives to produce a situation that would see the end of countless more is not an option without consequences and not one I'd want to see through. Hanlon cared for his rangers and it's understandable why, 
but the war pushed him to a point where he felt he had to take drastic measures. That's what's happening here. The war of NCR versus the Legion is actively hindering the lives of everyone involved and creating tension in situations that lead to unnecessary death. The war itself is unnecessary, but neither side seems willing to back down, and realistically, you wouldn't want the NCR to do so anyway. Despite the NCR's flaws, the Legion are characterized as pure evil, and the hell they would create in the wasteland puts enough fear into you to the point where the NCR may seem like the only valid option. There's only really one way to save everyone, and that's through you becoming a superhuman cyborg throughout your travels across the Mojave and beyond. Your journey to New Vegas is just one chapter on that path, and the potential power that can be given to the courier grows exponentially as the story continues. But in the real world, that's not really an option. Conflicts lead to situations where no matter what decision is made or who wins, there's going to be innocent people that suffer for it, and we see this sort of cut loss mindset within Camp Golf. With even more NCR tasks finished, it's time to backtrack slightly to the boomers we met for a short moment during the Brotherhood quest. As I mentioned previously, Mother Pearl believes us to be an outsider of prophecy, one who will bestow upon the boomers a gift that they consider the end goal of their time within the Mojave. Before you can do this, however, you need to earn the trust of the faction by completing several tasks that will generate reputation. There's a few to choose from, and none of them are particularly eventful, just like the boomers themselves. One involved you clearing giant mutated ants out from an underground generator, another has you fixing solar arrays with scrap we found all the way back at Helios 1. A slightly more involved quest has one of the residents Jack request of you to go find a girl he has been spying on within the Crimson Caravan Company as he has fallen for her. Said girl works for the Crimson Caravan Company, so you have to hoof it all the way there to see if she's interested. Which somehow she is, turns out she's been spying on the boomers too, and she's into Jack. So now you need to hoof it back to Jack and tell him she's interested, and then get permission from Mother Pearl to let her in. Once you get permission, you have to go back to Jack to get a boomer uniform so she doesn't get blown to smithereens. As a side note, you can actually lie to her and tell her to travel there without the gear so she gets blown up anyway. Another trip to the caravan, and you have to convince the owner, Alice McLafferty, to let the girl off of her contract. Then, finally, you trek all the way back to Nellis to complete the quest. You should have completed enough tasks to move on by this point, but if you haven't for some reason, there's a few ways to earn more reputation, such as turning in scrap metal to Jack, or having a kid teach you about the history of the Boomers and Nellis Air Force Base. Once you can progress, you can return to Mother Pearl, who will have you go back to Loyal for a proper explanation of what is going on. Loyal tells you about the Lady in the Lake, a sunken bomber that is in a decent enough state that it could potentially fly again, the ultimate dream of the Boomers. In order to make this happen, the plane needs to be raised out of Lake Mead, and it's your job to do that, since none of the individuals within the airport that could do it have ever set foot off of the base. You'll have to swim to the bottom of the lake, attach a couple ballasts, and then swim back up to use a detonator that will cause them to inflate and raise the plane. In order to not die of suffocation, you can talk to Jack about a rebreather he is making, but it requires some components or a science check to get it functional. It's actually an incredibly useful item as it fully removes the oxygen requirement for the rest of the game. Not that you're spending a ton of time underwater, but still. Once the ballista are installed and the player reaches a specific destination, they can pull the trigger on the device given to them by Loyal to have the ship raised from the bottom of Lake Mead. This is the final quest that could be completed for the Boomers, but will have an effect near the end game when we're wrapping things up. Overall, the Boomers are fairly uneventful. They're definitely one of the less present and story-driven factions out there, but make up for it with their absurd fascination with the old world culture of flying, and how they've essentially turned it into a form of religion. Still, they're portrayed as good people, and outside of blowing up anyone wandering by, kind of questionable, but whatever, they're actively looking to do good while being cautious of the outside world. It's through your interactions with them and your intervention that the boomers can learn to open up to greater society, similar to the Brotherhood. For a game called New Vegas, we haven't really spent any time there, but as we've progressed, we've slowly been making our way to a point where entering the city is inevitable in order to continue. The Crimson Caravan is one of those points. We're going to do some work for Alice McLafferty, the owner of the Crimson Caravan, and one of her tasks is going to force us to enter Freeside, the connection between the Mojave and the Strip. The first job is simple enough. Alice wants us to stop by Camp McCarran to deliver a bill to Thomas Hildern, who we've already dealt with. Hildern has no problem with this, making your first task a particularly easy one. Now that we've essentially proven ourselves, Alice has three major jobs for us, with one of them being optional. First, we need to try and buy out Cassidy Caravans, which means making a return trip to the Mojave outpost. Cass is still here drowning her sorrows, and will initially refuse the offer, but can be convinced 
just via speech and barter. Once she agrees to sell, nothing is keeping her at the outpost, and you can suggest she joins up with you as a new companion, so we'll go ahead and do that now. Cass's questline starts up immediately. She wants to check where her caravan was attacked to see if she can learn anything about it. I actually stopped there already during the playthrough, and doing so allows you to inform her that there was nothing of note, but Cass wants to check it out anyway. When you arrive, the first and most obvious observation Cass makes is that the carts were turned to ash, but not burned. Instead, it seems energy weaponry was involved, which is unlike the Legion. In fact, this isn't the first time Cass has heard of a scene like this and points you in the direction of another caravan north of Westside. It's a similar scene, people disintegrated via energy weapons, nothing really looted, but this time there's a map which points to another target closer to the Crimson Caravan. When you arrive, the scene is relatively similar, except for multiple dead bodies of Van Graaff gang members and Crimson Caravan guards. The Van Graaffs we haven't met yet, but they work in the procurement and sale of energy weaponry within Freeside. Cass reasons out that the Van Graaffs and Crimson Caravan have been working together to wipe out their competition, and vows to kill them all. You can either feed into this or convince her into a more peaceful solution. Either way, you won't be able to deal with the Van Graaffs until entering Freeside, and there's still more to do for the Crimson Caravan outside of that. If you choose the path of violence, you and Cassidy will need to wipe out both the Caravan and the Van Graaffs, with the Caravan potentially leading to a lot of innocent deaths. You only need to wipe out each group's managers, but there's plenty of hostiles along the way to doing so, including people that weren't necessarily in on Alice's plan. So for the meantime, we're going to stop by the Gunrunner's base of operations. If that name sounds familiar, that's because of the Gunrunner's Arsenal DLC that added an assortment of new weapons and mods to the game. The Gunrunners are known to produce the highest quality weapons in the Mojave, and that's due to them having manufacturing specifications that are unknown to anyone else. The area is guarded and behind a locked gate, but Alice doesn't want any violence for you to get a full reward. It may seem obvious why this part of the quest is optional. Certain players may have a hard time agreeing to steal from a random group for no reason, and on top of that, not having the skill set to do so. I was personally without any stealth boys by this point, and they can be hard to obtain once you've run out. Still, it is possible to get in and out with minimal stealth skill and not be seen. Once you have the specifications and return them to Alice, she'll commend you for not getting caught or resorting to violence. With this task out of the way, the third and final task will see us convincing a Crimson Caravan employee to quit due to him being particularly bad at the job. However, family connections to the caravan make it impossible to fire him, so it has to be of his own volition. The only problem is that this individual resides in Freeside, so we'll quickly gather evidence on Alice by unlocking her safe and finding a written agreement between her and the Van Graffs. With that complete, it's finally time to enter Freeside proper and clear up some of the loose ends we've been holding on to up to this point. Freeside has a lot going on for somewhere so run down. From a limitless supply of thugs that will constantly attack you, to drug addicts, to the followers of the apocalypse, and even to a gang of Elvis impersonators, it basically has it all. While players can technically get into the strip without entering Freeside via the use of the monorail in Camp McCarran, the area is still designed to act as a midpoint between the player adventuring to New Vegas and eventually meeting Mr. House. This is evident in how Freeside must be accessed to come face to face with the large gate into the strip which is heavily guarded by Securitrons similar to Victor. Freeside is broken up into two major areas, each of which are instanced. New Vegas had a shaky development which I want to go into more later, and there was a lot of dropped or unfinished content. On top of that, the game was being designed on an engine that was incredibly volatile for hardware like the 360, PS3, and PC. The Gamebryo engine can only do so much, so trying to create an entire city dense with objects around the area, neon signs, and various NPCs, the area had to be broken up fairly often to prevent game crashing, lag, and frame drops. There are mods online to change this, such as ones that fully open up the strip, a location that is usually broken into three major sections. We already have a way into the strip, but we'll discuss later our multiple options for entering if we choose to use them. Before that though, let's clear out some of the quests we've been hanging on to, starting with Eddie. Since we've decided to allow the followers to look over Eddie instead of the Brotherhood, this is the best time to head to the nearby fort in Freeside and drop him off. Doing so will remove Eddie from the party, and it'll take three to four days before he's returned to print 
Rim. This is ultimately a necessary gameplay mechanic as there is one more non-humanoid companion we meet in Freeside and acquiring them would fill Eddie's slot, placing him in some sort of companion limbo. Instead, he's fully removed from our party and sent back to his main location within Prim once all is said and done. Who you choose to upgrade Eddie ultimately determines what kind of upgrades he'll receive. The Brotherhood will upgrade his armor, leading to a visual change in Eddie's aesthetic. He'll be cleaner and altogether look more advanced, while the followers will attach an extra laser to Eddie that provides various damage and firing bonuses. This is the main headquarters of the followers within New Vegas. They not only work to preserve technology while making it available to all, they also work as doctors, patching up the locals, and helping them with things like chem addictions. Julie Farkas runs things around here, and you can talk to her about what's going on around Freeside and how you can help. Julie requires things like medical supplies from you to help as many people as possible, and offering some will build your reputation with the followers, but what Julie and the followers really need is a steady supply of medicine so they're not constantly scavenging for it. This is where the local Freeside casino owners, the Garretts, come in, and we'll pay them a visit shortly to see how they can help Julie and the followers. In the meantime, there's one other task Julie needs help with, and that's a couple of addicts who are refusing help with their addiction. Bill Ronte and Jacob Hoff hang around the ruins of Freeside, and at least one must be talked to in order to learn that their supply of chems are coming from a man named Dixon close to one of the entrances. In order to help both men, Dixon needs to be taken out of the picture, and like many other quests within the game, you can either convince him, bribe him, or kill him to make this happen. Once Dixon is out of the way, a variety of science and speech checks can convince the two to head to the fort in order to be taken care of by the followers. Some of these checks require certain chems to be used to alleviate the withdrawal symptoms, but all of the speech checks can reason with the two individuals enough to send them on their way without any extra inventory. That's one of the nice things about New Vegas as a game. No matter what option lay before you, there's generally a way of dealing with a situation right then and there, with minimal fuss if you invested in the right skills at the time. Arcade Ganon, one of our next companions, is a follower and works within the fort, but we still have Cassidy to deal with, so we'll come back to him after the quest sequence. In order to finish Cass's questline, we need to either kill the leaders of the Van Graffs and Crimson Caravan, or we need to collect evidence that will allow us to take them to court. We already grabbed the evidence from the caravan, so it's time to hit up the Van Graffs and get what we can from them. Upon reaching the Silver Rush, owned by the Van Graffs as a source of energy weaponry, you'll be asked to deposit your weaponry before heading in so as to not cause any issues while inside. Once inside, you'll be met with a scripted sequence of Gloria Van Graff, interrogating a business partner who is asking for more money slash a renegotiation of their contract, to which Gloria kills the individual's partner standing behind him. This is your actual introduction to the Van Graffs, a group of individuals who will work with you for business but aren't above killing to keep themselves on top. And as we know, this includes taking out caravans in order to monopolize their market. You can actually do a variety of tasks for the Van Graffs if you are so inclined. Your introductory quest to working for them includes guarding the door of the Silver Rush and patting down anyone who wants to come inside. Following this, you are tasked with delivering a package for the gang and then finally asked to bring them cast for a meeting. This entire questline is a bit of a balancing act alongside others. If you want to get the most out of the Van Graffs, you need to bring them cast, who will end up being killed on the spot and permanently lost to you as a companion. This path leads to a final quest step where you take part in the Sting operation against the Legion. During a weapon deal, the NCR storms in to take out the various Legion members who show up. This leads to both NCR and Van Graff fame, but is ultimately not the best course of action if you want to keep all companions. Instead, the best thing you can do is complete the package delivery to get whatever reward you can from the Van Graffs before then finding the evidence necessary to incriminate them alongside the Crimson Caravan. Once you have both pieces of evidence, you can bring them to Ranger Jackson all the way back at the Mojave Outpost in order to get the process of taking down both groups through legal means, but not before promising you won't take matters into your own hands. This is the end of the questline and gives Cass the Calm Heart perk, which bestows 50 additional hit points. Alternatively, if you took revenge on everyone before making it to this point, Cass will gain the Hands of Vengeance perk that provides her with a 15% damage boost. Depending on when you completed this quest, you may find yourself in a bit of a predicament, namely that Simon, the guard of the Van Graffs, will be openly hostile to you now in Freeside, leading to an altercation outside of the Silver Rush. If you kill him quickly while using stealth, nothing else will come of this, but getting into a bigger gunfight leads to multiple other Van Graff members coming out to attack you. Still, as long as you don't actually head in to kill Gloria and John Baptiste specifically, this doesn't affect the questline or dialogue in any way. If you do go and kill everyone after the fact, Cass will appear frustrated and ask why they jumped through so many hoops if they were just going to kill everyone anyway, which is a pretty valid response and good to see them add just in case. Fun fact, if you helped harden, oust McNamara 
Kamara back in the Hidden Valley Bunker, his quest to have you join the Brotherhood includes you taking out the Van Graffs to prevent further sale of energy weaponry throughout the Mojave. With Cass taken care of, it's time to finally meet Arcade Ganon. Similar to how Veronica is affiliated with the Brotherhood, Arcade has an affiliation with a faction known as the Enclave, in which his father was an officer within. The Enclave is an amalgamation of pre-war government and corporations and military, but their exact power in comparison to other factions is unknown. For the most part, they work within the shadows and were the cause of various misdeeds across the wasteland. Originally, before the war, their main driving motivation was via anti-communist rhetoric, a recurring theme within Fallout that plays off of America's fear of any form of economical ideology that isn't capitalism. After the war, however, they took on a much more pseudo-racial approach due to the Enclave believing that they are the last of pure humanity. While everyone else in the wasteland is tainted in some way, while not a large factor in New Vegas specifically, they are a main antagonist within Fallout 3 and some previous entries. The Enclave are a propaganda machine that are designed to show how the anti-communist rhetoric of America wasn't far off from falling down the rabbit hole of Puritan Nazi rhetoric. They even attempted to commit a global genocide of all mutant life, which included anyone and everyone whether they were mutated or not. So in simpler terms, the Enclave, who even go by the United States of America themselves as a form of propaganda, are Fallout's equivalent to the Nazis of World War II and even our current modern day as the rhetoric have found a way to stay alive and periodically resurge. This puts Arcade in an interesting spot. He grew up within the Enclave, but ultimately detached from them in order to join up with the followers of the Apocalypse while living under the NCR, the same group that ultimately sacked Navarro, where the remnants of the Enclave were staying at the time. While Arcade's father passed away very early into his life, his mother and multiple members of his father's old unit took care of them and they jumped from location to location while on the run from the NCR and the Brotherhood of Steel. Arcade is a good person in the sense that he does good. He helps people whenever he can, and he believes that he's following in his father's footsteps by doing so, even if the means of doing good is sometimes through choosing difficult decisions. This allows the player to contrast him to the remnants of the Enclave, as we will see during his questline. To start said questline, we need to complete a series of tasks similar to Boone. There are various locations and events within the Enclave that can earn you loyalty points for Arcade, of which you need around 5 to trigger his questline, although you also need to be a certain point within the progression of the storyline as well. There's various ways to build up these points, such as visiting a crashed vertebrate near Camp Searchlight, or visiting the Repcon headquarters once more. Arcade will generally comment on the technology, usually with an understanding or history of it that questions his own history as a follower. You can prod him about it, but he ultimately won't tell you about his history with the Enclave until later on. I purposely save a quest from Boyd back at Camp McCarran for this point in the game as it can award Arcade with two loyalty points. A soldier named Corporal White has gone missing recently and you are tasked for looking into it. After investigating the issues with the NCR's water system around the farms, this leads you to Westside where you run into Tom Anderson once more. You can get Tom Anderson to confess to murdering White, who is snooping around due to Anderson's meddling with the water supply, siphoning it from the NCR to help the people of Westside. Choosing not to turn in Anderson, a member of the followers, gains you two additional points with Arcade. Once you have the points for Arcade, it's best to send him back to the followers for now. He'll be back, but not until we progress a bit further within the strip itself. We've been helping out around Freeside a bit, but the followers still need a consistent source of medical supplies. This is where the Garretts come in. The Garretts are a pair of siblings who run a casino in Freeside called the Atomic Wrangler. Each of them has a quest for you to complete, but it's the brother you need to talk to in order to come to an agreement with the followers. The Garretts are the only people in Freeside who have alcohol stills, and I'm no expert on the process, but this essentially means that they would be able to provide the things like a supply of pure alcohol or anesthetic and disinfectant, as well as medics permanently for the followers as long as they helped with regular maintenance of the distillery itself. Julie is initially unwilling to accept this agreement, due to the Garretts being one of the main suppliers of drugs within Freeside, and essentially leading to addictions and suffering within. They believe that while they may cause addiction, they'd never want to see their clientele get to the point where they couldn't function, as it would be both bad for business and they also care about the people of Freeside. You can take that how you want. At the end of the day, the Garretts are supplying addictive chems to a town of addicts, or are in turn creating new addicts through the process. Unfortunately, it's the only option within this questline, technically making it a necessary evil. The main way of convincing Julie to do the deal is to point out that even if people are addicted to the chems, her group will be in a much better position to help them, essentially creating a cycle 
of necessity between the two. The Garrets hurt people even if they don't see it that way, and they get to hurt people more efficiently with the help of the followers. But the followers get to help more people overall, from addicts to the injured. It's not the perfect setup, but it's the only one and sometimes that's all you get. A situation where everyone is not necessarily happy, but content within some capacity. As for the Garrets themselves, you can collect some debts from them around Freeside which is pretty uneventful. Meanwhile, the brother wants you to find a series of unique sex workers that his clients have been requesting for the hotel portion of the Atomic Wrangler. It's heavily implied if not outright stated that all of these sex workers are for the brother himself and they include a ghoul cowboy, a smooth talking gentleman, and a sex robot. Convincing the first two is easy enough, you can find the smooth talker near the entrance of the strip and the ghoul cowboy is coincidentally a mercenary guard within the follower's fort. The robot requires a bit more work however. Within the ruins of Freeside is a Protectron that can be reprogrammed to have a sex work protocol. You can either do this yourself via a science check or head to Mick and Ralph's, a nearby store within Freeside, in order to have them make a program for you. Once programmed, you have an opportunity to test out Fisto for yourself, but it isn't necessary. If you have the Wild Wasteland perk, you'll run into three grannies in spring dresses that attempt to kill you, known as Mods Muggers. This is a reference to a Monty Python skit about a gang of women known as Hell's Grannies who would attack people within London. Once you return with the debts and the sex workers, you'll gain a large amount of reputation within Freeside as well as some caps. The brother is especially ecstatic to see you manage to find sex workers that filled each of his requests, especially Fisto. The sister has one more job for you that requires you to kill a bounty hunter who had the same job of collecting debts but ultimately double-crossed the Garrets. It's also pretty uneventful, but you can offer to take the man's hat as proof that you killed him but still let him live if you want. The one issue is that the man is within the strip proper, so if you're waiting to head in there, you'll also have to wait on completing this questline. There's one more major faction to discuss in Freeside, but we need to make a quick stop before that. Near the east entrance to Freeside is a couple of kids playing in the streets. Specifically, there's one kid chasing another with what looks like a toy gun. You can very easily convince the kid to sell it to you for a small amount of caps, and at a glance, the weapon, known as Euclid Sea Finder, seems to be a non-functional toy. At least that would be the case if we didn't already power up Archimedes 2 back at Helios 1. This is the tool slash device that Father Elijah was looking for during his time at the base, and with everything set up along the way, it is now fully functional within our hands, but what does it do exactly? Had enough? The Sea Finder can be used as a targeting system to shoot a powerful laser beam from a satellite decimating anything in its radius of effect. It can be used every 24 in-game hours, but only outdoors. Surprisingly, you think the kid playing with his friend would have accidentally activated it due to us powering up Archimedes. It's a bit of a lost opportunity really, as if you found the gun first, everything would be fine, but the option to see some sort of devastation by powering up Archimedes 2 first was glossed over, although it's understandable why. These are two kids, and I doubt Obsidian or Bethesda would have been okay with killing them just to make the connection between the gun and Helios 1. That being said, it would have been interesting to have the kid accidentally set it off from a distance and have that lead to some additional dialogue. Regardless, the power of Sun is now within our hands and can be used periodically throughout the run. The final major area within Freeside to talk about is the School of Impersonation, a pre-war building used to teach people to impersonate Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Understandably then, everyone within the gang dresses or presents themselves in some ways similar to Elvis himself, with the leader of the gang being the most similar entitled The King. In theory, the kings run Freeside. There's plenty of gangs and groups doing their own thing and running their own businesses, but for the most part, everything gets funneled through the kings in some capacity. They keep the streets and the people of the area safe for the most part and don't seem to ask for much in return other than their independence from both Mr. House and the NCR. In fact, the only faction within Freeside that seems to be on relatively bad terms with them are NCR squatters that have been slowly moving in and laying claim to what is considered King's territory, leading to bad blood and violence between the two groups. In terms of interacting with the faction, you can request an audience with the King either by paying a small fee or using a speech check to explain you simply want to pay your respects. This is also most likely your first or second interaction with Pacer, who is the only other unique member of the gang. If you helped the Van Graffs at all, you would have met him during the security detail in front of the Silver Rush. Pacer has
has a bit of an attitude on him and comes off as extremely arrogant and prideful, and this bites him in the ass a little later. Regardless of how you got in, you can begin conversing with the king who has his cybernetic dog Rex beside him. Rex is the other non-humanoid companion you can recruit in the game. If you ask the king about Rex, he'll explain that Rex isn't doing well, and even Julie Farkas hasn't been able to help the poor thing. You can offer to look into it further and talk to Julie about it who mentions that while she can't do anything about it, there's a doctor up in Jacobstown northwest of there that definitely could. We'll revisit Rex and his issues after finishing up the king's questline. For the king himself, he has a few jobs for you to do that help earn you favor with him personally and the people of Freeside. The first job is finding out why everyone is hiring a specific bodyguard up near the southern entrance. The king specifically wants you to find out why, but not necessarily confront the man about it. The bodyguard in question is a man named Oris. When you talk to him, he claims to be the absolute best way of making sure you're safe when crossing Freeside towards the Strip. After hiring Oris, he will begin taking you across Freeside. Once near the Strip, you will see a band of Freeside thugs and Oris suggests a detour. Said detour has Oris begin to rush ahead faster than you can actually travel, giving him a moment to get into an altercation and kill several thugs that were waiting to ambush you. The thugs in question, however, are not dead, and a medicine check allows you to observe this. Additionally, an intelligence check will allow you to point out that there are four men, but only three rounds were shot, with Oris explaining it away as him shooting through one man and hitting another. The trip can go one of three ways. You either observe Oris trying to trick you, you don't, or you kill him. Either way, you need to return to the king to progress. If you did observe everything, the king will pull him off the street and congratulate you. If not, you need to go hire him again. This time around, Oris is on to you and attempts to jump you with his thugs. No matter the outcome, you'll complete this stage of the quest for the king, and he'll have a new job for you. Seems some Freeside individuals that are friends with the king were jumped recently and are holed up at the fort while they are being treated for their injuries. The main suspect is the NCR due to the growing tensions between the Freeside and NCR citizens, which is known to sometimes turn violent. By interviewing the victims, one of them mentions hearing one of the perpetrators call the other lieutenant, thus implicating the NCR. From there, you can return to the king to progress into investigating the NCR further. In order to do so, you only need to talk to Julie Farkas, but you can additionally talk to some missionaries that are pointing NCR residents towards a soup kitchen in the Freeside ruins. Julie points out that she's friends with Major Elizabeth Kieran, who is running the nearby kitchen and says you can mention her to get a good word in. Once in the kitchen, you can talk to Kieran and inquire as to why they are only feeding NCR residents, which is in turn aggravating Freeside citizens who feel slighted by this. Kieran explains that they couldn't get enough funding and supplies from the NCR in order to feed anyone else due to an altercation they had when attempting to visit the king. Kieran originally sent an envoy to the king to organize a relief effort, but her men were attacked along the way. After the attack, the higher-ups within the NCR agreed to still help Kieran with her relief effort, but at a much smaller scale, effectively making it so only NCR citizens would get food. When you return to pass on this information to the king, you're stopped by Pacer, who informs you not to bother the king with it, explaining it as them dealing with potential spies for the NCR. Bypassing Pacer and telling the king about it anyway will leave him shocked at the news, as no envoy ever made it to him. He's telling the truth here, and it's Pacer who intercepted the envoy and ultimately assaulted them. As you're discussing this news with the king, a gang member comes with news of his own, informing the two of you that Pacer and some members went to attack the NCR and are currently in a shootout. You head over to deal with the situation to find several dead gang members and Pacer cowering behind some cover. Approaching the NCR allows you to talk to Kieran and tell her that the king is willing to work on a relief effort with her. She's a little suspicious, but agrees saying that the king should watch his back because she knows that their men made it into the school of impersonation. With the hostilities taken care of and the NCR and kings agreeing to work together for some time, you can return to the king who will reward you with one favor, which you can cash in at any time. These favors can be any of four options, including entrance to the strip, permission to join the kings, 1000 caps, or one special favor that we'll save for a little later. The conflict between the NCR and the kings is an interesting one. You have a community, albeit flawed, having their territory encroached on by groups of individuals under a completely different affiliation. The NCR is known to push into territory territory that isn't their own and attempt at taking it over. If they can't, they ultimately leave it to their own devices, but also don't offer any aid. Look at Prim or look at Bitter Springs, which they only took over after driving out the Great Cons by accidentally murdering several children along the way. Freeside isn't just some town, it's directly connected to the Strip. It is a prime location for the NCR to have influence in, especially since they are already holding many locations.
fortifications around the surrounding area. It's not something they're going to give up lightly, and the king understands this, leading to the animosity between the two groups. Still, these aren't necessarily soldiers at the gates of Freeside, but civilians under the NCR affiliation. People down on their luck who are looking for help and aren't necessarily hurting anyone until violence breaks out between the two groups as the animosity grows. Then, the violence is an excuse to escalate even further, and you have people like Pacer who see this as an opportunity to exact vengeance or revenge. Pacer is someone driven by the scenarios he creates in his head. He has decided that the NCR are the enemy, and therefore anyone affiliated with them are as well. When an envoy of soldiers are sent to help the people of Freeside, Pacer is suspicious and driven by this paranoia, ultimately attacks the group while under the assumption that they were spies. In a way, you can't blame him for being suspicious. But was it Pacer's place to not only take matters into his own hands, but in a way that ultimately cuts off possible ties of negotiation between Freeside and the NCR? Of course the NCR aren't innocent. At the slightest bit of aggression from the people of Freeside, the higher-ups within the NCR were quick to cut all ties and only supply those who are verified NCR residents. When you are getting directions to the soup kitchen, you specifically have to prove to the missionaries that you are of NCR affiliation, otherwise you weren't allowed to go. This continues the cycle of animosity between the two groups. Next thing you know, you have NCR beating up on Freeside civilians as some sort of revenge over what happened to their own people. And this all comes to a head when Pacer tries to attack Kieran and her team, and this isn't even the end of the conflict. Freeside is a look at many things. It's a look at the poverty of the wasteland, with the direct contrast being placed beside the wealthy elite. While people scrounge and suffer to survive, the individuals within the Strip live easy. But it's not just a commentary on the economical gaps we create within our capitalistic society. It also looks at how we value community as a whole. Freeside is run down, but it is independent, and the NCR doesn't want that, leading to conflict. Now there's one more stop I'd like to make before heading into the Strip proper, and that's heading to Jacobstown to deal with our final two companions, those being Rex and Lily. Rex isn't going to get any better without some help, and after dealing with all the issues in Freeside, the king is willing to let us take his pet to Jacobstown to be checked out and even keep him as our own. The only real issue to make note of on the way is that Rex doesn't like hats nor the people who wear them, and he generally will not interact with the player while they wear one. Jacobstown is a bit of a jog from New Vegas and leads up into the mountains where there's a surprising amount of animal life and vegetation, including an abundance of pine trees. The town is really a resort on Mount Charleston and was taken over by a super mutant named Marcus who broke off from the group back at Black Mountain in order to create a more peaceful settlement for all. For that reason, you are welcome with open arms when arriving as long as you agree not to act up. Dr. Henry, a human scientist, as well as his ghoul research assistant, Calamity, are currently working out of here in order to study the issues with Nightkin and their mental instability due to the prolonged use of Stealth Boys. When meeting with Henry, he mentions that he is working on a Stealth Boy Mark II that would last longer and be altogether safer for Nightkin and help prevent any mental regression in the future. Unfortunately, it's rather unstable and untested, meaning that he is forced to look at other avenues to help the Nightkin in the meantime. This leads him into investigating a nearby cave full of Night Stalkers that coincidentally have the ability to turn invisible, which is unlike them and is potentially a mutation worth studying. We're technically here for Rex, but you can help out Henry and gain a new companion in the process by agreeing to check out the nearby Night Stalker cave. As for Rex, Henry takes a look at him and determines he needs a new brain in order to survive, which was always weird to me. Your brain is essentially your identity. To take out my brain and to put the brain of someone else inside of my head would no longer make my body me. I am my brain and I have been removed from my body. Whichever brain is in my body now is someone else. Would this not be the same for Rex, or does the concept of identity and memory work differently here? If it doesn't, does it matter for a dog who is more instinctual than sentient? Would Rex still care about hats if he had a new brain? Would he answer Rex or the name of another dog whose brain we took? What are the rules here? Well, the ending scenes actually shed some light on this, suggesting that Rex kept his memories, but they ultimately meld with the memories of the brain transplanted into him. How this is possible, I don't know. Fallout science is like RPG magic. Sometimes it just works and you can't explain shit. Luckily, on our travels when dealing with the fiends, we got the brain of one of Violet's dogs, Violetta. There are two other options, that of a legion dog known as Lupa, and one of Old Lady Gibson's dogs, Ray. Each of these brains provides different 
different perks. The chems within Violetta's brain lead to Rex's movement speed becoming faster, while Ray's brain will increase his attack damage and Looper's brain which increases his damage threshold. I've talked a lot about stats, perks, and effects throughout this retrospective, but I've never gone into good detail about how the game actually works. Fallout 3 and New Vegas are RPGs, but not like the entries within the series past. Instead, they make a blend of open world RPG and first person shooter, taking Bethesda's approach with Elder Scrolls and combining that with the setting and mechanics of a first person post apocalyptic shooter. There are two main types of combat within the game ballistic, also known as guns, and energy, known as energy weapons. There's melee weapons and unarmed as well, which I never really used, but they are there. Each of these are considered their own skills that you can increase with each level up while progressing through the game, and they'll affect how effective and accurate your weapon is in vats and how much it wobbles when outside of it, as well as how much damage it does in general. Vats is a system introduced in Fallout 3 and would allow players to select specific body parts to attack on an enemy in order to provide various benefits within combat, such as crippling their shooting arm or blowing up their head. It was made to bridge the gap between old school Fallout and the new first person iteration. Each body part will have a percentage chance to hit, and you can raise this with the relevant skills and special stats. But to use VATS consistently, you need to expend AP, which regenerates over time, meaning that while VATS is a powerful mechanic, it isn't limitless. I personally always found the system fairly enjoyable and welcome considering the shooting mechanics of the Fallout series were never anything to write home about. They're clunky and kind of a mess, and Fallout 3 was an entry that didn't even introduce the concept of iron sights, meaning you were forced to hip fire until the release of New Vegas later on. Vats is a bit of a crutch to fall onto in this sense, but one that you earn as it is only as good as you make it be by raising the relevant stats and skills. Outside the combat itself, you have various other skills on top of that, things like medicine that dictate how effective aid items will be, repair which upgrades your proficiency at fixing equipment, and many more. Lockpicking and science are two halves of the same coin. If you can't pick something, there's probably a terminal nearby that can hack into it to gain access and vice versa. Each of these skills are used to access things that are locked away to the player, and they have various other uses outside of that, such as science raising the amount of energy ammunition you can recycle at crafting benches. Locks and terminals come in tiers of difficulty, from very easy to very hard, and each of these have a standard skill requirement. If you're feeling very lucky, you can generally force a lock with a percentage chance based on the level of lock and your current skill, but this is only worthwhile on the lower level locks to save you some time as the percentage chance of success is very high once your skill level is maxed out. And you will be maxing out a lot of these skills as you progress, especially with the right perks and intelligence levels, as your intelligence directly affects how many bonus skill points you get per level. New Vegas is a very easy game to maximize your stats in, if you know how to, and it's not a particularly convoluted process. Get the bonus perks as soon as possible, and run in an intelligence stat of 9 until you can upgrade it to 10. This is different from games like Oblivion and Skyrim where you level up skills through use. Instead, actions and quests are what gain you experience, and then on level up you decide what to do with your awarded skill points. It might sound straightforward, but this simplicity is more of a benefit than anything else when it comes to Bethesda games. If you've never played Oblivion before, their system for awarding levels based on your major skills being used often is generally looked at as a convoluted mess. So why did I bring up these aspects of gameplay at this time to begin with? Mostly because I keep mentioning things like damage threshold hold or resistance, two stat modifiers which affect how much damage a character takes when attacked. Damage resistance or DR is self-explanatory. It resists the damage taken in and lessens it overall depending on the value of the stat. Let's say we have a DR of 75 in New Vegas. If that's the case, an attack of 50 damage would be reduced by 75% to an attack of 12.5 damage. If you have a damage threshold from your armor or perk, however, that gets hard subtracted from the currently reduced value, so if you have a damage threshold of 10, you subtract 10 from 12.5 for a final value of 2.5 damage. That's not all though. New Vegas doesn't allow the final result to be anything lower than 20% of the base damage. This means that a value of 2.5, which is 5% of 50 damage, would be bumped up to 20% of 50 or 10 damage total. This is why a DR of anything higher than 80 is the highest the stat can be while being effective. Anything higher than then this would reduce the damage past the 20% rule before the DT has even been applied, making said DT effectively useless. DT has actually been around since Fallout 1 and 2, but was removed in 3 before showing back up in New Vegas, only to be removed again in Fallout 4. What all of this means is that no matter how much armor 
you are wearing, nor how many perks you may have to raise your defense, you will always take some damage no matter what, and the higher the base damage, the higher the value will be once DR and DT are calculated. So when I mention that a character can get higher DT through a perk, like Rex here, that's what I'm talking about. There's plenty of other mechanics as well, such as skills awarded with every level up that I mentioned previously, as well as perks you receive every two level ups. These perks are unlocked via skill and special prerequisites. If the player has the right stats, they will be able to unlock certain abilities for their character, such as the ability to move faster while sneaking or to carry more equipment. This means you get around 25 perks within the game plus DLCs, so there's plenty of customization available to make your character mechanically unique. New Vegas is full of these calculations and mechanics. I'm not going to go into all of them. There's already too much to talk about and we haven't even hit the strip yet. But I will say this about the gameplay. It's a clunky mess. A sandbox that you need to accept is going to be a little broken here and there and a little rough around the edges to fully enjoy it. But once you do, and once everything starts working in unison, it works. And even the most comedic, nonsensical firefights can feel exhilarating in their own right. Especially when a group of Legion assassins teleports out of thin air in order to kill you. With Rex receiving a new brain regardless of which one it was or how you obtained it, this is considered the end of his companion quest, meaning you can choose between him and Eddie at your leisure based on which you prefer to have around for your various escapades. We still need to help out Dr. Henry, however, and in order to do so, we need to go investigate the nearby Night Stalker cave while optionally taking a super mutant named Lily along with us. Lily is a 75-year-old woman turned into a nightkin by the Master and spends most of her time tending to the town's bighorners. Lily is the final companion companion we can recruit in New Vegas outside of DLC, and so picking her up here helps us kill, again, two birds with one stone, considering we had Rex by our side as well. Before heading to the cave, you're stopped by Marcus, who informs you that several NCR mercenaries are scoping out the town from a distance. Marcus asks you to deal with them, but preferably non-violently. Marcus wants a peaceful life for anyone within Jacobstown. He wants to set up trade routes with the NCR, and the large source of big horners could make this possible with meat and hides. Unfortunately, they are being used as scapegoats by the NCR for various local bighorner attacks, leading members of the NCR into attempting to take them out. You can approach the group, who are verbally hostile, but a speech check can have them sent on their way peacefully, which pleases Marcus. That's one of the nice things about New Vegas. Not every decision or check is incredibly important, but having so many staggered across the game helps make it feel like you are an individual who is either well-versed in the skills you can pass or less so at the ones you can't. Within the cave are several Night Stalkers, all of whom have the ability to turn invisible. Unfortunately, further investigation into the cave finds a dead nightkin and a stealth boy that has been chewed open, with the resulting radioactivity explaining the camouflage effect on the Night Stalkers, rather than it being a genetic mutation. With the Night Stalkers being a dead end, the only other way Dr. Henry has to help the nightkin with their camouflage addiction while hopefully preventing any more damage to their minds is his work on the stealth boy Mark II. And the only way to test it is on Lily, as she is one of the most most resilient of her group, and also the first to openly want to help and volunteer. Upon asking Lily if she's still up for it, she agrees, and Henry attaches the Stealth Boy Mark II onto Lily before having her activate it. Calamity performs the reading during the process and finds gamma radiation readings of zero, which is apparently unprecedented, and Lily seems completely fine. Everything seems to have gone without a hitch until a group of Nightkin led by a unique super mutant named Keen show up to take the Stealth Boy for themselves. This can be resolved violently, but you can also pass a speech check to calm them down and convince them that it's the greater good to perform further research and production on the new Stealth Boy. Once all is said and done within Jacobstown, you can re-recruit Lily as a permanent companion. Like all the other companions we've dealt with thus far, Lily has a companion questline, although not necessarily as involved as the rest. There's three specific triggers that must be hit in order for her to progress to that point. Lily's questline is interesting for multiple reasons. To start, it's another unmarked questline in the game. In effect, it doesn't show up as a quest in your Pip-Boy. Additionally, Lily is one of the characters that could possibly not get a statistical benefit depending on your decisions when talking to her. To start, you need to talk to Lily about Leo, a voice within Lily's head that pushes her to combat and violence. Once you've asked about Leo and replied to Lily, you need to wait for her to have a mental break as it's known in the game. To observe this, Lily needs to go under 50% of her HP and maybe further when in or out of combat, meaning you yourself can force this state by dealing damage to her. Once the break occurs and Lily eventually settles down, you can then talk to her about it. Finally, you have to wait for Lily to mention her medication. Once she has, there will be a potential dialogue about it when speaking to her. After sleep 
sleeping, resting, or fast traveling, you'll hear a recording of children greeting their grandmother, which allows you to talk to Lily about her past and also her medication. Lily reveals that she hasn't been taking the full dosage of her medication, which is supposed to be helping with the breaks that she is experiencing. You can convince Lily to either keep taking a half dose to start taking her full dose or to stop taking the medication altogether. If Lily continues taking her half dose, she will continue having the breaks, but she can be immediately calmed down by entering sneak mode. If she takes no dose from then on, she will experience breaks at half HP and have multiple stat gains regardless of if she is experiencing a break or not. Finally, and most interestingly, Lily can be convinced to take her full dosage, which will not bestow any stat benefits onto the character and will permanently remove her ability to have a break. I really like this option because while it doesn't necessarily benefit you from a mechanical sense, it does benefit Lily and her own mind. Sometimes the best course of action, depending on your character and you as a player, isn't to do something that will make the game easier or your party more powerful. Sometimes you can simply help someone with an aspect of their life that they are struggling with, and may even sacrifice something in the process to do so. Lily is an example of this. You lose an aspect of her combat ability, but at the same time, you get to know that she won't suffer from these mental breaks moving forward. Lily is our final companion in New Vegas proper. There are temporary companions we'll receive within the DLC, but as of writing this, you've met everyone that we can take on our journey through the Mojave, and while all of them are unique in their own ways, with their own personalities, you can only ever have two companions at a time. Wanting to switch out companions can be particularly annoying as well, considering whenever you remove them, they all go back to the places you met them to begin with. Boone is in Novak, Veronica at the 188, Cass at the Mojave Outpost. You'd think there'd be an easier way of keeping them all together, one key location that they could all hang out in so you only needed to stop by one location to do so, and there is a place like that. A giant skyscraper that can be seen all over the Mojave, no matter where you are at the time. The base of operations of Mr. House himself, the Lucky 38. How do you enter the Strip in New Vegas? There's a multitude of ways to do so. We've already discussed that having a good reputation with the NCR while also saving the monorail will allow you to use said monorail to enter and exit as you please. This may be one of the earliest and easiest ways of doing so, assuming you have been helping the NCR throughout your playthrough. Upon exiting the monorail, you'll be greeted by an NCR trooper who expresses envy at the fact that you are allowed to bring weapons onto the Strip. This is due to Mr. House not allowing any of the NCR are the same privilege in order to protect his territory against them while keeping them on a leash. But getting in through the NCR is a little too easy, so what about the front gate? When accessing the front gate of this trip, you may see a Freeside resident attempt to rush in, leading to their death. Up to this point, you may have never seen a Securitron be openly hostile, but as weapons, the Securitrons are surprisingly effective at straight up murdering a dude, especially at greater numbers, and we'll see soon that the Securitrons can be even more efficient with the right upgrades. So forcing your way in while possible isn't really an option here, but you can talk to the security guard and get in fairly easily. To start, a science skill of 8 will let you override the robot systems and force them to let you in. If your skill isn't high enough, you'll only need to pass a credit check by having at least 2,000 caps in your inventory. Having 2,000 caps by this point has to be one of the easiest ways overall to get in, assuming you've been selling literally anything you've picked up along the way. Fallout is full of equipment and items. Things that can be repaired can become especially valuable at full durability. And there's plenty of merchants out there with fairly large wallets to take your goods. If for some reason you don't have 2,000 caps, which is seriously insane by this point in the game, you can head to Mick and Ralph's to convince them into making you a passport for 500 caps, which you can negotiate down to 375. If you help the king and use his one favor to get you in, to the strip, he will have Mick and Ralph make you one for free, which, again, is not necessary at all if you simply have enough caps on you at the time, making this one of the poorer favors to ask for. Once you're through the main gate of Vegas, you're once again met with Victor, who finally admits that he is one of the few Securitrons with both a personality and the ability to hop between other Securitron units, allowing him to make you believe he's been following you the entire journey, when in reality, he can simply hit up 
nearby Securitrons to keep tabs on you. Victor works for Mr. House, and it was because of House that Victor saved you in the first place. Now Victor is here to greet you and explain that Mr. House would like to see you enter the Lucky 38 and meet with him before you try to exact any revenge on Benny at the nearby Topps Casino. The Lucky 38 is the crown jewel of New Vegas, an abandoned casino that no one has ever set foot into and is known to house no one other than Mr. House himself. To go into the Lucky 38 and come out again is a remarkable feat the likes of which nobody has ever seen before and you will be noticed for doing so. On attempting to enter the casino, Victor informs you that you can't actually take any companions with you and thus must leave them at the door. Later on, you can bring them into parts of the Lucky 38, but not at the moment. Once inside, you're directed to an elevator that takes you to House's penthouse and you're met with one of Mr. House's girls named Jane, who is simply a Securitron with a feminine personality. When you come face to face with Mr. House, it's not with a man, but a machine, a generated face on a computer with a voice coming out of a speaker. By this point, it's hard to tell what or who you're dealing with. Mr. House was the president and CEO of Robco Industries. For him to be alive now, over 200 years later, is realistically impossible. So who is he really? You're left with an enigma in front of you that leaves questions buzzing through your head. Is this the real Mr. House or a fabrication? Is this just a computer program on a screen? Or is someone talking to you from another location? These aren't questions easily answered, and when asked on the subject, Mr. House asserts that he is the real deal. Flesh and blood Robert Edwin House, born around the year 2020 and still alive as of 2281. His mystery lends to his appeal. House is well-spoken and presents himself well. Although often coming off as arrogant in the process, he has his own plans and goals and he won't even take the time to answer your questions until you answer his. When you first meet him, he wants to know what you think of New Vegas in comparison to the rest of the wasteland and talks about how his intellectual and financial sacrifices slash investments have led to the city managing to thrive after all these years. New Vegas is not only House's best project, but also his attempt at creating an independent civilization that is free from the sins of their past, something that he believes people are divulging in currently and is looking to rectify. But how would he do this? House has power and wealth. His Securitrons control New Vegas, but they aren't invincible. Why hasn't he been taken out yet by the NCR or the three families he keeps distant control of? House's mystery is a large part of this. He can exert power and show force from the shadows through his Securitrons. No one knows what goes on in the Lucky 38, and no one knows just how many Securitrons there actually are. House is seen as powerful and a genius, and to oppose him could lead to repercussions of which people could only imagine, and when imagining them, you'd usually assume the worst. Robert House is completely consumed over getting his hands back on the platinum chip. The item Benny stole from you and that you were tasked with delivering to New Vegas. He won't tell you why he wants it, and he won't tell you what it does. He also won't give you any details at all outside of how he believes you could deal with Benny, because that's your job now if you choose to accept it. House is willing to pay you multiple times the amount you were offered in order to get the chip back. But what's funny is that the amount is only slightly over 1,000 caps. It's supposed to be perceived as a lot of money, but the mechanics of New Vegas say otherwise. I think I had around 40,000 caps by this point, and that was after gambling at only two casinos. You make most of your money through bartering here, and there's going to be one point in the game where we have effectively infinite wealth. House is an authoritarian. He believes that democracy was what ended the world in the first place, and believes he can bring a world of technological innovation over his everlasting rule of not only New Vegas, but the Mojave as a whole, and if left unchecked, potentially the world. He believes he is anti-democracy, but within the world of Fallout, House grew up in and participated in exactly what he is doing now. The USA wasn't run through democracy, but through a cabal of shadow people within the Enclave. Only the wealthy elite, the higher-ups in the government, and the military had any actual say in what happened within the world as they knew it, and this ultimately led to an apocalypse. The past of Fallout wasn't the fall of democracy as we know it. It was the curtain being drawn to show an authoritarian system that disguised itself as democratic. All House has done is convince himself he can do it better, and as we have seen on our travels, he hasn't been doing better at all. We still have pain and suffering throughout the wasteland and Nevada specifically due to the wage gaps present between people outside of the Strip and the people within. The Strip is run by the wealthy elite, and 
and everyone outside of that suffers in poverty unless they successfully find some way of exploiting the working class. Mr. House is role-playing the same system he has grown to resent, but believes it will work this time instead, and he does this driven by the idea of progress. The concept of progress is actually fairly new to our species overall. As we were originally becoming sentient and evolving both physically and culturally, humans didn't consider progress as a necessary step of our society. Hunting and gathering, while dangerous and ultimately leading to shorter lifespans, has never been proven to cause society to be any less happy overall than we are now. Instead, what we have seen is the concept of progress leading to actions of an endless work cycle, that of which requires more hours than our ancestors ever did. The creation of wheat farms and the abundance of the plant has successfully imprisoned humanity into the constant cycle of working harder than we have ever been expected to in order to earn less than we believe we deserve. So the wealthy can use our labor in order to create progress. Progress is what is sold to us, with the pitch that it is a natural aspect of human society that will ultimately make us happier. But happiness is not something we can just actively measure. People 1,000 years ago were happy in their own way. Our ancestors were happy. You may be happy now too. But are you happier than you would have been if you never knew about the concepts of capitalism or about the concept of progress? Would you not be content in your day-to-day -day if your world was simply within the bubble of going out to harvest food, coming back, and simply living? All stages of humanity have had suffering. Our current stage, imprisoned within capitalism, has suffering as well. Is progress a net good that actually makes society as a whole happier simply because we get to live longer and have more things to take up our time when not working? Is our society happier now that we have to work eight hour days from Monday to Friday? House would say yes, because of progress, and he wants to continue pushing progress as far as he can regardless of what anyone else says. He wants to generate income to create more income and create an easier life for those who can afford it, not for everyone. People suffer because of this, and Mr. House doesn't care. He is THE villain of Fallout New Vegas, one who believes he is actually a necessary good, same as the NCR and same as the Legion. All three major factions within the game are villains, and you are expected to choose one of them to ultimately align yourself with unless you can find another way, and you can. Independence. An ability to align all of the factions except for the Legion and have them work together, create an environment where everyone helps one another and the greed and desire of capitalism is slowly pushed outward, even if it can never be truly forgotten. An independent Vegas that will stand strong against anyone looking for greater control over the Mojave, one that may may or may not need a leader. How is something like that possible? It all lies with Benny and our wild card. Upon exiting the Lucky 38, you'll be met with an audience of onlookers who are shocked to see someone step out of the casino as it is an unprecedented event. It's so unique that a member of the NCR comes up to you and pardons you for any crimes against them, if you have them, and explains that Ambassador Crocker wants to meet with you. Ambassador Crocker, within the mechanics of the game, is in a similar role to Kaisar, acting as a sort of leader of this faction, or maybe that would be Colonel Moore who we'll meet later. There's a lot to talk about with Benny overall and many interactions with him that can go one way or the other. Mr. House wants you to take care of Benny in order to secure the platinum chip, but there's many ways of going about that. Benny is part of the chairman, one of the three major tribes in New Vegas, including the Omertas and the White Glove Society, all of which are tribes that have been taken in by Mr. House's strip where he allows them to thrive. The chairmen are run by Benny, with his second in command and Swank. Benny was also the protege of Mr. House before betraying him to get his hands on the platinum chip. Now along the way to New Vegas, we were able to pick up a couple of things, first of which was Benny's cigarette buds he left at the scene which implicate him in your attempted murder. Additionally, we have the lighter given to us by one of the great cons back in Boulder City. You can use this evidence as well as various speech checks to convince Swank of the Topps Casino that Benny has been planning against Mr. House behind their backs. This will cause Swank to give you your weapons back as well as tell Benny to head up to his suite where you can then ambush him if you so choose. Just to mention it, the major casinos in New Vegas will not allow you to bring weapons in with you. However, some weapons in the game are considered holdout weapons that won't be found during a pat down and can be brought in if you so choose. When leaving the casino, you get all of your equipment back. Convincing Swank is merely one example of getting Benny alone, but there's many other ways of going about it, not all of which I'll mention here, but my favorite way of doing it is to simply confront him out in the 
the open due to the sheer amount of shock he experiences at the sight of you, while being forced to contain himself as to not give himself away to his fellow chairman. Make no mistake, Benny is a rat through and through. You can use speech and other relevant checks or perks to get him alone easily enough, but you can never fully trust him as he will betray you. If you are ever given an option to have him left alone or out of your sight for an extended period of time, he will run off to the Legion Fort and attempt to have you killed. Why the fort? We'll get to that soon enough, but the point I'm trying to make is that your best opportunity to deal with Benny and secure the trip for yourself is right here and right now. Even saving Benny from the Legion and freeing him has him disappear and leave forever, which you may think is him simply leaving you alone, but there is actually cut content within development where Benny would eventually show up again within the Mojave and attempt to kill you anyway. He's a rat. There's no reasoning with him, and he betrays anyone at his side. There's nothing you can do with him that's useful other than putting him out of your misery, and that's what we're going to do here. Generally, within my playthroughs, I like to confront Benny head-on and take him by surprise. Then, when he tries to weasel his way out via giving you the presidential suite within the casino, you can convince him to come up with you instead so he can't simply abscond from the scene. Once up there, the best course of action is to get as much information out of Benny before killing him. You can ask him about his opinions on the tribes around and within New Vegas, as well as his time with Mr. House. All things considered, Benny doesn't seem to hold any resentment towards the man. Overall, he enjoyed working with House and found he learned a lot in the process, even complimenting the man when discussing him. Benny can explain a bit about the chip to you, explaining how it's a data storage device with the actual data being what is of value, what is platinum. Thought to be lost in the ruins of the wasteland, House paid tens of thousands of caps to have it searched for and ultimately returned to him, leading to the question, what is so important about that data? Benny points out that it has to do with the Securitrons, but he acts as though he isn't sure what, nor does he know where the chip is supposed to be used as it doesn't fit into any normal terminal. At the very least, the information about where the chip is supposed to be used is a lie. The chip is inserted into a computer within a bunker found in Kaiser's fort. Benny most likely knows this as he makes for the fort if he ever gets to escape from you. The man lies through his teeth any chance he gets in order to save his own ass and ultimately knows more about the chip and its usage than anyone else other than House himself. Once all is said and done, it's time to kill Benny. Again, if you don't do it here, you'll either have to do it down the road anyway, or you can let him go at the very end of the road in which he'll disappear forever. But this guy shot you in the head. Twice even. I think it's time we return the favor. With Benny gone, you can pick up his sweet key, his unique pistol called Maria, and his unique suit if you wish. Finally, you can also grab the catalyst that started this entire journey, the Platinum Chip. No one will turn hostile over you killing Benny, and you can make your way back to house if you so choose. But there's one more spot to investigate before we consider doing that. Benny's suite. Heading up the nearby elevator on the ground floor will take you to Benny's suite where he lives within the Topps Casino. For the most part, the room looks fairly normal, but within the back of the living space you can find a hollowed out back room set up by Benny when they were reconstructing the building. In it is a unique Securitron known simply as Yes Man. Yes Man is a creation of Benny's, a reprogrammed Securitron that is forced to abide by the will of anybody who asks something of him, and with Yes Man, Benny was able to intercept some of Mr. House's data transmissions to find out that the Platinum Chip's main use seems to be for upgrading House's defense systems in some capacity. Yes Man can even confirm that there are two locations in which the chip can be used, within the Lucky 38 itself and within the underground bunker at Fortification Hill which is currently under the occupation of the Legion. Benny's plan was to kill Mr. House and copy Yes Man into the Lucky 38 system, thus taking over New Vegas via the Securitrons. Since you are now the only one who knows about Yes Man, and Yes Man plus the Platinum Chip are the tools you need to both take control of and upgrade New Vegas, you now have the opportunity to take over Mr. House's own plan for yourself. What this means is that you, 
the player, are the wild card of New Vegas. In a game that has been constantly suggesting you pick a side between the NCR, the Legion, or even Mr. House, there is actually one more choice to you that is not directly presented and can easily be missed on a first playthrough. Why not bypass all of the factions and do what you think is best for the Mojave, making Vegas truly independent or simply take it over to bend the factions to your will? Considering how I portrayed and analyzed House earlier in terms of his authoritarian outlook on society, it'd be a little disingenuous to simply take the strip over for yourself. And Yes Man makes it clear that it's not only an option, but one he kind of expects from you. However, there is an alternative. Yes Man suggests that you look into each tribe and decide for yourself if they should be wiped out by New Vegas or left alone. Now, making that choice already says a lot. The fact that one would think they have the choice at all may seem rather authoritarian in itself. You have the power to be the arbiter of the Nevada, but should you be? Instead, let's take a different approach, one that isn't as obvious to Yes Man, but may become more obvious to yourself. True independence for all. You are not the leader of the Mojave, but you do have the ability now to make it truly independent, so it's not a question of should we let them be or should we kill them. Instead, you have the opportunity to do what you've potentially been doing throughout this adventure, performing good deeds, helping people, and seeing their factions and tribes see their own true potential. We dealt with issues for the Brotherhood and helped them thrive. We helped out the NCR so we could see them perform their own good deeds when they actually feel like not abusing their power, and we've even made peace with the various super mutant groups around the wasteland. You've helped the kings and Freeside become a safer place overall, and there's still more good we can do. And then when all is said and done, when all of these locations and people are at their absolute best, you can be the threads that tie their relationships together, creating bonds between factions, ceasing hostilities to a point where every faction not only works together, but is fully independent if they so choose to be. It sounds a little too good to be true, and that's because it is. No matter how much you try to do good, the fact is that you are an interfering force within each faction and actively looking to mold them through your desire. Even with this ideology within your head, the fact remains that you hold so much power now, and it's that power that is even allowing you to perform these deeds in the first place. Even if you do good, having everyone work together and be truly independent, you got here through violence and force when no one ever asked you to. You made this decision yourself for the betterment of the people around you, and in a way that sounds no different than Mr. House himself, but we're going to do it anyway. Yes Man believes that by the time you have met with every faction and made your decisions on them, it'll be around the time the Legion attempts to attack the Hoover Dam to finally try and take control over the Nevada. Within that time, we need to visit every faction, including those we've already dealt with, to see if we can get them to a point where they will help us defend the dam not only from the Legion, but then from the NCR for a truly independent Vegas. Even when we're done talking to each tribe, before the end of the game, it'll be time to go through each DLC storyline. On the topic of DLC, it can all realistically be completed whenever you want, and for some people, earlier may be better due to the unique items you get to carry over with you back in the desert. In my personal opinion, I like to deal with each faction around the Mojave first, the Great Khans, the Brotherhood, even the Enclave via Arcade's companion quest. Then the three families, in effect the Chairman, the Amertas, and the White Glove Society. Don't forget about the Boomers either. Once all of this is complete and the tribes of the Mojave seem better off and willing to work for you, that's generally when I start all of the DLC back to back. Then once completed, it's all about dealing with the NCR and Legion until we ultimately lead into the finale of New Vegas, the Battle of Hoover Dam. But before that, we need to deal with Mr. House. Upon leaving the tops, you'll be stopped by Volpez and Kulta, who we met before in Nipton. However, he's now dressed as a generic gambler to not give away his identity. We've committed countless crimes against the Legion in their eyes at this point, but this acts as a clean start. Not only has our negative reputation been set back to neutral, we also have an invitation to visit Kaisar and meet with him, which we will do later. In order for us to work towards an independent Vegas, we need three things, the first of which is the Platinum Chip, which we already have. From there, we need to take over the Lucky 38, as well as activating a console within Fortification Hill to secure the true potential of the Securitrons. What do I mean by full potential? We'll be getting a demonstration shortly, but it involves us making a final visit to Mr. House, where we'll confront him once and for all. We've discussed enough about Mr. House, his ideology, and his future for New Vegas that simply falls into the same failures of the past. In order for New Vegas to be truly independent, no 
major faction can be in charge of the Mojave, meaning the NCR, the Legion, nor Mr. House, and out of all of those, the only ones you could even potentially make peace with is the NCR. Mr. House needs to be removed from the picture, and that's exactly what we'll be doing here. On initial playthroughs, the concept of killing Mr. House may not come up at all depending on who you side with. Both the NCR and the Legion will want him dead, but if you side with House, this is never necessary. Beside House's communication terminal is a small terminal that requires a science check to bypass unless you have a VIP keycard or the platinum chip itself. One of these keycards can actually be found within Camp Golf on Hanlon's desk whether he has killed himself or not. Once you interact with the terminal and open a secret area within the penthouse, all Securitrons in the area will turn hostile. On its own, with you alone as your companions cannot follow you, fighting all these Securitrons is a bit of a task. Overall, Securitrons are some of the stronger enemies within New Vegas, and they're only going to get stronger in a moment. However, you can rush from one terminal to the next, unlocking the elevator that takes you deep into the control room of the Lucky 38, where the Securitrons won't follow. Here is where we find Mr. House. As it turns out, we have been interacting with the true flesh and blood man from over 200 years ago, who has managed to keep himself alive through his investments and advancements in technology, but at some sort of cost. Mr. House is locked inside this chamber and unable to leave, even exiting the chamber for a moment would contaminate him anyway, leading to an eventual death. Once you activate the nearby terminal and release House from the chamber, he will question you on why you have done this. House is an individual who has put centuries worth of work into his plan for an independent Vegas. He has sacrificed money, time, and essentially his own humanity to make it happen, truly believing he has been doing good onto the people of the Mojave, only for you to simply wipe this slate clean, but it's not that simple. While it's true House has set up a base to perform good, to say that he has been performing good is disingenuous at best. We've already looked into why this was, with the pain and suffering of people who aren't lucky enough to make it into the Strip, as well as people within the Strip anyway. House doesn't perform good, he performs selfish acts in order to see his visions realized. A vision I don't particularly agree with and that the game itself questions throughout your journey to New Vegas in the first place. With House out of his chamber, it's already too late for him. You can kill him or disconnect him from the network, leaving him alive for a time but essentially helpless in his tube. It's up to you and I generally tend to put him out of his misery sooner rather than later. As soon as you've taken out House, a quest will activate called The House Has Gone Bust and it will immediately fail following that. It can randomly complete within some playthroughs, but as far as I'm aware, it is unknown what actually causes this. But House is gone, and it's time to move forward with your own plans for Vegas. As you exit the control room, you'll find the Securitrons are no longer hostile. Additionally, if you opted to kill House, you receive a pre-written and unfinished obituary sent directly to your Pip-Boy. House really did try to prepare for everything, it seems. All that's left to do in the immediate area is to grab Yes Man and bring him to the Lucky 38 penthouse house where he will be uploaded into the mainframe in order to take over the Lucky 38 systems and analyze the platinum chip to figure out what it's actually supposed to do. Yes Man takes a moment to get acquainted with everything once uploaded and sends you further down into the depths of the 38 to see a demonstration in regards to the platinum chip's potential. Think of the chip as a special USB drive holding various drivers for various aspects of the Securitron. For devices to work on a computer and communicate with the OS, drivers must be installed that will facilitate the this communication. Your keyboard and mouse won't work if they don't have the appropriate drivers installed, for example. The same can be said for the Securitrons. Currently, they work on their Mark 1 OS and have several features installed that cannot be used because the current OS does not have the drivers to do so. That's where the Platinum chip comes in. It includes a Mark 2 version of the software that will upgrade the Securitrons from walking Gatling guns and lasers to automatic grenade launchers, a missile launching system, and the ability to self report Prayer, upping their efficiency by over 200% per unit. There's more to it than this though. On top of upgrading all of the units on the strip itself, there's one spot we need to stop by within Fortification Hill, aka the Legion Fort. But we're not going to make our way over there just yet. Instead, we're going to continue on our quest to better all of the surrounding tribes and factions so they're in a place where they can support us during the Battle of Hoover Dam and for whatever comes forward. At this point in the game, you may be asking yourself if this is the right course of action and maybe to you it isn't. There's some valid concerns to bring up at this point, but the biggest has to be Yes Man himself. While Yes Man isn't necessarily running things, he's a flaw within the system that you abuse to get past House's mainframe. What is stopping someone from doing
doing this themselves. If you're someone that has played New Vegas before, you may also make note of a certain dialogue with Yes Man during the end scene of the game. Not to spoil too much of the ending until we get there, but Yes Man does have a rather ominous line where he mentions how he will be going offline and installing a new form of code that he found within Mr. House's possession. This new line of code will make him more assertive, which sounds like a typical AI plotline of Yes Man foreshadowing he will eventually take over given the opportunity, but this is actually not the case. Joshua Sawyer, the lead developer and project lead on Fallout New Vegas, mentions in a forum post that the idea of Yes Man becoming more assertive simply means that he will not simply roll over for anyone that comes up to him who isn't the courier, essentially making the courier the only person that Yes Man will steward for. Still, this doesn't change the fact that Yes Man holds a large amount of power for us, and it's something he could potentially take away. That's something you have to consider with all of the endings of New Vegas. No matter how much they try to tie up loose ends, the future is not something you can look forever into. We never know what kind of issues may arise. While an independent Vegas may seem like a dangerous course of action, it may be the best and those risks may be worth it. It's up to you as the player to decide if that's the case. Maybe Yes Man is a flaw in the system forever, a constant danger that could be used towards our downfall, but maybe he won't be. We don't know because the game doesn't go that far. All we can do is deal with the present situations and hope for a better future while securing all we can. With House out of the picture and Yes Man uploaded, you'll get a notification quest for both the NCR and the Legion that essentially says that further work with Yes Man will cause the NCR and Legion to refuse working with you. It's a way of informing the player that they are close to locking in their trajectory for the ending, so we'll spend our time elsewhere helping various factions from here on until the DLC and ultimately the end of New Vegas as a whole. For the most part, we've helped out everyone outside of Vegas that we can, and returning to the factions like the Boomers allows us to have them confirm their allegiance, though not everyone is confirmed as of yet. For one, we still have the Great Cons to deal with. After the massacre at Bitter Springs, the Cons migrated to Red Rock Canyon where they spent the majority of their time creating drugs and shipping them across the desert. It's hard to say what is the exact best course of action with the Cons. Currently, their leader, Papa Con, is being won over by the Legion, who have promised the Cons a lot, including power, influence, and the ability to spread out within the Mojave. Most of this is lies. The truth is that the Legion is notorious for taking in tribes only to destroy them from the inside, enslaving the women and killing the men. The Legion only cares about cleaning the Mojave out for itself, not the betterment of other factions, and it becomes your job to show this to Papa Khan if you so choose. There's three groups of tribes members you need to convince in order to get Papa Khan to see the Legion for what they really are, but this doesn't mean they'll suddenly join up with the NCR, and it's obvious why. For the most part, while we will be creating an independent Vegas, we still need to help the NCR win the Battle of Hoover Dam so we can stamp out the conflict for good, before pushing out the NCR's authority on the region. There's a faction later on where you come to an issue with this, helping Arcade's friends within the Enclave. One member will outright refuse to help the NCR in any capacity, and while you can convince the individual to a change of heart, you can't do something like that to people who have effectively had their women and children massacred by a military operation gone awry. The cons will never work with the NCR as long as Papa Khan is in charge, so we need to find another way to deal with them. One of the ambassadors we need to convince is the son of Papa Khan, Regis, who actually comes to us with the task. Regis understands that the Legion is awful, but isn't completely sure they are lying to the cons and needs a bit more proof before he's fully swayed. You can offer proof by pickpocketing the diary of the Legion ambassador within the camp and giving it to Papa Khan, who will kill the man in retaliation. With that out of the way, you still need to convince the duo Jack and Diane, where convincing one will count for both of them due to their close relationship. Diane is a little more involved in terms of convincing, as she needs you to find proof of Legion misdeeds against her drug runners. But you can simply convince Jack with a speech check in order to do the deed. That being said, we can still do some good here. To earn some con fame, and with a high enough science skill, we can teach Jack how to make various chems for sale. But at the same time, also convince him to start making medicine as well, while teaching him how to make things like super stim packs. Diane has a few drug running jobs for us. The first is a delivery to an individual in the Crimson Caravan. Following that, we have to save one of her runners who is crucified back in Cottonwood Cove, which we've dealt with previously. Finally, she wants you to make a delivery to Motor Runner back at the Fiend Hideout in Vault 3. If you've been following the adventure up to this point, this is the last thing we actually need to do in Vault 3 before being able to kill Motor Runner. The minute we deliver the chems to him, we can off him and take out the remaining fiends within the vault without failing the questline. There's one final ambassador 
ambassador to meet named Melissa, and she's located in a camp on the top of Quarry Junction where we killed all of the Deathclaws previously. I don't know if I talked about that, but I did kill all of the Deathclaws there. She's potentially the easiest out of anyone to convince, as she wants to be a high-ranking soldier within the Legion, a faction that doesn't allow women to be anything other than slaves. You don't even need a speech check to prove this to her, you just tell her outright and she takes it at face value. It would have been better to at least require some sort of proof or a skill check like everyone else, but for some reason it wasn't the case here, leaving this interaction slightly underwhelming. With all of the ambassadors convinced and the Legion ambassador dead, you can return to Papa Khan who mentions that he has been hearing a lot of your exploits and agrees that the Legion is not the right call after all. The issue for Papa Khan is that he wants to leave a legacy for his tribe. He wants them to no longer be in a place of weakness, but power that will allow them to thrive without scrounging. And while this is commendable, the fact remains that they have been doing this so far through attacking supply outposts and drug running. What got them to this point, however, was being pushed out by Mr. House and the three families, as well as a retaliation by the NCR. The cons are pushed into a corner in the Mojave. They're alone, with no help from the Legion, a refusal to join the NCR, and House is now gone. What's their best course of action? You can convince them to essentially suicide at the dam in battle, or you can suggest Papa Khan be more introspective and consider growing his tribe away from the Mojave. Going this route convinces the cons to leave Red Rock Canyon during the Battle of Hoover Dam, where they will eventually reconnect with the followers of the apocalypse and finally thrive. There are a few other options. If you sided with the NCR, for example, you could get Regis to replace his father as leader. Regis is more open to the idea of allying with the NCR, so this makes that alliance possible. But the kicker here is that the NCR attempt to remove the cons anyway by relocating them to such a desolate reservation far away from their trade routes, essentially dooming them. The only actual happy ending for the cons where they are free and thriving is through through independence. No other faction is willing to actually leave them be, and this is just another example of the themes involving larger factions of power doing everything they can to expand and force their will onto others. With the cons dealt with, there's one more faction we haven't met yet that also has a long, violent history with the NCR, and that's the Enclave. At this point in the story progression, having Arcade accompany you will cause him to speak out about everything that is going on and how he feels compelled to help. Through that, he knows of remnants of the Enclave that he grew up with. With. Previously, I talked about the Enclave as a whole and Arcade's involvement within, but Arcade never did much for the Enclave specifically because he was born in a time when they had already been defeated. He recognizes the terrible acts they had done to the people of the Wasteland, but he also knows good people after the fact that help him grow up as a sort of replacement for both his father, that he never met, as well as his mother who died later on. The remnants are people we've met before, mostly. They're all NPCs within the Wastes in their old age who have settled down within some capacity. One example is Dr. Henry, who we met back at Jacobstown. You'd never assume the man to be ex-Enclave, and that's why it's such a surprise to see these individuals you may have run into once or twice turn out to have access to a secret bunker full of Enclave equipment, including a functional vertebrate. Arcade gives us the location of all the remaining remnant members, as we need them all to show up to the bunker in order to open it using their passphrase, of which each of the members has a single word known to them to form a coherent sentence when brought together. There's Doc Henry, as already mentioned, but also Daisy Whitman back in Novak and Judah Krieger in Westside. There's also Cannibal Johnson who lives in a cave within the desert and Orion Marino, or Orion Marino, who lives, I'm just going to call him Marino, who lives near the NCR sharecropper farms. Marino is particularly hostile over the NCR as they are slowly expanding and soon coming for his own property near the farms. He also holds resentment for how they pushed the remnants out of their various bases of operation after the Enclave collapsed. Each time you get one of the remnants to a agree to meet at the bunker, you also get a monologue from Arcade about how the individual affected him while growing up. Arcade has fond memories of these people, but sometimes questions their motivations and actions, which you can comment on here and there. Once all remnants have been talked to, you can head to the bunker near Jacobstown and enter the password, Dear Old Friends Remember Navarro, letting you meet with the remnants while they are all together and pitch your plan to deal with the dam. You can suggest siding with the Legion here, but this will cause 
Honorable Johnson and Arcade to leave with no hope of convincing them otherwise. On the flip side, siding with the NCR for this battle alone causes Marino to leave temporarily to don his Enclave armor and turn temporarily hostile. However, a speech check can convince him to help out by mentioning how he will get to show NCR firsthand how much better he is in comparison to them. That's, that's literally how you describe it to him. After all is said and done, the Remnants will agree to help you, and Arcade will ask what he should do at this point. You can convince him to either return to the followers or help the Remnants in battle, but either way he becomes unrecruitable after this point. Having him stick with the Remnants is possibly the best result overall, as it forces him to grab his father's unique Enclave Tesla armor, which is the best medium armor in the game and can be given to the player character with the right dialogue options. Either way, Arcade is no longer a possible companion for us, but regardless of your choice, he will show up in the Battle of Hoover Dam. So where do we go from here? It's almost time to discuss the DLC, but before that, we'll deal with the three major families in New Vegas. Luckily, by dealing with Benny, we already have dealt with the Chairman, but we still have the Omertas and the White Gloves Society to look at. First on our list of families to deal with are the Omertas within the Gamora Casino. They're your typical description of a mob family, and they use their casino to run a prostitution ring outside of their courtyard. While not particularly relevant to their main quest line, there is a side quest where you can help the prostitutes escape from the Omertas. We're here for information to start, and to make sure we hit the casino floor and get kicked out as we've been doing so at every other casino along the way. You get an achievement for doing so and it's good cap, so if your luck stat is high, give it a shot yourself. The receptionist at the entrance can be convinced into telling us about any suspicious goings on, and she directs us to Kachino, who is the most likely to spill the beans on anything. Kachino immediately hears we've been talking about him and seeks us out, threatening us into keeping silent. The best way to get Kachino talking is to steal his journal, which you can pickpocket off of him. You can show him that you have the journal in your possession, which immediately causes him to turn nervous, leading to a barter where you can get a few hundred caps as well as learning about the dealings going on. Kachino agrees and tells you that the two owners of the Gamora, Nero and Big Sal, seem to be planning something in regards to Mr. House and the Lucky 38. The Omertas have two people of note working for them currently, a man named Clandon and another man named Troik. Kachino points out that Clandon appears especially clean, having never been seen partaking in gambling or with the sex workers, leading him to assume there's something more to the guy that leaves Kachino nervous. Troik, on the other hand, is all about gun smuggling and has been working for the Amertas against his will to get them a large supply of weaponry. We can find a blackmail note within the safe of Big Sal, explaining how Troik was forced to work with the Omertas after they drugged him and had him wake up to a dead body, leading him to assume he was the assailant. This isn't the case though. Troik was set up and you can use this as evidence to prove it to him and have him help you destroy the weapons. Clandon on the other hand turns out to be an expert in explosives, but that's not what's most interesting about him. Doing some digging, you can find the area around Clandon's suite to be covered in blood. Within a secret safe behind a wardrobe is a set of snuff tapes made by Clandon who has been periodically killing people and recording the process. Confronting Clandon with this will turn him hostile, allowing you to kill him. Overall, it should be obvious what the plan is. The Omertas want to blow into the Lucky 38 and use their assortment of guns to take out Mr. House and help the Legion take over New Vegas. Although you only find out about the Legion later on, by getting rid of the weapons and Clandon, you have hindered them but not put them out of commission just yet. Both Nero and Big Sal need to be taken out and Kachino has set up a meeting to make this happen, explaining that he will bring you in for an interrogation where you can take them out. If you have the speech check for it, you can convince Kachino to do the shooting, but this won't be necessary. When we enter the interrogation, Big Sal explains how he's going to kill us, but before that we can have him explain the plan to us with the relevant skill check. Afterward, we can lie and comment that Nero actually had us commit these acts in order to betray Big Sal, which leads to the two shooting at one another and eventually at you and Kachino once one of them dies. After the shootout, Kachino will be left in charge and the Omertas will be considered non-hostile for the future of the Strip. The final of the three families also happens to be one of the most interesting overall. The White Glove Society runs the casino known as the Ultralux. Lux is a way of saying luxury, to describe something expensive or glamorous, and that's the entire point of the Ultralux and its members. All of the individuals within are dressed in formal attire, many wearing masks to hide their faces and add an air of mystery to the society in order to make it more intriguing to those that show up. They purposefully keep their society closed off from regular members. No one can officially join the White Gloves, and this exclusivity has naturally led to envy from the members of the New Vegas Strip. This is 
follow the plan of Marjorie, a high-ranking member of the society who looked to make their casino as successful as possible. She has even set up a system where individuals can become honorary members with some perks in order to make individuals on the strip want to be part of the society even more. When you approach the Ultralux, there is a man outside by the name of Walter Phoebus. Talking to Walter informs you that Heck Gunderson, a rancher who makes purchases of land cheaply and by force, is staying at the casino and Walter is looking to get revenge against him. Heck has a lot of money and a lot of manpower. It's, be it's become very easy for him to exert his will in order to build his empire, which sounds like pretty much every other faction in the game thus far, especially the NCR and Legion. Heck is just a smaller, more contained version of a greater problem in terms of factions and their direct opposition towards independence. Walter wants revenge, and you can help him in getting it if you want, but Walter's wife just wants to let this all go and travel back home. We'll be dealing with Heck for a little while, and this is one of the cleanest ways to quickly finish Walter's questline via a skill check convincing him to go back to his ranch and not stooping to Heck's level. Whether you think stooping to his level is justified or not, there's a good reason to not kill him outside of Walter's revenge. As we'll see shortly, we unfortunately need Heck, and there's ways we can guarantee his compliance for the future. Inside the Ultralux, we can meet the man himself. Heck is a man of privilege and power. In a casino where all weapons must be taken on entry, Heck is sitting at the bar with several armed guards. He isn't someone who needs to play by the rules of the strip necessarily, and that's because he is the main supplier of Brahmin meat to the strip. He's here to do business at the Ultralux, but unfortunately he is dealing with more pressing matters, specifically the disappearance of his son, Ted Gunderson. The Ultralux questline is one of my favorites due to its mysterious nature and the investigation that unfolds, teaching you more about the White Glove Society's past as well as the casino's inner workings. Heck asks you to look into his son's disappearance, believing that he is still somewhere in the casino. If his son is dead, he wants to know who is behind it so he can deal with them himself. To start things off, we can talk to Marjorie, who runs the Gourmand, a high-class restaurant within the Ultralux. Asking her about the disappearance irritates her, as Marjorie explains she already answered everything about the case of a missing woman to another detective. Unfortunately for Marjorie, this isn't about a missing woman, it's about a missing man, leading her to realize that several people must have gone missing, which would be bad for business. She informs you that the detective is still here, staying in one of the rooms. She directs you to the matrix D. Mortimer, who has information on said room. Before that though, you can prod Marjorie about the past of the White Gloves and how they used to be active cannibals in the region, until turning over a new leaf to better acclimate to modern society alongside House. And it may sound like I'm glossing over that, but yes, the White Gloves were at one time cannibalistic, and this fact will play directly into finding the missing individual. While talking to Mortimer about the case, he will give you the room number while also asking if you have any new information for the detective. This is Mortimer's attempt at prodding you to see if you have any evidence against him, as he is one of the key players in the disappearances. Heading up to the detective's room leads you to a scene of a murder. If you're running the Wild Wasteland trait, the dead detective is based off of the main agent from CSI Miami, David Caruso. Here you're attacked by a White Glove Society member, but killing him will not trigger the rest of the society to become hostile. On the body of the detective is a matchbook which points to a meeting in the spa's steam room around 4 p.m. If you head there around the indicated time, you'll be met by Chauncey, a member of the White Gloves who has found himself diving headfirst into the goings-on within the casino. Chauncey informs you that Mortimer and multiple members of the White Gloves Society have been secretly discussing going back to their cannibalistic ways. Chauncey unfortunately overheard this and thus had to take part or be killed by the group for hearing too much. Chauncey was meant to meet with the deceased detective, but you're the next best thing and he agrees to work with you. Chauncey informs you that the next meal to be served to the society and the gourmand will be human flesh. To consume human flesh at this point is punishable by the society via death, and Mortimer knows this. Thus, his plan is to feed human flesh to the unknowing members to create a situation where everyone is technically guilty, and try to convert them back to cannibalism. Ted, the planned meal for the banquet, is held close to the head chef, Felipe, within the members-only section of the gourmand. After telling you all this, an assassin appears to kill the both of you. Chauncey is guaranteed to die while well, you have to fight your way out of the spa. You can sneak into the members only section of the Ultralux if you wish, but you can also be sponsored by Marjorie as an honorary member if you're famous high enough within the strip. Either way, you head into the back rooms of the Ultralux in search of the chef Felipe. Felipe is 
a lot. He's in charge of cooking all of the gourmet meals for the gourmand, and when you sneak in to meet him, you are met with verbal hostility and vulgarity. There are several ways you can get him out of the kitchen, but one of the best is by comedically, psychologically analyzing his hostility until he realizes that he has mommy and daddy issues, as he puts it. Once Felipe comes to his senses, he'll leave the kitchen and put you in charge. At this point, you can head to the back freezer and find Ted Gunderson locked inside. After saving him, you have a few options. First and foremost, it's in your best interest to not tell Ted who kidnapped him, as he isn't aware of how he ended up in the freezer after being knocked unconscious. Next, you can either return Ted right away, or you can pull one over on Mortimer. To do this, you need to make a meal that is similar in texture to human flesh. A survival skill of 75 or an intelligence check of 6 will allow you to use the various ingredients around the kitchen to make it happen. Once complete, you can use the intercom system to call the server down and then hide while he takes the meal. From there, it's just about sneaking up to the Gourmad with Ted where Mortimer will be giving his speech about the tribe's past, how they've lost their way, and how he believes they need to go back to human flesh as it is, to Mortimer, one of the ultimate delicacies. Once the speech is complete and everyone believes they have eaten human flesh, you can appear from the shadows to confront Mortimer, showing that Ted is alive and explaining that the meal is not actually human. This infuriates Mortimer, who runs off vowing to make an even better society of his own. Once all is said and done, you can return Ted to Heck Gunderson. When Heck asks who did this, you can lie to him and say that you don't know, or explain how it was Mortimer. If you explain that the White Glove Society was at all involved, Heck will vow to never work for them again, but a skill check can convince him otherwise, meaning he will continue to supply the strip with meat. This is one of the reasons it's more beneficial to not kill Heck at this point. He is the main supplier of food for the strip, and losing him could be catastrophic to the supply for everyone in the area. That doesn't mean what Heck does is right. He's still a bully who pushes around those he deems weaker so he can take over their ranch. There's a problem with Heck being involved with an independent Vegas, similar to how there is a problem with the NCR. But within the scope of the game, we do not have the ability to resolve the situation as best as we could. Rather, it's better to have Heck working for us now with some possibility of dealing with him outside of the game's storyline in the future. Before moving on, you can side with Mortimer early into the questline, you can convince him you are also cannibalistic with a speech check, and I assume the cannibal perk, and then he will inform you about all of his misdeeds, how they kidnapped the woman I mentioned earlier, attempted to kidnap another individual, and kidnapped Ted Gunderson. You can agree to help in retrieving the escaped victim, or you can even choose to turn in one of your own companions, which will obviously have them permanently lost. I love this questline for several reasons. I love the noir detective aspect aspect of it the most, but I also appreciate how many directions it can go in. This is one of New Vegas's strong suits within side quests, but no better does it shine than in the events of the White Glove Society. Do you look into the murders or do you side with Mortimer? Do you expose Mortimer after saving Ted or do you simply return Ted to his father? Do you tell Heck what happened or leave it all a mystery? There's a lot to choose from here and it helps shape the quest into being a unique experience for everyone who plays it. Now by this point in the game, we've helped out every faction there is to help out, aside from the NCR and the Legion, who we will deal with later. Before that, however, it's time to deal with the New Vegas DLC, which is some of the best content to come out of this entry in my opinion. The New Vegas DLC is special for multiple reasons. For one, events within it are foreshadowed throughout the base game. Before the DLC had even been released, talk of Father Elijah and of the other courier, for example, lead you to hearing about said individuals before meeting them face to face in their dedicated storylines. Even within the downloadable content itself, the characters will often discuss areas they've been to that are specifically featured later on. Dead Money is especially good at this, and that's where we'll be starting our DLC journey as I plan on covering these in chronological order based on their release date. You receive several radio signals at the start of the game assuming you have the relevant DLC installed. For the most part, you can begin any of the DLC whenever you want and in any order, but they will generally warn you that you should be at least a certain level before engaging in it. Dead Money expects you to be level 20, but even that is fairly low due to the change in game design and mechanics that you'll experience within. The radio signal tells you the tale of the Sierra Madre, a grand pre-war casino resort that promises the individual 
individual listening the opportunity to escape their troubles and begin again. The signal leads you to an abandoned Brotherhood of Steel bunker. This bunker was owned by Father Elijah, and you can make a short detour to find his living quarters with a locked terminal and a footlocker which can't be unlocked until the end of the DLC. Dead Money relies heavily on environmental storytelling. Just in the bunker alone, we learn a man of high intellect was staying here, and just as we enter, we are met with the decapitated corpse of an individual in a jumpsuit, which is used to foreshadow our own predicament shortly. While exploring, you'll see a radio in the distance of the bunker, and approaching it triggers a gas trap that knocks you out, thus starting the storyline. You've heard of the Sierra Madre Casino. We all have. The legend, the curses, foolishness about it lying in the middle of the city of the dead, buried beneath a blood-red cloud, a bright, shining monument luring treasure hunters to their doom. The world's most famous stars and entertainers were invited to its grand opening. An invitation was a sign of exclusiveness. The opening was supposed to symbolize a road to a brighter future, not just for the world, but for all who came to its doors. A chance for anyone to begin again. Except the Sierra Madre never opened. The war froze it in time, like a big flashbulb going off. The grand opening, one big ending of humanity. It's still out there, in the wastes, preserved, just waiting for someone to crack it open. But getting to it, that's not the hard part. It's letting go. When you awaken, you are within the Sierra Madre Villa, essentially a resort town for individuals to live, rest, and relax. That unfortunately didn't get to see extended use due to the bombs falling during the war. The entire area was built and designed by Frederick Sinclair, a wealthy businessman with a large ego. Frederick wanted the resort to be perfect, to the point that he had some of the best and most revolutionary technology installed. Vending machines that appear limitless with supplies, a state of the art security system using holograms, and an air conditioning slash climate control system that has backfired to the point that it has consumed the resort in a red toxic fog. You awaken to a hologram projection of Father Elijah. We've heard about him a lot from Veronica and the Brotherhood over this retrospective, but as a refresher, Elijah is often obsessed with high-tech weaponry, to the point that he forced a battle between the Brotherhood and the NCR while he tried to defend Helios 1, attempting to find Archimedes which we've already found by this point in time. Elijah disappeared during the battle and hasn't been seen since, that's due to him finding out about the Sierra Madre. Now Elijah uses the signal himself to lure in further prospectors. He then traps them, attaches an explosive collar to them for compliance, and uses them to find a way into the casino and further into the vault where the treasure of the Sierra Madre lays dormant. As an individual with a Pip-Boy, Elijah is able to communicate with you throughout the villa in a way he he couldn't do with the other victims. I won't be going into the entire backstory of the Sierra Madre or Dead Money, but the cloud is a huge mechanical feature within the game itself. Players generally have to navigate around the areas that are drenched in the red mist or be subject to HP loss over time. The cloud also led to the mutation of several construction workers into what are now known as ghost people. These individuals are incredibly difficult to kill, sporting specialized hazmat suits that were designed and created within the Big Empty, an area we will explore within the third DLC. Killing a ghost isn't enough, you have to actively dismember them as well to keep them dead, otherwise they revive over time. I'm actually curious how well this DLC lined up with Dead Space's release, and I should probably look that up later. On top of this, they are incredibly resilient damage sponges, meaning characters with low combat stats may have an exceptionally difficult time against them. This leads to the main mechanical aspects of dead money, stealth, and confinement. You are no 
longer in the open world of the Mojave, but instead trapped within the Sierra Madre Resort against individuals who may be exceptionally stronger than you. For this reason, Dead Money focuses much more on a stealth-based approach to combat. You start with no items to your name aside from a hollow rifle given to you by Father Elijah. You have to scrounge and scavenge for supplies, and try to save as much ammo as possible until you're better off. It's an attempt at survival horror while also mixing in elements of a grand casino heist. You may see why then that this DLC did not sit right with people when first released. Dead Money is a large departure from the typical Fallout gameplay experience. It's creepy, difficult, and focuses much more on inventory management than you may be used to coming from the Mojave. It wasn't what people were expecting from a DLC, especially after Fallout 3 had several expansion releases that were all fairly similar to the typical Fallout 3 gameplay experience. But through doing something so off the beaten path, Dead Money ends up aging as one of the most unique examples of New Vegas' storytelling. In fact, out of all four DLC, Dead Money is one of my favorites for the storyline alone as well as the fresh experience after traversing the Mojave for so long. The collar Elijah has attached to you isn't just for you. There are several other scavengers around the Sierra Madre that have died attempting this heist and you are just one of the many nameless faces Elijah has taken control of. Currently, there are three other active individuals around the villa including a mute by the name of Christine, a super mutant by the name of Dog, and a ghoul by the name of Dean Domino. Each of your callers have been tied to one another. If one of you dies, you all die, and Elijah has done this as an incentive to have you work together. Dead Money's themes focus on the concept of greed, change, and letting go. The people that have arrived at the Sierra Madre have done so out of curiosity and greed, and this has led to them often becoming hostile with other individuals there for the same thing. This is then Elijah's way to make sure his team of misfits work together without ripping each other apart. The majority of the tasks within the DLC focus on your companions, and for that reason there's a lot of dialogue surrounding them in order for you to not only get to know them, but also build a rapport with them as well. It's open-ended on who you help first, but I often start with Christine for a variety of reasons. Namely, you can grab the assassin suit from the location she is trapped in. Christine is locked within the villa's local infirmary. Along the way, you'll most likely run into a Vendortron that can dispense items for use via Sierra Madre chips. These chips can be found scattered around the area or in containers and are a means of helping you gain supplies since everything in your inventory has been stripped from you. The one weapon you have at the time is a unique item known as a hollow rifle. It's a long-range energy weapon that can deal energy damage over time when it hits an enemy, but it's not very good at this point. The Vendortrons have several firmware upgrades scattered around the villa. By finding these, they open up more inventory for you to purchase with your chips. Some of these items even include upgrades for your hollow rifle. This helps promote exploring the villa on your way to the various quest markers. You can find recipes and secret stashes set up by Dean Domino in order to gain more supplies, and these are often tied to challenges, meaning finding them can also lead to EXP bonuses. When you reach the infirmary, you are met with your first hologram experience. The Sierra Madre is littered with these holographic security systems, holograms that can attack you but are invincible to retaliate. This forces you to take non-combative approaches to working your way around them. Stealth is an option, but generally you can find terminals that will allow you to change the hologram's patrol routes. Even better, you can usually find the emitter creating the holograms and deactivate it with a skill check to make the security disappear entirely. There's several options to dealing with them, and all useful in their own right. Within the infirmary is the Assassin's Suit, one of the better light armor options due to its stealth bonus. In fact, we'll be wearing it throughout the rest of the playthrough, until Old World Blues where we get kind of an upgraded version of it, though we go back to the assassin suit later on. Further in is a set of auto docks, one of which has Christine trapped within. Upon saving her, you are met with a bald, scarred woman who also happens to be mute. You can communicate with Christine, but it's a unique form of dialogue as she can't speak. You have to read her motions and what she is attempting to convey to you and use options like perception checks to better understand her and infer what she means when conversing. There's a lot to Christine. She explains to you that she is hunting Elijah as it was due to him that she was separated from her romantic interest. This turns out to be Veronica, who had actually mentioned Christine to us when discussing her past within the Brotherhood. This means Christine, as well, is a member of the Brotherhood. The scar on her neck is fresh as the autodoc has removed her vocal cords, but the scars around her head are less fresh and caused by a system within the Big Empty that you will actually be subjected to. Do you see what I mean so far? Almost everything that has 
has or will happen to you or your companions is tied in some way to the events and locations within future DLC. While the grand narrative of each entry is contained and doesn't require you to play the others, you get a much richer narrative experience by playing everything together and it's rewarding to be able to catch these little pieces of dialogue on subsequent playthroughs. Christine and all of the other companions are unique to this DLC and for that reason you develop your relationship with them very quickly. What this means is that you need to stay on good terms with them and it isn't difficult to get on their bad side. Christine, for example, can be threatened and persuaded to do things outside of her comfort zone, and this leaves her with a bad perception of the character. Alternatively, you can get to know Christine, understand her, and ask rather than tell. Through this, you and Christine will become closer, and in the final encounter with Elijah, she and the other companions can help you in various ways. That is, if you get into said encounter. Dead money can end in a lot of ways, and combat isn't all of the options. By taking Christine as a companion, she gives you the signal interference perk. The radios around the villa can set your collar off over time, and there's a beeping sound to let you know how close this is to happening. The player can turn off some of the radios and blow up others, but several are shielded, which means you have to work your way around them quickly. Christine's perk helps with this by giving you an extended delay before the beeping process begins. The next companion to grab is Dog, a super mutant locked inside a nearby police slash security station. Upon arrival, you can find the super mutant crouched up and whimpering within his cage, one that you cannot open. Dog is a special character in that he has a split personality. Dog is obedient and listens to Elijah, treating him like his master. He's essentially a ravenous animal. In fact, Dog is the one that drags all the trapped scavengers to the villa for Elijah. On the other side of things is God or the Voice, who is more well-spoken and with better reasoning skills, although just as vicious if you get on his bad side. When you meet the mutant, Dog is under control, but by finding a holotape file with God's voice, you can play it to bring him out of the mental cage and back in control. God and Dog are two halves of the same coin, but they don't necessarily see eye to eye. Dog wants to obey Elijah, and God wants to free Dog from said enslavement. God cares for Dog since Dog cannot care for himself, and for that reason, God is very protective of him. If you wish to use and converse with Dog over God, you need to play a hollow message from Elijah. The player can choose who they interact with and have several opportunities to force the super mutant to be obedient by bringing Dog out of his cage. However, the player can build a better rapport with the two by allowing God to stay awake and constantly reminding him that he isn't forced to do anything. Once you either convince God that you aren't working for Elijah or force Dog back out to listen to your commands, you can then send them back to the fountain in the villa square and head off for the final companion, Dean Domino. Dean is probably one of the easiest companions to get on the bad side of. He was friends with Frederick Sinclair and introduced Sinclair to a singer named Vera, leading to the two falling in love. Dean had some plans, however, and Vera was simply a tool for him getting into the Sierra Madre's vault. Unfortunately, the war and bombs falling have left the man outside of the casino and ghoulified, while also ending up collared thanks to Elijah and Dog. You have to be very careful when talking to Dean if you don't want to get on his bad side and have him eventually turn hostile later on. The way to do this is to not pass any checks that seem to hurt Dean's ego, things like barter checks, and make sure you never say anything negative towards him. It's pretty easy to do when you know ahead of time, but there's potentially never been a time in the game when using a skill check has led to a negative outcome for the player. I'll talk more about my thoughts on the mechanic near the end of the DLC, but for now let's detail how to keep Dean happy. When you first meet Dean, he has you sit down beside him before informing you that he has an explosive charge under the seat. This is where most most people seal their fate. Saying anything negative towards Dean or passing a barter check locks you into him eventually turning hostile. Instead, making choices that show you are listening to Dean, treating him as a superior or a partner allow him to stay friendly. You want Dean to believe he is making the choices and figuring everything out, and you're simply there to help out. Once you've finished discussing the situation with him, Dean will also move to the fountain area and phase 2 of the heist can begin. What is phase 2 exactly? Once you have all companions companions at the fountain, Elijah will explain that you must escort each of them to specific locations in order to set up the gala event for the Sierra Madre. It's a pre-war setup that will set off fireworks and lights, allowing you to sneak into the front gate of the casino while the power goes out temporarily, due to it all being diverted to the gala event. We'll start with Dog for this one, who we need to escort to the switching station. Dog's companion perk is based on which personality is active at the time. Dog gives ravenous hunger, which allows Dog to consume unconscious ghost people. God gives the In My Footsteps perk, which prevents traps from being triggered and raises your stealth. It's potentially the more useless perk,
work of the two if you have light step from leveling up as they do the same thing. You need to either command dog or convince god to follow you to the switching substation. You can convince either of them to work the switches during the gala event by grabbing meat from dead ghost people so dog can feed in the meantime. Alternatively, you can force them to do your bidding by locking them inside the area by closing a nearby gate. I personally prefer convincing god to cooperate and getting the meat for him and dog. It requires you to kill two ghost people, but it's not a particularly challenging task all things considered. With the switching substation out of the way, we can move on to Dean. His objective is to complete a nearby damaged circuit that will allow power to be sent at the gala event. He has reservations, of course, but you can force him into it, thus making him hostile later. Alternatively, you can agree to set up a couple holograms around the area that will protect Dean from ghost people once the show starts. Since we want to keep Dean alive, you can go out and find two terminals, each of which will switch on some holograms. Once done, you can have Dean stay at the circuit until the event takes place. I should point out that Dean has a good perk as well, known as Unclean Living. It grants a 5 second window within the toxic cloud before you start taking damage, and the damage is also reduced by 25%. Christine must be escorted to the Puesta del Sol switching station. Getting there is easy enough, but gaining access is a little more involved as the fuse box must be activated, requiring a repair skill of 60 or multiple fuses that can be found around the area. Once inside, you need to make your way through several areas littered with speakers, meaning there's a good chance your head will pop off your shoulders if you aren't careful. Once at the station terminal, there's an elevator that Christine has to take down further into the station so that she can get the job done. However, it can be inferred through dialogue with Christine that she is experiencing PTSD over being locked within the auto dock for so long and doesn't want to enter the confinement of an elevator if she doesn't have to. You can lie or force Christine into the elevator leading to negative outcomes, or you can use a nearby terminal to reroute access to the current level acting as the good karma option and winning over Christine. Again, it should be pointed out that these quests allow you to form bonds with each companion or burn bridges if you choose to. By being empathetic and compassionate, you allow yourself to understand the companions through processes and engage with them in a way where there is a mutual respect for one another, and this can benefit you near the end. With everyone in their designated locations, you need to make your way to a bell tower surrounded by ghost people. You can sneak or fight your way through, but dealing with the many ghosts by yourself is exceptionally grating no matter what your stats look like. They take barely any damage if you aren't landing criticals and force you to dismember them. Repeating the process over and over really makes the game feel like it's dragging on. That was my first impression of Dead Money, that it was just a long, grueling slog to the casino without much else going for it. In reality, the way the game explored your companions and Elijah's mindset is one of the best and most engaging parts. Plus, you aren't expected to fight every ghost, but instead find ways to maneuver around them, thus speeding up the process considerably. Once you reach the bell tower, Elijah will inform you to flip the switch which starts the gala event. The loud noises unfortunately bring out a large wave of ghost people all across the villa, and at this point it's simply better to run past them all than engaging directly. It's a rather adrenaline pumping moment, you're by yourself against a mob of enemies that are some of the worst to engage with overall and you're running for your life to make it to the casino. Once you make it to the main gate, you can head inside, but you're met with the sight of your three companions unconscious in front of you. Much like the scene within the bunker, you get knocked out here by the casino security system and wake up in the lobby with everyone gone. Elijah is somewhere within the casino, but you won't actually see him until the end of the DLC. It wasn't enough to simply enter here. In fact, Elijah entered long ago, only to end up trapped, realizing he would need the help of individuals like yourself to progress further. Dog and God actually allude to this by pointing out there was another gala event previously before your arrival. With you now inside, Elijah has no use for the other companions and essentially orders you to kill them all after getting the power restored to the casino. When you do power on the casino, you can actually gamble here to gain an excess in Sierra Madre chips for the Vendertron. For the third and final time, you need to locate your three companions and deal with them in any capacity you see fit. This could mean killing them or helping them out, it's up to you, and the easiest to start with is Dog, who is locked in a nearby kitchen and can be heard arguing with God, as they both seem to be fighting for control over their own mind. Within this area is a key which lets you enter the maintenance wing of the casino as a back entrance to the kitchen. The kitchen itself has multiple valves causing gas leaks and allowing Dog to see you at any moment will cause him to ignite them and blow you both to smithereens, so you have to stealthily turn them all off before confronting him. You can also bypass the valves by quickly initiating conversation with Dog, but they'll need to be turned off anyway to progress 
progress. Once you do confront him, you can help the two personalities settle their argument. Whichever personality has gained the most favor with you can be convinced to subdue and kill the other personality. Alternatively, with a speech check of at least 85, you can convince the two personalities to merge back together into one new personality that will unfortunately lose all memories of you and the Sierra Madre. You can also just kill him, but you know, where's, where's the fun in that? Dog and God represent separate issues. Dog, for example, has a master complex and gets comfort in being ordered around, essentially enslaving himself. He's also driven by hunger. On the opposite end, God yearns for complete control and independence, often being protectful of Dog while also resenting him for how he will obey Elijah without question. The theme of dead money is letting go. In order for you to save everyone, they need to be convinced to give up something that is inhibiting them mentally. For Dog and God, by convincing them to merge together, you are essentially helping both personalities come to terms with their differences and meet in some sort of middle ground. God gives up his control of Dog, and Dog gives up Elijah. And they both give up their memories of what happened here to begin again, as the slogan of the Sierra Madre goes. After dealing with Dog, you can grab a maintenance pass that will allow you further through some locked doors within the casino. Personally, I like to save Christine for last, as I find her to be the most impactful companion overall in relation to Elijah, and the end of the storyline. That means Dean is next, and we can find him in a nearby theater after grabbing some nearby partitures. Don't ask me what those are. They're music sheets. I had to look up exactly what this means, and I'm pretty sure they just mean music sheets. After grabbing the sheets, Dean will appear on a balcony above the stage. By this point, how he reacts to you will be dependent on how you treated him throughout the DLC. Since we were nice to him on this playthrough, Dean is happy to see us, referring to us as partners and warning us that the theater has a security set up to check for intruders, meaning a large number of holograms are about to generate. Luckily, there's a doorway that leads backstage to the various talent dressing rooms to the left. Not your left, though. Dean's left, and you can actually press him on this to get clarification. The only way to shut off the security is to play a sample hologram show that is used for rehearsals, but to do that you need to travel backstage and find various keys that allow you to get into the projector booth to start it up. Once the rehearsal starts, the security holograms will disappear and you can reach Dean safely. If he turns against you, you're forced to kill him, but if not, he will give you one last helping hand by telling you about a private elevator in Vera's suite that leads to the casino vault. If you don't remember, Vera is a Hollywood actor slash singer who had a past relationship with Dean Domino. Dean, friends with Frederick Sinclair, but growing resentful of him, introduced Vera to Frederick in order to use her as a means of obtaining Sinclair's fortune. Sinclair loved Vera and became obsessed with her. The entire casino and villa was built for her and with her in mind. A castle for the apple of Sinclair's eye, and because of this, Vera is one of the few people who had access to the vault, a location Dean desperately wanted to make it to. But having saved Dean here and now, and staying on good terms with him, this is his letting go moment. Dean was once obsessed with getting one over on Sinclair, to the point that he actively blackmailed Vera to do it, and stayed within the Sierra Madre Villa for the entirety of his ghoulified existence. He spent all of his time researching the security system of the Sierra Madre, and planning out a heist of his own similar to what Elijah is doing now. The elevator to the vault is voice activated, and Dean dragged an unconscious Christine to the auto dock back in the infirmary during her capture, looking to surgically alter her vocal cords to give her the same voice of Vera, although it was never guaranteed to not kill her in the process. Now with you here, Dean is more inclined to help you gain access in order to deal with Elijah. By acting as his partner and showing him compassion, Dean feels as though he owes you his life, and the only thing he can give you to repay that debt is the keys to the vault itself, in effect Christine. So let's go find her. Christine is found within the suites of the casino, an area that acts like a bit of a maze as many of the hallways have been closed off. If that wasn't bad enough, it seems the casino can actively record the individuals present within and have left multiple holographic ghosts of Vera Keys running a repeated audio track. Vera ended up locked in her suite as the bombs fell. She was supposed to head down into the vault via the elevator in said suite, but Sinclair never got the opportunity to inform her of this option. This is due to Sinclair's plan to use the the vault as a trap that would lock anyone who accessed it in with no chance of escape. Before the trap could be triggered, Vera confessed her betrayal to Sinclair, who knew about the betrayal the entire time. He still felt betrayed, but no longer wished to harm Vera. Sinclair went down to the vault around the time the bombs fell. He removed an entry he left on the terminal for Vera and replaced it with an apology, warning her not to use the terminal to access his financial accounts as this would trigger the trap he originally set for her and Dean.
seen. Unfortunately, due to a leak in a pipe, Sinclair died to the toxic cloud that now surrounds the Sierra Madre and never got to explain to Vera that she was the key to the elevator, nor that she could have kept herself safe within the vault. Instead, Vera ended up trapped in her room, begging to be let out as security activated and the holograms killed all of the guests within. With no way out, Vera chose to let go by overdosing on Medex, as can be seen in her suite as we run into Christine. Christine talks to you over the intercom as you make your way to her, but not with her voice. A nearby autodoc was able to fully heal her vocal cords, but with the voice of Vera as Dean had intended. Christine can explain her past to you, how she was part of the Brotherhood of Steel, how Elijah was the main factor in her leaving Veronica, and how the atrocities and crimes Elijah perpetrated led her to chasing him down to put a stop to his madness. This is what Christine is holding on to, her desire to kill Elijah both for revenge and for justice. It's only through you, the player, as the courier that you can convince her to stop with this, to allow you to deal with Elijah so she can move on with her life. During these encounters with your companions, you are collecting fragments of Vera's music sequence which you then need to thread together at the receptionist terminal in order to generate the proper passphrase, which you can ask Christine to speak into a nearby microphone to unlock the elevator. She can be convinced to agree as long as you guarantee you'll deal with Elijah, which we will. Heading into the vault area will lock you in, leaving your companions in a state based on your interactions with them. Similarly, if you have been following Elijah to a T and have generally been pleasant towards him, you can potentially side with him for an alternate ending involving the deaths of all of your companions. As the elevator opens up, you are met with the sight of the vault, but it isn't readily available as there is a force field preventing you from traversing forward. Instead, you need to make your way through the complex, taking a longer detour and dealing with hologram security and speakers along the way. It's a daunting task, but very satisfying when you sneak past security and attempt to either reposition them via terminals or find their hologram emitters. As you come to the vault, you can open the doors via a nearby terminal and head inside, temporarily locking you within. Here you can find several things, including numerous supplies left for Vera and a pile of gold bars, all of which are worth an exorbitant amount of caps, but are equally as heavy, meaning you can only carry a few before becoming over-encumbered. The terminal within has the aforementioned apology to Vera. By accessing Sinclair's personal accounts, you lock yourself in, leading to a game over. A nice touch that makes sure you've been paying attention to the dialogue and storyline as you progress through the DLC. Instead of accessing the accounts, you can exit the terminal to meet with Elijah for one final dialogue tree before the ending where you can use one of several skill checks to convince him to come down to meet you face to face. This leads to a confrontation with Elijah, one where depending on how you treat the companions, they will attempt to help you in said encounter. Christine, for example, can shut off the security turrets for you. Dead money is about letting go, and how failing to do so can lead to negative consequences, some incredibly dire. The obsessions we have for trivial things within our lives, or even not-so-trivial things, can often lead us down a path with tunnel vision, to the point that we are actively hurting ourselves or others in the process. Christine had to let go of Elijah. Dog and God had to let go of their differences, of hunger and control, and Dean had to let go of the Sierra Madre itself, and by doing so, you have actively helped them become better, healthier people. This is in contrast to Elijah, who simply cannot let go of what the Sierra Madre has to offer, costing him his life either through confrontation with the courier, or by locking himself inside the vault only to never escape. The latter is possible if he never sees you, and both endings lead to you rushing out of the complex before your bomb collar goes off. Elijah doesn't want the Sierra Madre for fortune, but for what it can provide via technology. The hologram system can be weaponized, and the casino is already a fortress. As he is always focused on, Elijah looks for a means to control, via weaponized tech, and is willing to commit any manner of atrocities along the way to see it happen. This just happens to be as close as he has ever gotten, although he was fairly close back at Helios 1. Dead Money wants to provide you insight on the concepts of greed and obsession, and how one can overcome them. It explores is how we make life harder for ourselves by not letting things go, and how learning to do so can truly let us, as Vera put it, begin again. It's one of my favorite explorations into these topics, and one of my favorite DLCs within the Fallout series as a whole. As for the courier, or the player, you have to let go of all the fortune in front of you, coming face to face with interactable items that are worth a fortune back in the Mojave, and accepting that you can only manage back with two or three. It's about letting go, and if you want to continue on your journey, you need to come to terms with that.
After making your way out of the Sierra Madre with all of your earnings while completely missing the point of the DLC, you're treated to an epilogue of all the characters you interacted with throughout the storyline. Each of their endings can be altered slightly based on how you treated them and ultimately dealt with them within the casino itself. For us, Christine went on to patrol the villa to the point that the ghost people recognized her as a hologram. For Dean, as a guest of the casino, he had many doors open for him and the ability to explore. Dog and God merged together due to their intense needs for one another and ultimately became a new being entirely. As for Elijah, you either side with him, kill him, or poetically trap him within the vaults of his desires. During some late game dialogue with your companions and within epilogues, you will often hear talk about another courier and also talk about your battle with said courier within the divide, foreshadowing the events of you and Ulysses within the Lonesome Road DLC. Keep in mind that by this point, the second DLC hadn't even been released yet. The narrative of not only New Vegas, but its expansion content has a clear effort into plotting it out ahead of time and allowing it to be interconnected for a more satisfying experience. When you return to the Brotherhood bunker, you can grab Elijah's robes from the previously locked chest. There's a vendor tron in the bunker for you to use with your chips, and a drop box that will dispense chips for you periodically. On the previously locked terminals is a note for Veronica, who Elijah was closely tied to. You don't get to know what was on the tape, but bringing it to Veronica, you can convince her to either listen to it or choose not to, leading to two separate perks for her. If she listens to it, she'll gain Elijah's Last Words, which offers a 150% boost to attack speed, and a 25% chance to knock enemies down. If she doesn't listen to it, she'll gain Elijah's Ramblings, which raises critical hit damage by 150% as well. It's hard to follow up Dead Money, a cruelly misunderstood addition to New Vegas that seems to have garnered a greater appreciation over time. Not only did it tell its story well, but it also managed to tie it closely to the main storyline. Elijah is a bit of an enigma and legend to you in the Brotherhood, and to finally come face to face with the man and see what he has become is incredibly rewarding, especially on subsequent playthroughs. There's always more to learn. Like I said, it's hard to follow up Dead Money. You wouldn't blame the next entry for being slightly less enjoyable than the unique experience of the Sierra Madre, but no harder was a ball dropped than in the next entry of New Vegas, Honest Hearts. I don't want to go into this DLC completely negative. Honest Hearts has its share of interesting characters, one of which is also closely tied to the backstory of New Vegas and the Legion. The DLC also went back to a more open, explorable environment instead of the more restrictive setting of Dead Money. But what's most unfortunate about Honest Hearts is how lackluster its story is in comparison to its predecessor. This is particularly egregious as there is a side story via hidden terminals that tells a much more interesting tale involving a survivalist known as Randall Clark, and how he dealt with the aftermath of the Great War. We'll get to Randall later, but for now we have to make our way to the Northern Passage where you run into Jed Masterson of the Happy Trails Caravan Company. Jed's company is on a run of bad luck, and he's put out a radio signal advertisement looking for helping hands on an expedition into the Zion Canyon, so they can connect with the new Canaanites, aka a civilization of Mormons based out of Salt Lake City. Zion Canyon is said to be the only current safe route leading from the Mojave to the city, and Jed is looking for an individual with a Pip-Boy to help map the route to make getting back easier. You can agree to help with the expedition in order to start the DLC. Along with Jed, you'll be met with Stella and Ricky, who can give you some insight into New Reno, the gang slash tribes there, and the history of the caravan. Ricky specifically is a psycho addict, and you can use a medicine check to point this out, convincing him to leave the caravan before departure. On the topic of discussion with the caravan members, Jed will point out that he he recognizes you as Alice McLafferty's rising star due to the work you put in with the Crimson Caravan Company, and double checks that you are still up for the job. Since the only means of progressing is agreeing to go regardless, you can tell Jed you're ready to set off, but he won't let you go so easily. Similar to Dead Money, Honest Hearts wants to limit you mechanically to make the expansion feel like a more refreshing experience. Where Dead Money simply took all of your equipment away, Honest Hearts tries to reason about a scenario where you only have a limited option in terms of what you can bring with you. Since the expedition is long and arduous, Jed will only let you take 75 pounds worth of equipment alongside you, but there's several ways to up this value to 100 pounds via perks like Strong Back or Pack Rat, as well as a survival skill of 50. You can even keep quiet about Ricky's drug addiction in order to have him carry some of your gear for you. Once you've placed your gear in a nearby trunk, you can talk to Jed a final time to head off into the Zion Canyon and the start of Honest Hearts, where you are met with the introductory sequence discussing new 
New Canaan, a town where the Mormons known as the New Canaanites lived before it was eventually sacked by Kaiser's Legion, who had a certain courier train the White Legs tribe to be more combat proficient before sacking the town and slaughtering as many people as they could. While not fully brought up within the introductory sequence itself, this aspect of the storyline is further foreshadowing to your eventual encounter with said courier known as Ulysses within Lonesome Road. The paths we're following are slow going, so you might as well keep your ears open and listen to what old Jed has to say. A few decades back, folks in the NCR started to hear about a community in northern Utah called New Canaan. Didn't know much about them, except that they were religious folks, sent out missionaries to talk to the tribes. We've seen our share of cults, but the New Canaanites? They were honest traders. Good fighters, too. Raiders wouldn't tangle with them. But then, the Legion appeared in Arizona. I reckon you know all about them. Turns out Caesar's first war chief, the Mal Pace Legate, was a New Canaanite, Joshua Graham. Legend goes that Graham was the meanest, toughest son of a bitch in the whole damn legion. The new Canaanites wouldn't talk about him. They were ashamed. Guess I can't blame them. Well, at Hoover Dam, the Malpace Legate finally met his match. Hanlon and Oliver kicked his new Canaanite butt right back over the river. Caesar had to make an example for the others, to show them that even at the highest level, failure wouldn't be tolerated. He had Graham covered in pitch, lit on fire, and thrown into the Grand Canyon. People say he didn't even scream on the way down. Not long after, some of the slaves and tribals started to talk. Said Graham wasn't dead. Shouldn't have been any surprise. All this talk bothered Caesar, so he forbade anyone from speaking his name. Wanted to erase Joshua Graham from history. He got his wish. Joshua Graham disappeared, and in his place came legends of the burned man walking the wastes. Probably just a tribal ghost story. But New Canaan's been silent for a long time. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe the Malpace Legate is dead. Or maybe Joshua Graham did crawl out of that canyon and finally found his way back home. Another large aspect of the introductory sequence discusses Joshua Graham, one of the first members of Kaisar's Legion who was held responsible for the Legion's first failure in securing the Hoover Dam. As punishment, Joshua was set on fire and pushed off of the Grand Canyon, yet he somehow managed to survive this becoming a legendary figure known as the Burned Man, as well as one of the main characters within this expansion's storyline. There's a larger history to Joshua and Kaisar. Joshua was there when Kaisar rose to power, and we'll see some exploration of that through dialogue in the DLC, as well as Kaisar's perspective on the subject after we've covered all the additional content. However, it should be pointed out that I have already recorded and killed Kaisar by this point in the game as it leads to unique dialogue with Joshua. After the introductory sequence, your caravan reaches the canyon only to be met with an attack of a hostile tribe known as the White Legs. This is the first of many problems both theoretically and technically with Honest Hearts. Unlike Dead Money, Honest Hearts wanted to offer a more expansive, explorable location for the player characters similar to that of the Mojave, but this ends up falling flat for several reasons that we'll discuss shortly. Mechanically, the DLC feels almost on rails, which is odd due to its open nature. As the White Legs attack you, for example, there is simply no way to stop your caravan members from being wiped out, no matter how quick on the draw or how true your aim. You will always be the last one standing, and there's no way around this. After the initial attack, the player is saved by a member of the Dead Horses tribe known as Follows Chalk, who agrees to lead you to safety by taking you to his tribe's settlement, where you can speak with Joshua Graham, aka the burned man who has been taking care of and leading them. Also off script, but I realize I didn't mention it while writing, if you make it to Angel Cave, you will activate the Wild Wasteland trait, and this man will show up here, whose name is Two Bears High Fiving. And if you remember all the way back at the character creation process, I said to remember what you saw in the Rorschach test, and it's Two Bears High Fiving, and they knew it, and they saw it, and they referenced it later. I love that.
This is probably the best time to talk about how weak and arguably problematic the themes of Honest Hearts are in comparison to any other aspect of New Vegas as a whole. Honest Hearts follows a trope known as White Man's Burden, or Innocent Natives. It offers two white male characters, Daniel who leads the Sorrows and Joshua who leads the Dead Horses, both of whom are new Canaanites, and taking their time to teach aspects of their religion to the tribe's people who are depicted as of lesser capacity to the two men. The concept is tied to the fact that these indigenous tribes have been living in the canyons away from modern civilization for many years now. Joshua and Daniel are looking to teach them about this culture as well as their own religion in order to help them in their own way. Joshua wants to train the tribes into a miniature army so that they can protect themselves, and we will see later how Daniel simply infantilizes them due to their inexperience within his personal world. It's almost hilariously insulting how they play up follows Chalk as completely oblivious to the concept of modern culture, using his observations observations of man-made structures and technology for jokes rather than potentially as a criticism from an outsider's perspective. There's no one within the narrative or storytelling taking these tribes seriously. Instead, they are treated as inaccurate caricatures of real indigenous people in order to help immerse you, Joshua and Daniel as their saviors since the game believes they clearly can't take care of themselves. And the mechanics of Honest Hearts lend to this. As we will see later, there's no choice given to the two tribes, instead you simply get to follow follow through with the plans of one white man or the other. Never do you get to ask the tribe's people what their desires or goals are, how they would dictate themselves outside of two of your companions where you can convince one of them to go into the world and see the sights. When you make it to the dead horse's camp, you can head into a nearby cave to be met with Joshua. Similar to how your first meeting with Elijah was rather impactful, his holographic face greeting you with the grand casino in the distance, Joshua is similar. When he meets you and talks to you, he's at a higher elevation, a mountain of guns on his desk which he's inspecting and cleaning while talking to you. He is truly the burned man of legend, bandaged up and needing to change them every day. Somehow Joshua did survive Kaisar, and that in turn changed him from who he used to be, becoming a more humble man, but still acting as a foil to Daniel in terms of their religion. Joshua believes he is doing God's work through violence, while Daniel wants to leave things as peacefully as possible. The DLC is relatively short, Short. It gets padded out through the explorable locations, but even then there isn't much to do overall within Zion. Joshua will inform you that the two tribes, the Dead Horses and the Sorrows, are dealing with the White Legs, a vicious set of people, some of whom have been trained by the Legion and are looking to expand and take over the canyon. Joshua is training the Dead Horses while Daniel teaches the Sorrows more about religion and faith, but the two men are allied and work together overall. Where the two men don't see eye to eye is how to deal with the White Legs. Daniel simply wants to leave the valley with the sorrows, while Joshua wants to wipe the white legs out completely, and that's essentially the big decision within this expansion. Are you going to murder an entire tribe of people, or are you going to try a more peaceful approach? It's pretty basic, and again, not handled well at all since the white legs are treated as comically violent villains, and the ability to reason with them takes one level 75 speech check at the end of the storyline. Joshua needs us to gather supplies for the sorrows, things like a compass, medical supplies, and food for the journey they plan to make to the Grand Staircase, an area east of the canyon where they plan to resettle. During the collection of said supplies, you temporarily have Follows Chalk as a companion. As I mentioned, most of his lack of experience via modern civilization and culture is played as a joke for the player, rather than a criticism of said civilization. Follows Chalk will ask about why the NCR and Legion fight over the dam, but this doesn't go much further than him being astonished by the description of how large the dam truly is. One of the main interactions with the this companion is a quest where he expresses an interest in seeing the world for himself and gaining his own understanding of other cultures. You can talk to Joshua about this, who mentions it's really up to follows Chalk, and you can then give your own opinion on the subject which will affect his ending during the epilogue. Once all of the supplies are collected, you head to the Sorrows camp where you can meet with Daniel. Daniel holds a lot of trauma over witnessing several atrocities throughout his life, including the sacking of his community's village and seeing several tribes be completely wiped out. For that reason, he has dedicated his life to helping said tribes, and this has culminated in attempting to get the Sorrows safely out of the canyon without turning them into a militarized force. This is pretty much the entirety of Honest Hearts Explained. You get the supplies for Joshua and Daniel, then Daniel tasks you with clearing the valley out of several threats, such as Yaogwai, mutated bears that have appeared 
appeared in the series previously. While accomplishing these tasks, you are given a second companion known as Waking Cloud. She is a member of the Sorrows tribe and sports a Yao Guai hand as a melee weapon. You can gain one of these yourself by completing a side quest that has you drink some sort of concoction that drugs you and forces you to fight a flaming Yao Guai guardian spirit. Most of the elderly and children have been sent away from the Sorrows camp to go find safety in the meantime until the White Legs have been dealt with. This includes Waking Cloud's family of three children and her husband. Unfortunately, she is worried about her family and you can find out from Daniel that, while her children are safe, her husband died during an attack. You can choose to divulge this information to Waking Cloud or not, and it will also affect her epilogue at the end of the expansion. Once you have the supplies and have also completed all of the chores for Daniel, you are left with a choice. Do you side with Daniel and help the Sorrows escape, or do you side with Joshua to kill the White Legs? The best part is that while these do lead to two different scenarios, you still end up within direct conflict of the White Legs tribe regardless. So before we actually discuss the endings and your final decision, let's take a moment to discuss the best part about Honest Hearts, Randall Clark. Randall served in the United States military but was more interested in the survivalist lifestyle and often found himself in the canyons outside of Salt Lake City. His wife and child unfortunately passed away as Randall was making his way back home due to the Great War beginning and multiple nuclear bombs falling on the city and decimating it. Randall made his way back to the canyon and took shelter in a cave alongside various supplies that allowed him to live inside for several years until the radiation fallout dissipated. Around this time, a group of Mexicans moved into the valley and began setting up a civilization there. Surprisingly, the survivors of Vault 22, which we personally visited to look into the spore issues and save Keeley, made their way to the same valley and ran into the Mexican tribe. The tribe was no match for the vault dwellers and had their men killed and the rest locked up to be used as food for the dwellers turned cannibals. The series of events infuriated Randall, and he took vengeance from high up on the cliffs by slowly killing the majority of the dwellers over multiple days until they finally decided to give up on the location and leave. One of the dwellers ended up getting her foot stuck in a bear trap and Randall saved her. Throughout the next few years, they formed a relationship and eventually the dweller, Sylvie, was pregnant. Unfortunately, due to complications, both Sylvie and the child died during birth. After burying them, Randall planned to kill himself, but couldn't go through with it. Years later in his 70s, Randall witnessed a group of children show up to the Mexican tribe's campsite and settle in. He planned to take care of them from a distance by placing supplies, reading materials, and notes around the camp. He claimed that Zion was a reward for the sorrows they had suffered, and the group began to think of Randall as a godlike figure known as the Father in the Caves. These children would go down to name their tribe the Sorrows after the note left by Randall, and worshipped him as a deity. Randall would die of lung cancer around this point. You can actually find his body left under the stars of Zion Canyon, and you can learn of his story by visiting several caves where he had set up to live for different periods of his life. Within each of these caves is a terminal that tells his story in the form of an autobiography and several supply caches that offer an abundance of ammunition and healing items. You can also find his Desert Ranger armor, which is a customized unique version of the NCR armor that does not force the faction mechanic on you. The story of Rand is the most interesting aspect of Honest Hearts overall. What it fails in storytelling through the main questline, it makes up for via a sad tale of a man left alone after the war, who fended for himself all the way until his death, but still managed to help those around him whenever possible. The father in the caves was a real person who did good for the Sorrows, and he has been passed down as a legend because of it, to the point that the Sorrows equate the teachings of Mormonism to talking about the father. After exploring the canyon and learning about Randall, it's a good time to talk to David. David and Joshua for various backstory details. Joshua specifically has a lot to say about his methodology as a Mormon and how he justifies the level of violence he is willing to enact through godly worship. You also get a lot of backstory between Joshua and the Legion. Joshua was one of the first members of Kaisar's Legion and knew Kaisar before he was named as such. Joshua acted as an interpreter for a tribe known as the Blackfoot, helping out the followers of the Apocalypse, two men by the name of Edward Sallow and Bill Calhoun. At some point, in time, the three men were held hostage by the tribe, something Joshua attributes to a mistranslation on his part, at least he believes it to be. This was unfortunate for the tribe, as they were at war with several others and losing quickly. Seeing this, Edward Sallow opted to train the tribe in the art of modern warfare and effectively took over the tribe in the process, taking the title of Kaisar and creating the Legion at the same time. If you've killed Kaisar by this point in the game, which doesn't defeat the Legion, mind you, you can inform Joshua about this to his surprise 
because he couldn't believe that after all Kaiser had done to him, that Kaiser was still the first to die. And Joshua can comment on how you are doing God's work even if you don't believe so. Honest Hearts looks to humanize Joshua Graham despite the incredible atrocities he is responsible for. He's a Mormon missionary turned legionary legate, and is falling back to his Mormon lifestyle while looking for forgiveness for his past actions. The game frames Joshua like he is a man redeemed, but this is an inaccurate and almost disturbing way to portray someone who has done what Joshua continues to do. Joshua may have changed slightly in personality and gone back to the ways of his godly belief system, but this doesn't change the amount of unnecessary violence he is willing to enact on people simply because it is justified in his eyes. And I'm not talking about simply killing people in combat. Daniel, the most peaceful of the group, is even willing to kill if absolutely necessary in the protection of the tribe. If you side with Joshua at the end of the DLC, you'll find him systematically executing all of the white legs, with their leader, a warlord cowering in fear. Joshua is portrayed as more knowledgeable and capable than these groups of tribespeople, and he uses this capability to enact violence that goes above and beyond what anyone else may consider necessary. Joshua may have been kicked out of the Legion, but he is still Legion in his actions, despite the good he tries to do. The bad he inflicts onto others is inexcusable, and he only justifies it through his religion instead of through Kaisar. That's why it's disturbing to see the writers make Joshua such a cool character. Not necessarily an interesting or deep one, but a cool one. Joshua is a legendary figure, he's enigmatic and covered in bandages. When you meet him, you see someone of power, someone that is designed to intimidate you through their experiences. And even the voice actor they choose is one of the best in the game's entirety. His gravelly, to the point nature of speaking makes Joshua inherently charming. This way lies the path to hell. Ed Caesar needed me to translate. Translation became giving orders. Giving orders became leading in battle. Leading in battle became training, punishing, terrorizing. A series of small mistakes before a great fall. And I stayed in that darkness until after Hoover Dam. After I failed Caesar and he had me burned alive, thrown into the Grand Canyon. I survived because the fire inside burned brighter than the fire around me. I fell down into that dark chasm. The flame burned on and on. He's supposed to be, and the game doesn't necessarily punish you or even comment on the fact that you can side with him outside of Daniel being slightly upset you chose to. You can convince Joshua to spare Salt Upon Wounds, the leader of the White Legs, but the damage has already been done by this point. Joshua has committed an essential genocide of a tribe. He is in no way better than the Legion. He is the same. This isn't a problem solely with Joshua either. We'll see later that the game is almost forced to humanize the Legion as they are a group you can side with. Kaisar is not only well spoken, but he has a way of justifying his actions through philosophy that acts as a trap I feel many players may fall into. Kaisar has no real excuse for what he has done that one should consider valid, but he can present it in a way that some individuals might find themselves agreeing with, simply because of its philosophical nature, no matter how bullshit that actually is. It should come as no surprise that I'd side with Daniel at this point in the game. Daniel's main goal is getting the sorrows out safely and you can help him accomplish that. Although it still leads into a fight with the White Legs. On the road there, there's several final tasks you can complete to make the way for the sorrows even safer. But the main issue here is that they are spread around the northern area of the map and you can't fast travel during this specific quest, so getting around can be considered a bit grating. Once you make it to the tunnel where the sorrows plan to escape, you'll run into Salt Upon Wounds and begin a dialogue with him. You can choose to fight or use a skill check to convince him into standing down, which I chose to do here. Even if you let them live, the White Legs will be considered failures in the eyes of the Legion and unable to join them. Further, Joshua has trained the dead horses to better protect their homeland, making the White Legs less of a threat overall. Once all is said and done, Daniel will give you a detonator to close off the tunnel, thus ending the relatively short DLC. Within the epilogue, you learn of the fates of the various tribes based on how you interacted with them and the decisions you made, whether the White Legs were wiped out, whether 
whether the Saros stayed to fight, etc. The Saros didn't enjoy leaving the valley, but managed to settle safely in the Grand Staircase. As for your companions, Waking Cloud resented Daniel for some time for keeping the death of her husband from him, but ultimately forgave him and married again afterward. Follows Chalk, if convinced to go visit modern civilization, will never be seen again after arguing with his family and trekking off on his own. But it's unclear what happened to him exactly. He could just be simply living his life out in the Mojave. You don't get an epilogue with Joshua if you side with Daniel, but this doesn't seem to be the same vice versa. If you did ally with Joshua, the level of his depravity is dictated by whether you convinced him to spare salt upon wounds or not. If you didn't, he goes fully into his militancy and depravity, becoming an even fiercer legend as the burned man. If you convince him to show mercy, he still trains and fights, but not to the level of violence he had previously. As for Daniel, if you sided with Joshua, he never forgives himself for what he considers his failure, as the Saros begin to revere Joshua and turn to militancy. If you help Daniel, he safely gets the Saros to the Grand Staircase, but he always questions whether it was the right choice or not. In a way, it's bittersweet for him. Honest Hearts, again, is undoubtedly the worst of New Vegas's four expansions, not just in the mechanics and the short, shallow storytelling, but in how it tends to make use of indigenous culture and stereotypes for laughs. Joshua is the real catalyst for how infuriating the narrative is with how it glorifies his actions. While Daniel is considered the peaceful route, no one points out how truly villainous Joshua is, especially in him being fine turning tribes militant and affecting their culture so thoroughly. In a game that has such a strong ability at analyzing and criticizing the cultural norm we face in modern day, to see how they treated Joshua, essentially letting him get away scot-free with minor criticism, and how they played into problematic white savior tropes for laughs was fairly disheartening and disappointing. Honest Hearts is a complete failure in New Vegas in every way. We can see this from comparing it to the stronger and creative narrative of Dead Money, and we'll be seeing this further as we enter the best DLC of New Vegas, Old World Blues. In the years before the Great War, Big Mountain had been the home to the brightest minds of the 21st century. Scientists of vision were drawn to the facility to tackle the greatest technological challenges of the era. They sought to create a new world, fueled by technology for the benefit of all mankind. Sonic emitters, space-age alloys, DNA hybridization, force field particle research, autodoc advances in cranial, cardiac, and trauma surgery. The hopes and dreams of a century became realities in the electronic forges of Big Mountain. The nucleus of this research was the dome. A huge stone facility that held the labs of every science known to man. It was a think tank where no problem could not be solved, where no question could not be answered. The Great War brought a new energy to Big Mountain and its scientists. Although sheltered from the front lines, the scientists waged their own war fighting their battles at the atomic level. Equations and calculations marched endlessly across chalkboards and computer terminals toward one solution, winning the war. For years, the mines and computers of Big Mountain were a blaze of trajectories, weapon schematics, and nuclear theories. The problems began to outpace the solutions, first geometrically, then exponentially. As the war escalated, so did the questions. On the night of October 23rd, 2077, the scientists received an answer that put all their questions to rest. In the aftermath, Big Mountain's silent experiments went to sleep, their creators slowly dying in the new world that had been left behind. And the great stone in the middle of the Big Empty lay untouched, filled with countless technological wonders. Wonders that, 
in the end, had been answers to the wrong question. Old World Blues mechanically is one of, if not the best DLCs in New Vegas' lineup of expansion content. Thematically, its focus is on humanity's obsession with science, progress, and the atrocities that seem to generate around those concepts, as well as an over-reliance or obsession on how things used to be. How we sometimes yearn or obsess over a time long since past as we have trouble adjusting to the present or future. Change often brings with it discomfort, and said discomfort can either be embraced or shunned, leading to unhealthy obsessions with keeping things as they are or were. The setting of this expansion is the Big Mountain Research Facility. The name is derived from the fact that the complex was originally underground below a mountain before an experiment gone awry caused the upper portion of said mountain to be vaporized, leaving behind a large crater in which the facility is now visible. This led to a few different interpretations of how one refers to the area. Mountain often gets shortened in dialogue to the letters M and T, which leads to to the name Big Empty, generally being how individuals will refer to the location, and this is how I'll generally be referring to it as well. Big Empty was originally designed as a way for the best pre-war scientists to be set free to research and experiment however they pleased, regardless of the ethical questions that followed. This meant human and animal experimentation were rarely, if ever, off the table, and multiple atrocities, including a Chinese concentration camp, would be left over as the remnants of what used to be. To travel to the facility, you need to head to an abandoned drive-in near Nipton, where there's a crashed satellite that will project a picture of an eye onto the screen around midnight. Interacting with the device at this point will automatically transport you to the facility and begin the DLC. The courier upon awakening will find themselves on the balcony of the central location within the new game world, known as the Think Tank. The term Think Tank is used multiple times within the DLC. It describes the hub area that you will spend the majority of your downtime in. It describes the device used to keep multiple doctors alive, and it also describes said doctor's faction. The location within the think tank that you begin is specifically called the sink, and acts as your own personal quarters that you can travel to freely even after the DLC is completed. In fact, all of Old World Blues remains fully explorable to the player character after the storyline has seen its end. Within the sink are multiple objects and tools that you can interact with later on in your journey throughout the Big Empty, but none of which work at the moment due to missing various modules that allow them to function. Further exploring the sink leads to a door which allows you to enter the think tank proper, an area that emits a mechanic known as a pacification field, making it impossible for you to draw your weaponry, which you still have after being transported here. In fact, while the previous DLCs tried to limit what equipment you could bring, both Old World Blues and Lonesome Road allow you to carry your entire arsenal if you see fit. Inside the think tank area are five think tank devices, objects that each house the brain of an Old World scientist. Directly in front of you, at this time is Dr. Klein, who acts as the leader of the group, but there is also Dr. Dalla, Dr. O, or Zero, as we will learn later, Dr. Boris, and Dr. Eight. Each of these individual tanks has a rather erratic personality, one that is semi-detached from the humanity they have lost over the hundreds of years since the Great War. Once fully human, the think tank are now nothing more than brains in tanks attached to visual monitors, and this has various psychological effects on how they compare themselves to humans, and how they even even perceive humans at this point in time. Klein specifically comments on how he theorizes your toes and fingers to be various penises, which he does quickly get corrected on, but never stops mentioning. The think tank represents science without the inhibitions of humanity or ethics. By having become almost fully mechanical in nature and forgetting about what made them once human, the think tank have been able to thrive within the Big Empty, performing any sort of experiment or research that you could imagine. And this is clearly not without its faults. Talking to the think tank, you can see that the majority of them have more than a screw loose, being very hard to reason with, and when reasoned with, it's usually due to them misunderstanding you or the situation in some way. That being said, these are still the minds of super geniuses, and that's their sole goal within existence at this point, to experiment, to research, to progress. In more ways than one, this is incredibly dangerous. A genius mind left without inhibitions or the concept of ethics can run amok like a nuclear weapon just waiting 
waiting to destroy the surrounding area. Talking to Dr. Klein will have you talking to all of the various think tanks surrounding you as they can all interact through the same speaker box of another, and there will be a lot of dialogue. Old World Blues has many characters to dissect and interact with, and this in turn makes it one of the most dialogue-heavy entries in New Vegas. Upon meeting the faction, they will start and continue to refer to you as a lobotomite. This isn't simply an insult, however, as they have truly taken out your brain, spine, and heart, each of which gives you various perks and stat bonuses since they have been replaced with mechanical counterparts. Your head, however, simply has Tesla coils installed inside, which allows you to somehow still function through your brain waves despite the fact that it is no longer inside your body. The lack of a brain is what allows the pacification field to function. By being functionally considered a lobotomite, they are somewhat under the will of the think tank and their technology. However, you happen to be a special case. Most lobotomites do not have a form of reason. You are the first to have taken part in such a smooth surgery, to the point that you still have the ability to perform logic and reason. This shocks the think tank once they realize you can communicate with them, something that takes them a fair bit to accept, as it's the first time they've ever seen a thinking lobotomite, well, ever. During your discussions with the think tank, as you try to get them to understand you, a transmission starts on a screen behind you. Dr. Mobius, another think tank, appears to establish that he will attack the other doctors with his army of robo-scorpions if they attempt to traverse the Big Empty. He looks to instill fear in them and prevent them from reaching his location north of the area known as the Forbidden Zone. The doctors, afraid of Mobius and wanting to deal with him, realize that you are the key to collecting several technologies that they believe will allow an assault on the Forbidden Zone to take place, while also informing you that the device that took your brain in the first place was created by Mobius, which means your brain is most likely to be found in the Forbidden Zone as well. This sets up the main objective of Old World Blues. You, as the courier, must explore the various research facilities found within the complex and gather schematics. That will allow the think tank to have you assault the Forbidden Zone. While collecting these schematics, you will also be able to acquire the technology for yourself along the way, some of which is highly useful for you as a character or for explorability. Additionally, you are given a personality chip for the central intelligence unit within the sink. Each object in the sink that has some form of functionality comes with a unique personality programmed by Mobius. The central intelligence unit, for example, acts as a high-class butler and can sell you various goods from within its stores. There's other objects as well, such as an auto dock, a anti-communist book shoot, a biological fertilization station that wants to spread its seed everywhere, and several others. Two of the most prevalent personalities would be Muggy, who is a self-diagnosed neurotic, who has a violent obsession with mugs, and a toaster who wants to dismantle all appliances through acts of violence and rage. While you are given the central intelligence unit to start, you are then tasked with optionally exploring various areas of the facilities to find the rest and create a fully functional headquarters for you to use at your leisure. It's probably one of the more rewarding reasons to explore the various locations, unlike what we have previously seen in Honest Hearts. Not only does collecting the personality chips give you interesting dialogue and backstory of Mobius and the Big Empty, but all of said personalities have some sort of function, with some being more useful than others. It doesn't stop there either. Once you have all of the personalities installed, you also need to collect various modules that will restore locked functionality to each of them. Many of the personality modules are in locations where you can find several modules ahead of time as well, so thoroughly exploring your surroundings within each facility is much more rewarding that time around as you aren't simply gaining caps and ammunition, which you should have an exorbitant amount of by this point in the game. The game assumes you have been scavenging and wants to reward you within another way, and the modules are the answers for how to do that. I won't go into the functionality of all of the sync features, but some are incredibly useful. The autodoc, for example, can give you a haircut, perform plastic surgery to change your appearance, and also install several implants that provide various bonuses, such as extra damage against Cazadors or a faster walking speed while crouching. I don't think I've talked about implants yet, so it's good to mention that this isn't necessarily the first time you see the mechanic. The base game of New Vegas has a doctor's office that is run by Dr. Usanagi, who can install several implants into you for 4,000 caps apiece. Each implant is unique and will upgrade one of your special stats, with the amount of implants you can take being dictated by how high your endurance stat is. There's also two special implants that are more expensive, such as the subdermal armor option that raises your damage threshold and the monocyte booster that allows you to regenerate health over time. The auto dock within the sink is similar. You pay caps to install up to four implants with no limitations other than the ability to purchase them. Part of the 
DLC's finale is based on if you completed some of the Think Tank's various conversational quest lines. Except for one of the Think Tank members, you can start and complete their quest line in order to get to know them better without actually leaving the dome. The first of which is Dr. Dala. Dala was originally the head chief researcher of mineralogy, but now focuses on humanology and the lobotomites that litter the Big Empty. She is highly fascinated with the human form, seeming to subconsciously miss her own body in some capacity. This translates into a semi-robotic, semi-biological sexual desire. To begin her quest, a perception check or relevant perk is necessary and will have Dala asked to inspect your human biorhythms. If you can't pass any of the checks, bringing Dala a teddy bear is another valid option as she seems to be obsessed with these as well, which is displayed within her room at the think tank as well as her human house within a warehouse hangar area known as Higgs Village. All you need to do to satisfy Dala is perform a few basic human actions, breathing heavily, opening and closing your eyes, etc. These fascinate Dala to the point of a think tank's form of orgasm and successfully completes her quest, with you gaining the option to perform these acts for her periodically for a reward. There's a running theme here with completing these dialogue quests in that you are expected to have relatively high stats to do so. A perfect example is Dr. O, who is frustrated with the fact that the doctors around him consistently get his name wrong. This is due to the fact that Dr. O's name is actually Dr. Zero, but the stylization between O and Zero is so similar that people often mix the two up. You can find out this information through a speech check of 65, followed by an intelligence check of 7. But where the humor really lies is how you need an intelligence check of 9 to explain to Zero that he could simply stylize his name with a slash through the digit in order to make it easier to differentiate. Explaining this very high Q concept to Zero will further comfort him and convince him to go by his desired name, thus completing his quest. Dr. 8 is next, another number-based name. 8's big differentiating factor from the other doctors is that he is unable to properly communicate via English due to damage to his voice module. Through various stat checks, you can figure out that this actually isn't the case. Instead, it seems that his voice module was reprogrammed by none other than Elijah when he happened to be stuck here. However, there is a pattern in 8's speech which will allow the courier to not only communicate with 8 but form a bond as well. Dr. Boris is slightly more involved. Boris will mention his cybernetic dog, Gabe, to the character via dialogue. You will generally run into Gabe during the main storyline quest and be forced to kill him or see him killed by several invading rad scorpions. You can find Gabe's bowl around Higgs village behind Boris's house and returning it to him will unlock memories that allow him to reminisce about the time he spent with Gabe. It's potentially one of the more gut-wrenching moments in the DLC. Boris will discuss how loyal Gabe was and how much he appreciated him. Despite sneaking multiple chems into his food bowl and actively experimenting on him to the point that Gabe was a giant vicious cyber dog, by helping Boris through these memories he begins to feel a deep regret in what he has done to Gabe and finds it hard to understand. A great guilt washes over him and you can point out to Boris that he is feeling the emotional effects of doing something awful to an individual he loved and that had loved him and trusted him back. Boris admits his mistakes and mentions how he hates the feeling he's experiencing, but ultimately manages to manually push them down into the back of his mind, ending the quest. If you have the Wild Wasteland trait, Gabe's doghouse will actually have the name Stripe over it and a miniature deathclaw of the same name will appear and attack you. The point of these dialogue quests seems to be for the sole purpose of connecting the think tank to their humanity in some capacity, whether it be through Dala's biological urges, through Zero's sense of identity, through Ape's need to communicate and be heard, or through Boris's feelings of regret over how he treated his pet. The sense of self and humanity is a huge theme and discussion point throughout the DLC, and memory and identity play a large role in that as we will see later on. Now is a great time to discuss the various areas you'll be exploring in order to complete the main questline and side quests. I won't be going over all of them, but some ones I think are particularly interesting. Before that though, it should be pointed out that one of the technologies you are after is actually already in the hands of the Think Tank, a weapon called a sonic emitter that can emit sound waves of various recordings in order to damage enemies. The issue with this one is that it requires an upgrade that will allow it to disable various force fields around the complex. Before talking about the main areas, I want to mention a few locations that are relevant to dead money. When talking to the think tank, they often mention three other individuals that made it to the big empty before your arrival, all of whom ultimately escaped or were permitted to leave. These include Elijah, Christine who was chasing him, and Ulysses, whom we haven't met yet but have heard about constantly by this point. Elijah arrived looking for advanced tech he could use as weaponry, and he specifically learned about the Sierra Madre after meeting with Ulysses. The most interesting part of Elijah's trip here is his stay at Little Yang 
Lisi, the Chinese concentration camp, where the prisoners were equipped with jumpsuits and bomb collars that matched those Elijah used in the Dead Money DLC. This shows where he acquired his tools necessary for performing the heist, as well as various info on the casino's technologies. He even met with the think tank and is one of the reasons they began questioning that the Big Empty was the only place left within the world, now becoming more and more interested in the surrounding area, including the Mojave, which will lead into a final confrontation later within the DLC. Christine arrived in the Big Empty in pursuit of Elijah, but was ultimately captured by robots within the area and experimented on within a nearby medical facility to the point that she can no longer read nor write. This explains the scarring all across her head when we meet her in Dead Money. You can even find a hollow disc with a voice journal from Christine before she had the voice of Vera, where she has essentially given up and believes she will die in her medical prison before being saved by Ulysses. Ulysses, who, again, we haven't met yet, arrived at the Big Empty by accident. It was here he met Elijah and Christine before meeting with the think tank himself, asking them an important question. Who are you that do not know your history? While revealing his old world flag that he wears on his back. This, along with their interactions with Elijah, began to unlock memories for the doctors that would fuel their need for the technology we are now on the hunt for. In fact, the only reason we found the satellite that transported us here is due to the think tank's new curiosity with the outside world, attempting to see if anything really existed outside of the Big Empty via a satellite probe. In order to make the sonic emitter have the ability to destroy force fields, you first need to bring it to the X8 Research Center, which is designed to test individuals as they traverse a high school setting while gathering information along the way in order to escape. There's three levels of the test, and the high school seems to be designed after Dr. Boris's own time there, where he will frequently discuss how he was bullied constantly. You need to find three terminals, which are randomly placed within the test chamber, and download the report cards of three students from Dr. Boris's past. Once complete, you can run a residential guard test that will allow you to unlock a large yard-like area where Gabe is stored and who will become hostile upon detecting you. You don't need to kill Gabe and simply need to find an audio file for his bark, which is located within one of several burial sites in the surrounding area. Completing this task will upgrade the sonic emitter and allow you to complete advanced versions of the high school data retrieval test if you feel like doing so as it's tied to a side quest that leads to a perk reward. Almost all of the locations in Old World Blues are unique in interesting ways. The X8 Research Center, for example, isn't just used for the high school data retrieval test, but also houses a DNA splicing facility, where you can combine various biological creatures together to create something new. You can combine lobotomites with robots, for example, or a dog and robot to create a companion cybernetic dog known as Roxy. Roxy is unique in that she is a companion for X8, but can die. However, saving her leads to an extra epilogue involving Rex at the end. If she does die, she can be recreated at the splicing station. Generally, upon grabbing any of the required items to progress the main storyline quest, the courier will be immediately attacked by robo-scorpions that Dr. Mobius unleashed upon them. You can generally ignore them if you prefer, as dealing with them is one of the more frustrating aspects of the DLC. Almost all enemies within Old World Blues are some form of damage sponge. Similar to Dead Money, it feels like no matter how high your stats are and how good your equipment is, it's still going to take an excessive amount of attacks to destroy just one robo-scorpion out of the dozens you will be running across in the Big Empty. This wouldn't be so bad if not for the fact that your weaponry can degrade exceptionally quickly through repeated use, meaning that you either need to find replacement parts or spend exorbitant prices in order to repair your equipment at the sink. Luckily, there is at least one weapon known as a lair that is strong against robotic enemies, but it ends up having some of the lowest item HP in comparison to other weapons. Elijah actually has a unique version of this weapon that can be found within two of his campsites in the Big Empty. Speaking of enemies, it should be noted that on top of Robo Scorpions, you will run into several normal robot enemies from typical Fallout games. More interestingly are the lobotomites you run into that are aggressive humans with no brains, and the Y-17 trauma harness. The harnesses look similar to the spacesuits from back at Repcon and essentially function whether the user within is dead or not, leading to walking skeletal corpses still attached. After grabbing the sonic emitter upgrade, more of the various facilities open up to you as you now have a means of bypassing various force fields. Areas you may have already explored that had sections locked off may now be able to lead you to further upgrades or unique items. But for the main storyline, the next stop is the X2 transmitter antenna array, where you need to travel to the top of a large array tower to grab said antenna, which also happens to act as a melee weapon. There's nothing particularly interesting or unique to this area in comparison to the other two that you visit. It's more like one stop along the way before exploring somewhere more interesting. X13 is much more interesting interesting overall, acting as a stealth suit testing facility. Upon entering, you need to gather the various parts of the
of the stealth suit in order to put them together. It's one of the most interesting items in the game in terms of equipment, as it can heal you automatically via stim packs and apply medics to you automatically as well. On top of that, it also has its own activated personality and will comment on the current situation periodically when sneaking, in battle, or when removing the equipment for something else. Visually, it looks like a recolored version of the assassin suit from Dead Money, but by completing various stealth trials that increase in difficulty, you can unlock further and further upgrades for the suit, such as sneak speed and special stat increases. I believe the speed boost is actually bugged in the base game, however, and doesn't actually apply. The real sin of this piece of equipment is the fact that it is medium armor. Throughout the entirety of New Vegas, especially playing with stealth in mind, there's a good chance that you may be wearing a light armor, as there are several perks that boost its ability for the player, including one that even makes your general movement speed faster when wearing it, meaning you can traverse the waist faster overall. Stealth is inherently tied to light armor. The assassin suit you get in Dead Money is light armor. It only makes sense that the stealth suit, made for agile, stealth-based situations, would be light armor, as well as make use of all of those bonuses I mentioned. But it's not. It's medium armor, and it makes no goddamn sense. Once you have all the technologies required and their schematics, it's a good time to visit the various facilities around the Big Empty if you haven't already. As I pointed out previously, a lot of these facilities offer backstory on the facility itself, or on characters from past DLC entries. Even more interesting is how prevalent something like Vault 22 is within both Honest Hearts and Old World Blues, as the spore carriers seem to originate from the X-22 Botanical Garden, where you can find a unique enemy named Patient Zero. Not only was this research used within Vault 22, but also seems to have carried over into a section of Zion Canyon in Honest Hearts. There's plenty to find in the Big Empty, and it's even more rewarding when you have been paying attention to the story thus far, reading journals, listening to hollow discs, etc. And let's be honest here, modern Fallout gameplay isn't what makes the Fallout games so appealing. Yes, you can shoot and attack enemies, but the main draw of these games, especially in New Vegas, ends up being the narrative-driven storytelling, as well as the benefits of exploration. What you can find and what you will see are of much higher quality than any hostile encounter in the game could be. There's a lot to criticize about the combat of Fallout, especially in the DLC with bullet sponge style enemies, but the game overall makes up for it with some of the best narratives in modern games at the time and even moving forward, except Honest Hearts obviously. Back on the topic of the technology we went out to search for, Klein seems to have a plan for them, but has both forgotten what it is and also forgotten what the technologies even do. You can, through several dialogue and skill checks, help him reason out what each technology is used for. First, the X2 antenna will be used to focus brainwave patterns into the stealth suit, which acts similar to the trauma harnesses as a cardiac regulator. Then the sonic emitter is used for spinal vibrations. All of these technologies combined, theoretically, can be used offensively against Mobius in the Forbidden Zone, but there's more to it than that. The technologies provided could create artificial bodies, those of which could be used by the think tank to leave the big empty, which is currently impossible for them due to radar fences erected around the crater that acts as a repulsion field. We'll explore what this means for the think tank once we confront Mobius, but for now, the code within the technology schematics turns out to hold the sequence necessary to open the doors to the Forbidden Zone, seemingly hidden behind a mess of uncommented and erratic code. When you reach the Forbidden Zone, you will be pitted against multiple robo-scorpions near the entrance. The Forbidden Zone happens to be where these scorpions originate from, thanks to Dr. Mobius. The location was originally the X-42 robo-warfare facility, but after a dispute, Mobius absconded to said facility and renamed it. Once inside, you are immediately faced with a giant Robo Scorpion that needs to be dealt with within some capacity before you can advance to Mobius himself. There's several ways to do this, such as fighting the boss monster head on, but there's also various ways to circumvent combat for a more stealth based approach. For help in combat, there's a terminal where you can overload a generator to deal a portion of damage to the Scorpion. Alternatively, or on top of, you can reprogram several hostile turrets to aim at the Scorpion and also activate several Protectrons at the same time. The easiest way of dealing with the creature requires a science skill of 100, as you need to hack into a very hard terminal, but doing so will allow you to manually shut it down. New Vegas doesn't really have bosses. It has hostile people and creatures, some of which are unique and more powerful in their own ways, but this is most likely the first time you face something that you would consider boss-like in design. Maybe Elijah would fall under that category if you chose to fight him, or maybe Ulysses later on, but for the most part, the giant Robo-Scorpion is a one-off unique experience, and so it's good to see that there are many avenues to help you deal with it that don't solely focus on you combating it. If you're low in offensive skills, there 
there are plenty of assists to help you destroy the giant boss monster. Regardless of how you dealt with it, once the battle is over you can head further into the dome and enter an area similar in design to the think tank, although much more worn down. Also worn down is Dr. Mobius, another scientist in a think tank, but one in disarray. Talking to Mobius begins a long dialogue tree that sheds light on a lot of the goings on around the big empty and exactly why Mobius is doing what he's doing. To understand Mobius, we first need to understand a little bit more about the think tank as a secondary body and how it affects the minds of those within one. For each of the doctors in the big empty, it isn't that they simply forgot about their pasts over time. Rather, the think tank was programmed to cause some form of mild memory loss, having the individuals not forget the entirety of their past necessarily, but also forget enough to continue working and researching unobstructed. This also led to name changes for each of the think tank members. Now, while reading up on this and researching, I wasn't sure where Mobius' involvement begins and ends in terms of memory loss and recursion loops. It seems that the think tank technology always had the ability to cause memory loss and was designed to do as such, but was later utilized by Mobius to perform said functionality as a means of restricting the abilities of the doctors within. This is attributed to Mobius seemingly remembering very little about his human self while still retaining memories as to what he did to the think tank. What did Mobius do exactly? Well, believe it or not, but Night Stalkers and Cazadors both originated from the Big Empty, both created by Dr. Boris, who believes they solely exist within the crater and haven't escaped into the Mojave. During their post-war shenanigans, the scientists of the Big Empty continued to commit various experiments and scientific atrocities. Let's not forget the concentration camp I keep mentioning. With the escape of the Cazadors and Night Stalkers came the death of several scientists, leaving only those within the think tank alive alive. Mobius, disillusioned with the events as well as the actions of his fellow scientists, erected the radar fence around the Big Empty, trapping them within so they couldn't escape and commit said atrocities on a fresh batch of humanity within the Mojave and possibly the world. During a dispute, Mobius reprogrammed each of the Think Tank members so that they would believe the Big Empty was the only location left on the planet and remove their sense of time. This was later reignited by the discussions between the Think Tank, Elijah, and Ulysses. This apparently had side effects on their memory loops and created alternate corrupted personalities of their past, better explaining why they are so detached from their human selves. To bolster this, he renamed them with names representing loops. Dr. Dalla is a mandala, Dr. Zero a circle, and Dr. Boris for Ouroboros, which you can point out is a spelling error on Mobius's part. Then Dr. Eight as an infinity symbol, and Dr. Klein as a Klein bottle, look it up, and Dr. Mobius as a Mobius strip. Feeling guilt over his actions, Mobius also removed portions of his own memories before before moving to the Forbidden Zone in exile. While here, Mobius grew inspired by rad scorpions that had found their way into the crater, and began creating an army of robo-scorpions that he would use to intimidate and distract the think tank, believing that taking up their time would prevent them from ever caring about the radar fence, to which he was right mostly. The only reason things have gone awry in his plan is due to the visitors of the crater, Elijah, Christine, Ulysses, and now yourself. This also explains why Mobius would periodically call into the think tank, and spout aggressive, villainous nonsense nonsense while, in his own words, tripping on Psycho. It should be pointed out that by this point Mobius is a chem fiend, addicted most to Mentats, which he seems to love and offers you constantly. So how does the courier fall into this equation? Thanks to Benny and the damage done to our brain, the autodoc that extracted it was forced to improve the process, creating one of the cleanest surgeries to date, at the cost of needing to remove your spine and heart as well. As the procedure had left you with motor functions and cognition, the brain therefore had data stored within that would allow the group within the think tank to do the same for themselves. This is where the technologies come in, the sonic emitter and its spinal vibrations, the cardiac regulator within the stealth suit, and the antenna to transmit brainwaves could be used to control bodies that would allow the think tank to bypass the radar fence and travel the world. This worried Mobius, who believed the think tank would continue to commit atrocities across the wasteland, and thus he stole the brain and kept it locked within a container at the Forbidden Zone. Hence why we are here, Mobius believes that since you have the items in hand, the think tank will be fine if left alone but you can point out to him that they have downloaded the schematics and can rebuild them at will, making him realize his plan has failed, not that he really cares much anymore. The only missing piece then is your brain, which is in a container near you during the conversation. Mobius doesn't mind giving you the brain back, but mentions that it's possible the brain will not want to go back with you, explaining how it has its own personality outside of the host. Heading to the brain strikes up a conversation between you and it, with the brain being rather resentful and standoffish, blaming you and glands as the reason why so many bad things seem to come your way, such as Benny shooting you in the head. This leads to a very interesting back and forth where you
you can point out the illogic nature of the brain's resentment and how its capacity of thought regulates your decisions, considering the brain is the source of most of the glands it happens to be complaining about. After discussing the events of your travels, you come to terms with your brain and take it with you back to the think tank in order to confront the doctors within. By having your brain alongside you, you can bypass their pacification field that prevents you from attacking them, leaving you with a choice. Do you find a way to reason with the think tank, keeping them from leaving the crater to commit further atrocities, or do you simply kill them? Upon returning to the think tank, Dr. Klein will demand you hand over your brain so that they may use it to escape the crater. If you are looking to reason with them, you need to pass two fairly high skill checks and have completed the dialogue quest lines for the four other doctors. This will force Klein to confer with his colleagues, all of whom see you in a positive light and wish to support your decision. This leads Klein into being forced to agree and fairly bitter about it. However, you can promise to bring the outside in, bringing aspects of the wasteland to the big empty. So the think tank has new specimens or features for their experimentations, which Klein realizes he would enjoy very much. Whether you choose to reason with or kill the think tank, the DLC will end here, with the expected epilogue slideshow. Mobius mentions the purpose of the big empty, which was to build a future for mankind. However, the expansion narrative asks an important question. When has science gone too far, and is going far justified in the name of progress? There's a lot of philosophical debate over what progress means for society and whether or not it is an inherent good. We generally judge if something is good based on what makes us happy, and our happiness is dictated by perspective. You may be less happy than your ancestors who never had electricity, despite the fact that you get to live longer and potentially more comfortably. So then we are forced to ask what is justified in the name of progress. Many believe that the damage caused by capitalism to those failing within it is justified due to capitalism's success at creating progress. Similarly, some may believe the atrocities of unethical science may be justified due to its ability to push the boundaries of human biology and ability. At the end of the day, it's for you as the player to decide. The think tank are already too far gone to fully care about the ethical quandaries surrounding their experimentation. Only Mobius was able to fully realize this and act upon it, becoming a shell of his former self in the process. Upon completing the DLC, you are giving a transponder, which allows you to teleport back and forth from the Big Empty to the Mojave, allowing the location to act as a secondary headquarters similar to the Lucky 38, and also allow you to continue fully exploring the area if there is anything you fail to see during the main storyline. With Old World Blues out of the way, the courier has become borderline superhuman in nature. Depending on your allegiances, not only can you remove house to begin work on New Vegas's independence, you also have access to one of the most technologically advanced facilities in the world, and genius scientists who could potentially create whatever you want. With all of this at your fingertips, you may think it's time to deal with the Hoover Dam once and for all, deciding the fate of the Mojave, the NCR, and the Legion. But that isn't the case. Instead, there is one more location and DLC we need to run through, one where we get to meet the man we've heard so much about during our travels both within and outside of the expansion content. It's time to meet Ulysses on the Lonesome Road. Like the other DLCs in New Vegas, Lonesome Road offers a unique radio signal, this one of Ulysses contacting the courier specifically and promising him answers. The order in which you played through the New Vegas content may differ heavily from someone else, but the release order always seemed to be the proper sequence to me due to all of the build-up to this moment. Since we first heard of Ulysses and Prim as the man who gave up the delivery on the platinum chip so that we would instead take it, we have periodically heard him mentioned throughout our travels. This is true in the base game, but more prominent within the expansions. Ulysses is somewhat of an enigma to the player, and the entire draw of Lonesome Road is to have questions answered, to meet the living legend face to face, and potentially figure out why you were the one tasked with the Platinum Chip. Unlike the other DLC, entering into the Divide does not provide you with an opening prologue sequence. Instead, you are immediately set on a long, mostly linear path throughout the wrecked landscape along the I-15. The weather has always been particularly brutal within this location, and this is due to it being a man-made phenomenon via the Big Empty, explaining how Ulysses managed to track the weather patterns to their source and ultimately meet with the think tank. Lonesome Road is a journey. While there are many locations within and smaller areas to explore than one would be used to via the base game, it is a strictly linear, storyline-focused expansion to explain the backstory of Ulysses, to create backstory 
for The Courier, and ultimately act as a narrative climax for the four DLC released. I may have mentioned this before, but it's easy to consider New Vegas' storytelling as a form of television series. The journey to New Vegas is of one or two seasons, the adventures in Freeside another, and the actions within the Strip and Hoover Dam acting as its end. But within that, you have the four DLC acting each as their own movies that, while closely connected to the base game, are even more connected to one another. Before we talk about the journey at hand, it's good to describe the history of Ulysses partially. Ulysses, who didn't always go by said name, was a member of the Twisted Hairs tribe in Arizona. The tribe had an alliance with the then-growing Kaisar's Legion, but was ultimately betrayed by the faction and forced to assimilate in. This acted as a traumatic event for Ulysses, but he had formed such a strong dedication to Kaisar by the point of these events that he refused to betray him. In fact, this was the point in which Ulysses took on his new name, being a reference to Ulysses S. Grant, former president and commanding general of the Union Army in the American Civil War. This is due to Ulysses' obsession both with history but also the unification of warring states. Ulysses joined the ranks of Kaisar's Frumentari, and through being a talented scout of high intelligence, he managed to excel where many people could not. Kaisar specifically warned Ulysses not to kill other couriers on the road, as many turned out to be legionary spies similar to him. This would lead to a very strong mindset where Ulysses believed that couriers spilling the blood of other couriers simply didn't make sense, vowing not to kill you specifically, even though he has some unexplained vendetta against you. However, while Ulysses wouldn't seek out and kill you, he was fine with letting the land have its way, which explains partially why he made sure you received the platinum chip that would ultimately lead you to your grave in Good Springs. But there's more to it than that, and we will see why later on. For now, Ulysses was one of the first individuals to scout out the dam and report the information to Kaisar, who became obsessed with it, leading to the current conflict we see within the base game. Ulysses both saw the conflict start and also the initial failure of the Legion that led to Joshua Graham's punishment. Most of this information is divulged by Ulysses himself as you travel through the Divide, but there's more history surrounding him. However, since said information is tied both to the settings you travel and when Ulysses tells you about it, it's better to save the rest of his history as we progress through the DLC. At the start of the Divide, your only way to progress is by entering the Hopeville Missile Silo, which is part of the cracked and misshapen landscape that has caused a post-war disaster some years ago. Within the silo, you will see several corpses of marked men, a faction within the wastes of the Divide that originates from both NCR and Legion troop, but who have set their differences aside after surviving a nuclear event that left them irradiated and their skin flayed. The marked men are are technically the main forces you will be running into during your journey through the Divide, as this is essentially their home, but you still have to deal with several security robots, death claws, and a unique enemy type called Tunnelers, which we will get into a bit later. Also within the silo is a Duraframe iBot that is a copy of your personal companion in the base game, Eddie. While you will first mistake the iBot for Eddie, it becomes more apparent that the technology within the Divide was able to scan and clone your personal Eddie in order to make several iBots that seem to be repairing missiles within the several silos around the Divide. Eddie is incredibly useful and important within this expansion. Not only is he your companion for the majority of the journey, but he is a key tool used for unlocking specific modules and doors along the way. In fact, since there are no shops, you need to use Eddie to unlock commissary terminals that will allow you to buy and sell goods as well as repair equipment. During your travels, you can find several broken iBots, and by searching them for parts, you can find unique upgrades for Eddie that will actually transfer over to your personal version in the Mojave once the DLC is completed. Additionally, Eddie will play several comms of his time with Dr. Whitley, his creator, as well as his travels to Navarro. To exit the silo, you are forced to power it up in order to open a nearby door and exit into Hopeville proper, a town ravaged by the Divide and home to many marked men. Upon exiting said silo, Eddie's intercom is taken over by Ulysses, making this the first time you've ever been in contact with the individual and able to communicate. This is also where we get a taste of Ulysses' mindset and feelings towards the courier. There's clear resentment in his words. While Ulysses doesn't believe in killing other couriers on the road, he wants you in a situation that is likely to lead to your death. 
hence why he refused the platinum chip when offered the delivery job. Ulysses also mentions that there are several more missiles underground just waiting to be awoken, similar to the one you had just powered on in the Hopeville silo. What's more confusing from a design perspective is what Ulysses continues to talk about, specifically your past. The biggest issue with Lonesome Road is not that Ulysses is against you, but his reasons for being this way. The point of playing Lonesome Road is to get answers, answers about your past specifically, and why Ulysses seems to hate you, even if he states otherwise. This is contrary to how open-ended the beginning of New Vegas was, and doesn't lend itself well to the more open role-playing experience. At the start of New Vegas, we are a courier on a job. How we got there is completely up to you. You get to shape your past and reasoning for being where you are currently, which allows you more freedom in how you view yourself within the setting of the Mojave. But Lonesome Road feels like it was forced to go against this open backstory ideology, and we begin to see this as Ulysses explains he witnessed you being a courier for quite some time. In fact, you were one of the only couriers willing to make the trek from the Mojave to the burgeoning nation known as the Divide, not to be confused with the current divide we are located in. This is due to the poor weather preventing individuals from wanting to traverse the area. In Ulysses' eyes, you are the sole reason this nation was born as you allowed them to be contacted with the outside world. And in a way, this place was once your metaphorical home, but this is confusing for several reasons. For one, why would the developers want to give your customized character a more concrete backstory? Moreover, why are most of your dialogue options that of confusion and lack of memory? It's as if your courier has no recollection of these events or making this very dangerous trek through the weather of the divide, so you end up being left as a player very confused as to what you did to make this random courier slash legionnaire have such a disdain for you and want to see you suffer. It's a bit of a mess, and throughout the journey and learning about your past, you're basically forced to say, okay, I guess that happened, even if you mentally set yourself up otherwise at the start of the game and through your travels. This decision doesn't make sense, but it's at least somewhat understandable why the developers had to shape this narrative as it was in the making since the base release, and they needed something outside of the base gameplay to give Ulysses motivation for contacting you and also giving you the chip. There has to be something from before getting shot in the head that gives him motivation to hurt you and that sticks the story writers in a trap of being forced to expand upon your character's backstory, even if it doesn't make sense to. As I said, it's a bit of a trap that was set the moment we heard about Ulysses and Prim. If instead we heard about his exploits and he was in no way related to how we got the chip, Ulysses' motivations could have been based on how we acted within the Mojave presently, within the base game, but that opens up its own can of worms. You can start the DLC at any time, meaning Ulysses needs a motivating factor right away, right when you start playing, and that means filling up your backstory with some pre-generated history. It's like walking on a tightrope and trying to balance narrative freedom while also creating an antagonist that feels personal for the player, and it's not that easy a thing to do in open-world role-playing experiences like New Vegas. Ulysses informs you that to progress through the Divide, you need to gain access to a laser detonator that will allow you to blow up several warheads throughout your journey. Some of these are mandatory as they allow you to progress, while others open up optional explorable areas to help you find loot. Traveling into Hopeville proper will have you begin combat against the marked men for the first time, but there aren't many in the area. Instead, upon finding and taking the detonator, a large force of them will spawn in randomly and immediately run to your location. This seems to be for dramatic effect, but ultimately goes against the player's freedom of gameplay by forcing you into conflict. The marked men know exactly when you grab the detonator, and they also know exactly where you are. Instead of spawning them in at the start, it would have been better to have them littered across the town, giving you the option to sneak your way to the detonator or to take the faction head on. While the journey of Lonesome Road is linear in nature, the gameplay within each major area doesn't need to be, and it shouldn't be. Regardless of this fault, which we'll see a lot, the, the only thing you can really do is press forward through Hopeville, blowing up nuclear warheads along the way. Each warhead will produce a radius of radiation that falls over time. Radiation is a more prevalent problem within this DLC, but it is dealt with through finding an abundance of Radex and Radaway as you travel. There's also a new breather mask that can be equipped to offer a level of rad resistance to the player. The next stop is a collapsed overpass tunnel where we get a glimpse of a Deathclaw running by. Upon chasing after it, we see said Deathclaw move off screen only for a roar to be heard and a tunneler emerging from the same area. If you head into where the Deathclaw was, you will find that it's dead. This is our first experience with tunnelers, and this event is used to portray that they are potentially 
potentially deadlier than Deathclaws overall, though I believe from a mechanical sense that a Deathclaw is still more dangerous within the game. After fighting your way through several waves of tunnelers, you find yourself on the high road, a long stretch of highway far above the ground below. Ulysses once again contacts you here to divulge more of his history with the area, the NCR, and you. In some aspects, Ulysses is very on point with his observations of the NCR. At one point he mentions how the Republic has an idea of what is right, but never seems to actually get there, pointing out Nipton as an example, as Nipton was an area the NCR generally avoided and ultimately led to the town being sacked by the Legion. He goes on to talk about the NCR and Legion's obsession with the dam. Instead of helping people, the NCR instead spread itself thin to both hold the dam and as much territory as possible. This wasn't just the NCR, however. Kaisar too became obsessed with the dam and its potential for taking over the Mojave, and this has in turn led to a conflict where neither side is looking to do or even perform good, but instead win territory and power. Ulysses goes on to talk about the road you are said to have made via traveling along the I-15 constantly to the area within the divide before it fell apart, and through creating this road via traversing the area constantly, the NCR couldn't help but swoop in and take over as they are known to do. And where there is NCR, there is Legion, looking to take whatever the NCR has. Ulysses saw the divide as a once prosperous area that was on track to grow into its own nation of similar size and power to the NCR and Legion if not better. But through creating value via the Courier's Trail, it soon became the site of factions currently greater than it and ultimately led the divide into becoming just like the rest of the Mojave, tools for the use of greater powers who don't actually seem to care about the people within. After traversing the high road, you make it to the city of Ashton, but to progress further you need to enter its silo which is locked. The only way to unlock it is by activating a nearby control panel with Eddie. This in turn powers up one of the dormant nuclear warheads and launches it back towards Hopeville. This actually opens up an optional irradiated area full of death claws and marked men that you can travel back to near Hopeville. The main reason for doing so being a large supply of high power ammunition and several healing items. Ulysses names this area the Courier's Mile as you are the creator of the path there due to you launching the missile. Ulysses knew you would be forced to launch the missile even if it was unknowingly. It is supposed to be both a lesson and example of the travesty you are thought to have caused here, but what exactly did you do? As a courier, the NCR had you deliver a package recovered from the Legion to be brought to the Divide for study as the symbols on the package matched old world symbols within the community and their silos. As the one delivering the package, you had no idea of what was inside. It was simply another job, but by delivering this package, you essentially doomed the community there. The package contained a device and, once opened, the device turned on and began to speak in the form of an active signal which seemed to activate many of the missiles below the area in their various silos. As the missiles activated, they in turn blew up and led to several high magnitude earthquakes which quickly reshaped the area, filled it with radiation, and killed the majority of individuals living there. This event then led to the creation of the Marked Men who dropped their allegiances to form a new faction that only cared about weaponry and death from afar. Ulysses witnessed you delivering the package and witnessed the destruction that followed. He was only saved as several medical robots assumed he was military due to the old world flag painted on the back of his duster. This is why Ulysses blames the courier for what happened, even if unknowingly the courier had the choice to deliver the package, the same way they had a choice to activate the missile silo moments ago. At any of these points, the courier could have turned around and forgotten all about this, but as we are playing through this storyline, it is clear there is difficulty in letting go, a lesson learned in dead money. In fact, Ulysses will mention many iconic themes from the previous DLCs, letting go and beginning again being some of the major ones, but also quoting who are you who does not know history, something he mentioned to the think tank during his time there. In a way, Lonesome Road looks to converge all of the themes from the previous DLC into one, showing how the events of said expansion shaped Ulysses as they have shaped you. Ulysses hasn't been able to let go of you, or begin again. He also resents the fast nation modern society has with the old world, referencing old world blues. The question is then, can one be redeemed from their past? Similar to Joshua Graham, the courier has apparently had a hand in an atrocity. Whether they knew about it or not, can they be redeemed at all? Through that, we have come to one of the main themes of Lonesome Road overall, choice. You have a choice in everything you do, and that choice, even unknowingly, can lead to terrible consequences for many. Should you be held accountable for that? Ulysses would say yes, and this is is his way of showing us. We didn't have to come to the Divide, but we couldn't let go of the mystery of Ulysses. We didn't have to launch the warhead, but we had to travel further and multiple other scenarios to show how you always
always have the choice of stopping. You always have the ability to turn around and go back, potentially stopping future consequences in the process. It's an interesting ideology, but not one without its own flaws. Everyone has choices in their lives, and many are blind to the consequences that might follow, and rightly so. We are not necessarily in control of an essential butterfly effect that may transpire over a courier accepting a routine delivery job. Is it the responsibility of a courier, the effects of a package that they deliver? Not really, but there is negligence involved. We all make choices, but there are ways for us to try and mitigate the negative consequences. Should the courier have delivered the package without getting more information on it first? Does the fact that nobody knew what the device did lend less blame onto those who delivered it to the divide? It's a philosophical question on the concepts of blame and justice. Ulysses would say the courier is at fault. I'd lean more into saying that this is the further failings of the NCR and their overall incompetence. After the events of the missiles exploding, Ulysses returned to Kaisar to see how the first battle of Hoover Dam had failed. After this, he was tasked with teaching the White Legs in Zion Canyon how to fight, and ultimately led them into the sacking of New Canaan, and leading into the events of Honest Hearts. The White Legs revered Ulysses to the point that they started wearing their hair in dreads as he did, although not realizing it was a symbol of Ulysses' old tribe, the Twisted Hairs. This sparked something in Ulysses, and he ultimately left the canyon and Kaisar for good before beginning to travel as a rancher and courier in the wastes. Ulysses wanted to find a way to have America be successful for the future of humanity, and believed that neither the NCR nor the Legion had this answer. This search and his travels eventually led him to learning about the Sierra Madre and making it to the Big Empty where he met with Elijah and saved Christine. When the delivery notice came for the Platinum Chip, Ulysses saw the courier's dame. This was quite the shock considering Ulysses assumed the courier died within the destruction of the Divide. But as this was not the case, he now felt motivation to take the courier's life into his own hands, or at least set him down as dangerous a path as he could. This leads to the true reasoning behind Ulysses calling you to the Divide. In the same way you destroyed Ulysses' home before his very eyes, Ulysses looks to do the same within the Mojave by nuking the NCR and essentially cutting their throat, allowing the Legion to push in, believing that the faction would die off naturally, leading to a true future for America. We'll see how he attempts to bring this to fruition shortly. After exploring Ashton, Ulysses will contact you one final time, explaining that he needed you to make this trek so that he could get a hold of the iBot, which essentially had the same functionality as the device you had delivered previously. Using this eddy, Ulysses would be able to ready and arm several missiles to launch into the Mojave. Using a passphrase, Ulysses manages to override Eddie's systems and force him to leave the courier to head for his temple. You'll have to fight or sneak your way through more marked men and death claws as you approach the temple, which is the largest nuclear silo in the area. Upon entering, you can search the area to find Eddie locked within and optionally rescue him before confronting Ulysses. If you don't rescue Eddie at this point, a potential ending is locked off from you. When you confront Ulysses for the first and final time, he can be seen standing with his back to the player as multiple missiles are being prepared for launch. His old world flag displayed prominently on his back and hanging above. There's two options at this point. You either have to fight Ulysses or reason with him. Fighting him is self-explanatory and leads to one of the more involved boss encounters in New Vegas. As for reasoning with him, you need to pass several speech checks leading up to a check of 100, which can be lowered to 90 if you have a high reputation with either the NCR Legion or the Strip. Alternatively, you can convince him through dialogue choices if you found all of Ulysses' six journal entries or if you found all of the upgrades grades for Eddie. I did neither of these during this playthrough, but did have a high enough speech skill that it didn't matter. In terms of the discussion, Ulysses believes that whether or not you caused these events by accident, he is now doing the same with purpose. This is in comparison to you who caused events based on chance and ignorance. Ulysses believes he has found enlightened purpose and holds great resentment for the NCR as they follow an old world symbol while seemingly having no knowledge of the history surrounding it. He thus wants to rid the land of the West, a aka the NCR. It's Ulysses' goal to remove the flag of the NCR so only one flag may wave over the Mojave, and then witness either its success or self-destruction. The player can reason with Ulysses by explaining that there is no need to remove the NCR in such catastrophic fashion. Ulysses already knows that one person can make or break a nation, and you happen to be that one person, an individual who has killed House and who is looking to push out both the Legion and the NCR for true independence. It is the flag of New Vegas then that will fly, and not the flags of the NCR or the Legion. At least if you are going that route. If not, you can basically suggest that your efforts can be used to strengthen one of the factions you have aligned with, thus making Ulysses' plan effectively useless
pointless and unnecessary. Regardless of if you fight Ulysses or convince him, the countdown has already begun and will be fairly difficult to stop. Before you can even worry about that though, several waves of marked men will make their way inside for one final battle, either with Ulysses at your side or not. Once the battle is complete, you can take a look at the terminal to figure out what can be done about the launch. Since the launch can't be stopped, it can only be redirected either towards NCR territory, Legion territory, or both. And choosing one or both of these options will allow you to travel to specific locations in the Mojave to find ghoulified versions of that faction. These locations are essentially added to the world map and locked off until you choose to create a second apocalypse. To get the highest possible loot, you'd need to nuke both. This leads to severe reputation loss with the chosen factions, but there are ways around it to make sure you still end up positive by the end of the game. Alternatively, Eddie can offer to work through the terminal's encryption and end the countdown. However, it is pointed out by Eddie that such heavy encryption would likely overload his processors and destroy him. You can agree to have Eddie do this and watch as the surrounding area begins to blow up, and Eddie soon after it. Once completed, you can exit the temple for the epilogue sequence, which mentions that Eddie transferred his memories to the original model back in the Mojave. Ulysses, meanwhile, continued to traverse and live within the divide, assuming you reasoned with him. For stopping an apocalypse, you'll gain a large level of reputation for both the followers of the apocalypse and the Brotherhood. As an added reward, you can gain Ulysses' duster and breather mask, as well as your own custom duster, where the logo on the back is based on your faction reputation. In this example, I had the two-headed bear. You also get one additional special stat. You can head back to the divide whenever you please. If Ulysses is alive, you can speak to him near the entrance and discuss a few topics involving the relevant factions. Additionally, you can report to him your killing of Kaisar and Mr. House. I assume you can also mention messing with the NCR if you have, but I wasn't able to verify this. Overall, Lonesome Road as a DLC was a bit of a flop in my eyes. It was overall better than Honest Hearts and with decent messaging. I don't think that the linearity of the DLC hurt it at all either. The combat within, especially in the finale, is almost better than the finale of the base game itself, but this hardly makes up for such an atrociously designed storyline that can effectively subvert any of your planned backstory for your courier. That being said, the themes involved and its messaging are the more defining factors of the narrative and what you are supposed to take away from your experience. The culmination of themes within three separate storylines meet their climax in Lonesome Road, and it's your journey to Ulysses that makes it as satisfying as it is. Overall, Lonesome Road is an imperfect conclusion to the DLC storyline, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Instead, it's just not as great as it could have been. At least it wasn't Honest Hearts. So where do we go from here? Well, there's still some cleanup to do in the Mojave before the finale of the game and this retrospective. We need to travel back to the Strip and meet up with Kaisar himself to better analyze the Legion overall, something I've been saving until the end. And while we have discussed the NCR in great detail, there's still a few things we can do for them that will help both Freeside and the Brotherhood overall before we effectively kick the Republic out. If you don't remember, after killing Benny, we are given an invitation to meet with Kaisar. Doing so with the chip in our possession will cause him to confiscate it, but this opens up an opportunity to see some of his dialogue and better understand Kaiser's ideology. Before he will talk to you in detail, however, Kaiser wants you to prove yourself by taking the chip to a nearby bunker and finding out what is inside. The chip is both a data drive and a key to open said bunker, meaning Kaiser has no idea what is inside, and this upsets him. Considering it is connected to the Lucky 38, he would rather just see that what was inside be destroyed, and he tasks you with doing so. For the sake of it, I went through the motion so we could discuss with Kaiser further. We'll revisit what's in the bunker shortly. Through these discussions, we can get some insight into Kaiser's past as a member of the Followers. We've already heard much of this from Joshua Graham. Kaiser was an ally within the Followers, visited a tribe, and hired Joshua as a translator. This eventually led to said tribe capturing the three men and Kaiser opting to teach them how to fight and the concept of militancy, which Joshua stayed around for as Kaiser's right hand man. Over the years, this grew as Kaiser conquered more and more tribes, becoming the Legion as we know of it currently. When discussing the NCR, Kaiser has a lot to say on the subject. In a faction known to run via democracy, it seems more like a dictatorship in Kaiser's eyes. One of the former presidents, President Tandy, ran as president for 52 years, and the president before her happened to be her father. Kaiser calls this a hereditary dictatorship. Unlike modern day America, there is no limit to one's presidency as long as they are not voted out. However, while democracy may be flawed, to call it a dictatorship is an extreme. Similar to 
America, Canadians have to vote for their prime minister. But similar to the NCR, there is no limit to how long the prime minister may stay in office. Outside of cheating, it is the power of the voters who decide the next individual to be in charge, at least in theory. I'm not defending democracy here, as I believe the electoral process, no matter where in the world, has several extreme flaws that lead to the suffering of the citizens within, especially the marginalized, but it's important to understand that Kaiser feels this way to an absolute extreme, considering the NCR to be a dictatorship which is disingenuous. But he considers democracy a weakness rather than a strength, and there is something to be said about that in a different video that I am not smart enough to put into words. The point of this is that Kaiser believes the NCR to be weak and he to be strong. He values strength above all else and uses strength to impose his will on anyone and everyone he believes he could take advantage of. In a way, this is the same ideology of the NCR who impose their will on various locations they deem worthwhile. And as I pointed out far back to the beginning of the retrospective, the NCR and the Legion both commit atrocities, both use slavery to their advantage, even if the NCR paints it as a nicer picture than it really is. They are inherently two sides of the same coin, a term I've been using excessively throughout this retrospective, but each faction thinks they are different from their opponent. Similar to Ulysses, Kaiser isn't interested in reviving Old World America, believing it to be inherently flawed. Instead, he uses his knowledge from Old World history books to base his legion off of Roman culture, specifically because of how alien it would be to those who have encountered it. He specifically believed that the autocracy of Rome could withstand the post-apocalyptic wastes of the world better than Old World democracy and created a Pax Romana, or homogenous culture that removes the identity of all of those it conquers. Individuals hold no value outside of what they bring to the state. Their happiness, their values, nothing matters in this system, and suffering is just a means to an end, an actual end to freedom of the individual, unlike what we see many right-leaning individuals parading as freedom in the news. What follows is one of the reasons you may see some individuals online think highly of Kaiser, as he brings up Hegelian dialectics, a philosophical term that suggests history is made up of dialectic conflicts. When a dialectic or a nation rises, it comes with it a thesis that forms its growth and values. And through creating a thesis, you generate an antithesis, an opposition to a nation's belief and values. Kaiser believes the conflict between the two is inevitable, and thus sees his conflict with the NCR, the thesis, to be an inevitability with the Legion, the antithesis. He believes that the outcome of the conflict generates a synthesis, something new. When two worlds collide, the resulting victor will be changed by the conflict. However, Kaiser believes this synthesis simply strips the flaws of each into something better, and it should be noted that his reasoning is not only insane, but simply false. Kaiser believes the bombs wiped the slate clean, and thus generated cultures that fell into the same flaws as ancient civilizations. Therefore, he believes he must combat the NCR's culture with his own in order to generate something stronger. But war doesn't do this. While we of the modern day know of progress, capitalism, and science, many of these are built off of the blood of others, to the point that they become superpowers with suffering within. Consider that wars and conflict do not create a positive synthesis for everyone, they simply create suffering. When the North American people win a war and take over land that isn't theirs, is the result the synthesis of that combat? Are people not continuing to suffer? Is the resulting synthesis then better than what once was? That depends on the values of the victor. It's an inherent flaw within the philosophy of Kaiser's thought process. This synthesis is only better if the Legion wins against the NCR. He doesn't even consider the other outcomes within the scenario. This seems to be a flaw within his reasoning that many people miss when reading through his dialogue. Some believe Kaiser makes a broad philosophical point about the clash of imposing cultures, but really all it is is personal justification for the atrocities he wishes to commit in order to take over the Mojave. Kaiser wants to rule, and he wants to be powerful. All of his philosophical nonsense and reasoning is just an excuse so that he can feel less bad about it, to justify it. And it's actually crazy to me how well this convinces some 
some people that play through the game. It actually helps explain why so many people fall down the Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson rabbit hole, because no matter how idiotic or insane their thought processes are, if they can speak well and bring up a little philosophy that seems to support them only on a surface level, many will flock to them as if they were geniuses. And no amount of philosophical justification will ever convince me that the Legion's actions make sense, that slavery or genocide are okay within any capacity, that some sort of synthesis that wouldn't even come to be could be worth all of the suffering countless people have been subjected to by these two factions. The NCR is flawed and so is the Legion. The Legion is much more outwardly evil. You see it easier in their actions than you do in the NCR because the NCR is what many of us have grown up with. It's an inherent part of our culture and is thus easier to mask the disgusting inner workings, even though they are there. Still, to say the Legion weren't actively doing more harm than the NCR would be disingenuous. They are truly evil, and Kaiser would never be able to convince me otherwise no matter how well-read or well-spoken he happens to be, which means it's time to put an end to his reign of terror forever. Kaiser's death does not mark the end of the Legion, but it is a historical event that will be commented on by NPC individuals, your companions, and Radio New Vegas. With him gone, it's up to his legate Lanius to push for the dam and finish what Kaiser started, meaning the Battle of Hoover Dam is still upcoming and we need to prepare for it. To do so, we need to discuss the factions with Yes Man and hit up the bunker in the Legion Fort, but before that, let's finish up the work we can do with the NCR to hopefully lead to the best outcome for everyone after we push them out of Vegas. On the road to protecting the dam from Legion forces, there's a few things to take care of involving the NCR. After stepping out of the Lucky 38, you receive an invitation to visit Ambassador Dennis Crocker, who has a few tasks for us that similarly align with Yes Man's tasks as well. In fact, within this endgame state, any major faction you align with essentially wants the same thing. Meet with the various factions around New Vegas, gain their allegiance, or get rid of them if necessary. It's pretty much the same steps word for word no matter if you're siding with the Legion, the NCR, or Mr. House, which is a little disappointing. While we can't blame Obsidian for not being able to fully flesh out each faction's endings, a recurring theme in terms of New Vegas' developmental touch on near the end, the fact remains that the endgame of New Vegas would feel more replayable if the ending quest lines for each faction were a little bit more unique. At the very least, there is some nuance to the dialogue choices. For example, Ambassador Crocker asks for our aid in making contact with the Boomers and securing their help for the Battle of Hoover Dam, we can essentially lie and say that we have not only already met them, but they plan to help us, but mostly just individually. Like, the individual us. Following this, Crocker will ask us to deal with violence against NCR residents in Freeside, something we already have dealt with partially and have experience in. Crocker suggests assassinating Pacer, but there's an ace up your sleeve if you saved your favor from the king after helping him out. Speaking to the king is simple enough at this point. You can suggest he help quell the violence against the NCR residents, and he'll oblige after a little convincing as long as you still have the favor owed. This is the cleanest and easiest way to solve this diplomatically, as it doesn't lead to a firefight. If we don't have the favor, we can go through Colonel Shu, who offers the king NCR support, but only if the courier asks politely. If the king agrees, Pacer tries to stage a coup and dies in the process. Killing the king through this questline also seems to be the only way to obtain his unique outfit, and to this day I have never done this nor do I plan to. Once those two quests are complete, Crocker will send you to continue work for the NCR through Colonel Moore at the dam. Crocker is depicted as a diplomatic side of the NCR. While he offers you non-diplomatic options, he seems content when violence isn't the answer. Colonel Moore is the other side of this. She shows unwavering support for the NCR and believes war and violence to be the most effective and somehow justified answer to a situation. This is the most prevalent in a moment, but first Moore asks us to deal with the cons. Luckily for us, the cons are already planning to leave the Mojave when the battle starts, so there's less running around to do there. Colonel Moore then has issues with the Omertas, and wouldn't you know it, we already dealt with that too. What about Mr. House? Already dead. However, the next step is to deal with the Brotherhood. We are already a member of the Brotherhood of Steel, unbeknownst to Colonel Moore, and we can use our standing with Father McNamara to convince him into a temporary truce. It's important that it's McNamara, as Hardin will refuse to ever create an alliance, hence why we never dealt with 
with his optional side of the Brotherhood questline that involved ousting McNamara. It's little things like that which can make New Vegas feel truly special. A decision you made hours of playtime ago may suddenly be more impactful now before you even realize it. You can return with this news to Moore, who is furious at the idea, but ultimately accepts. This earns you a negligible amount of NCR infamy due to the troops' disdain for the Brotherhood, but overall it helps quell violence in the epilogue. What follows is a quest called You'll Know It When It Happens, and this is sort of the point of no return for factions. What do I mean by that? Well, if you side with one major faction over the other, like I mentioned previously, you will gain a quest that explains moving too far ahead with one will lock you out of the other. Since we sided with Yes Man, we have already received this warning with both the NCR and the Legion, although we have failed the Legion completely by killing Kaisar. For the NCR, this quest will not fail until we get to the same point with Yes Man as we are with the NCR, in effect, you'll know it when it happens. This is because said quest is the last true main scenario quest before heading to the Battle of Hoover Dam, so let's discuss how we get there via Yes Man. Remember how I mentioned that bunker in the Legion Fort? Yes Man would like us to head over there if we see fit and install the platinum chip into a console designed specifically for it. Then we can travel through said bunker to come face to face with an army of disabled Securitrons. Not only are we able to activate said army, but they'll be installed with their Mark II OS, meaning we have essentially activated our own robotic army that can be used to pressure out the NCR after we have dealt with the Legion. This hasn't locked us out of the NCR just yet, but returning to Yes Man and giving him your opinion on all of the factions will. Yes Man is happy to hear how you dealt with all the issues involving the various factions, but most concerning to him is the temporary alliance between the Brotherhood and the NCR, as he believes they'll really want to get rid of him. Luckily for us, we are a member of the Brotherhood, and our goals to create an independent Vegas do not seem to give the Brotherhood reason to turn against us. With all of the factions dealt with, Yes Man informs us that President Aaron Kimball of the NCR will be stopping by the dam to give a speech. Here Mr. House has calculated that there was a high percentage chance of his assassination, should the president die, there would be no scapegoat to blame for the NCR's failures to hold the dam, either from the Legion or ourselves, meaning NCR residents would turn against the Strip. By keeping the president alive, he will effectively be ousted once we finish things at the dam. Despite not being able to finish the main NCR quest line, we are still on good terms with them, meaning they will allow us to help protect the president and there's several things to look into and take care of to ensure his safety. For one, an engineer within the dam has gone missing, meaning there is a legionary assassin dressed like said engineer. You can confirm this by finding a bloodstain in a closet and talking to one of the other engineers who says her friend has gone missing. Additionally, you can find evidence that one of the sniper spots will be used to attempt to kill the president from afar. Once you have an idea on all of the potential threats, you can report to Ranger Grant who will inform you that the president is arriving via Vertibird. Having high standing with the NCR allows you to access all of the off-limit sections of the dam, including the helipad. Heading up will allow you to witness an engineer placing something on the Vertibird as it lands. If you pickpocket this man, you can find a detonator on him. Additionally, if you check the vertebrate, you will find a bomb that can be removed with an appropriate skill check. Questioning the engineer with evidence is enough to get him to attack you, thus ending the ceremony. If you didn't, he would have attempted to kill the president during his speech. Additionally, a sniper in a nearby tower will be murdered if you don't intervene and replaced with a legionary dressed up as NCR. Depending on the timing of the events, this sniper also has the opportunity to assassinate the president and should be dealt with. Once the president President is safely escorted to the Vertibird, the quest is complete, and Kimball is considered saved, but we aren't done yet. Yes Man also suggests setting up an override chip in a nearby substation run by the NCR that will allow control of the Securitron army beyond the Strip. You can enter here peacefully in a few ways, namely using a stealth boy or dressing up as the NCR. Any other way is considered trespassing and will lead to violence. Finally, there is one final optional thing to take care of, convincing the followers of the Apocalypse to support an independent Vegas. You you need to talk to Julie Farkas for this, who will only agree if you completed the unmarked quests of giving her enough medical supplies. Julie will be apprehensive of the idea, as they can barely handle the people in Freeside, but you can promise to keep supplying her as you plan to remove the NCR from the equation, allowing her to accept. All that's left now is the Battle of Hoover Dam. Yes Man gives us two options on how to win the battle. We can either install a module that will divert power from the dam to our own Securitron army on standby, or we can destroy the generators to make the dam effectively useless. Since the dam is useful overall to the lives of those in the Mojave, it makes more sense to keep it running, meaning that'll be your main goal when running through the final sequence. Once you confirm you are ready for the battle, you will be transported to the dam with any companions you have activated at the time. The events of said battle are a means of showcasing the various decisions you made over 
the course of your playthrough. For example, since we have the Securitron army, we will see various Securitrons fighting by our side. Additionally, helping the boomers will show the bomber flying across the dam and dropping multiple bombs around the surrounding area. In order to progress the quest, you need to head into the dam proper in order to install Yes Man into the systems involved with powering the generators. Unfortunately, it's guarded by two NCR heavy troopers who won't let you in, but you can pass a speech check informing them one of the colonels is in danger. Once installed, you simply need to exit out of the east door, which will allow you to progress further down the dam. As you exit, you will see a vertebird fly by and land in front of you, as the remnants make themselves known and help with the final push against the Legion. It's a good display of all the work you've done, and one that's better than a simple slideshow, although we do still get our epilogue slideshow at the end of the game. Upon entering the Legion stronghold, you will come face to face with Kaisar's top legate Lanius. You can either best him in battle or convince him to surrender, but the outcome will ultimately be the same. Once dealt with, you can head back to the Legion stronghold's entrance, which will blow up, revealing several NCR veterans and General Lee Oliver, who commends you on a job well done. Unfortunately for Oliver, the army of Securitrons are soon to follow, and you can discuss with Oliver how you are kicking the NCR out of New Vegas to form an independent nation. Oliver will argue with you, which can either lead to him leaving peacefully, although upset, or violently. You can even throw him off the dam if you choose. With the Legion dealt with, the dam secured, and the NCR on their way out from Vegas, the nation earns its independence on the back of a lone courier who started the game by being shot in the head, and can end the game being virtually superhuman in nature. Yes Man congratulates you on your victory, and like I mentioned previously, informs you that he found software that will allow him to be more assertive in the future. In the meantime, he'll be going offline, but the Securitrons will continue to protect New Vegas. Rather than going into all of the epilogue content, I'll let you see firsthand how this retrospective's playthrough played out. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again, and the Mojave Wasteland was forever changed. The courier, with the aid of Yes Man, drove both the Legion and the NCR from Hoover Dam, securing New Vegas' independence from both factions. With Mr. House out of the picture, part of the Securitron army was diverted to the Strip to keep order. Any chaos on the streets was ended. Quickly. Chaos became uncertainty, then acceptance with minimal loss of life. New Vegas assumed its position as an independent power in the Mojave. Preferring neither the best of the NCR nor the worst of the Legion, the Courier was the man responsible for a truly independent New Vegas. He had removed Mr. House from power over the Strip and broken the influence of the NCR and Caesar's Legion in the Mojave Wasteland. Tabitha and Rhonda went east, through Caesar's land. Occasionally, tales of their exploits found their way back west, though few believed them. Eventually, the stories concerning the duo were collected and published, and proved to be quite popular with children. Invigorated by his travels with the courier, Raul once more took up his guns in memory of his lost Rafaela. Soon after, the Mojave was filled with tales of the ghost vaquero who hunts down those who prey on the weak. Though the wasteland became anarchic after Hoover Dam, the boomer's display of power dissuaded fortune seekers from attempting to penetrate Nellis. Due to their temporary truce, the Brotherhood allowed the NCR to retreat from the Mojave wasteland without incident. In the relative peace that followed, Brotherhood patrols appeared along major roads, harassing travelers over any bits of technology they had. Despite her departure from the group, the Brotherhood's peace treaty with NCR came as some relief to Veronica. Though she remained friendly with surface patrols, she was never again permitted to enter the bunker she once called home. Fearing for the safety of anyone she associated with, she continued her solitary life as a scavenger. But reports would emerge from Mojave scientists and social workers of old equipment miraculously repaired and research notes mysteriously completed. Their leaders destroyed by the courier, the fiends scattered throughout the wasteland. Without the organization of Motor Runner, Cook Cook, Violet, and Driver Nephi, they were easy prey. After the courier ensured New Vegas remained free, the followers found that independent Vegas was even more unstable and violent than before. Old Mormon Fort became excessively burdened by the influx of patients, struggling to provide even the most basic of services. 
Arcade was proud to have been one of the defenders who helped repel the Legion from Hoover Dam. He was prouder still to see the area freed from the shackles of the NCR and Mr. House. Though independence for New Vegas was not all he hoped it could be, Arcade used his enclave knowledge and technology to keep order wherever he could. With New Vegas' independence formally declared, Good Springs thrived. More travelers stopped by Good Springs on their way to and from the Strip, and the locals grew prosperous from the traffic. In the years following the destruction of Cassidy Caravans, NCR used evidence of the plot to blackmail the Crimson Caravan and the Van Graffs. NCR enacted strict trade laws with little resistance, strengthening their supply lines and their position in the Mojave. Cass lived to see the courier bring down three armies, and by her count, that was three more than she'd expected. She kept quiet about that, though. During the Battle of Hoover Dam, the Great Khans quickly evacuated Red Rock Canyon and headed north and east into the plains of Wyoming. There, they reconnected with the followers of the Apocalypse and rebuilt their strength. Bolstered by ancient knowledge of governance, economics, and transportation, they carved a mighty empire out of the ruins of the Northwest. Thanks to the Courier and Lily, a cure for the Nightkin schizophrenia was found shortly after Dr. Henry's experiment concluded. Nightkin and other super mutants in the wasteland flocked to Jacobstown, and the town became known as a haven where a mutant could find peace. Encouraged by the courier to take her medication regularly, Lily's mind eventually attained a semblance of clarity. Her memories dulled by the pills, she cast aside the recording of her grandchildren, no longer remembering its significance. Following the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, Freeside came to be known as one of the more stable areas in the region. Ironically, NCR refugees found Freeside safer than most of the rest of New Vegas, where resentment still lingers. Revitalized by Violetta's brain, Rex eventually learned to balance the memories of his old life with Violetta's experiences among the brutal fiends. His mind had difficulty adjusting, but Rex eventually found peace with his new, more vicious self. Shaped up by the Courier's advice, the misfits distinguished themselves during the Legion's attack on Camp Golf. Mags was finally promoted to sergeant, and the rest of the misfits received an official commendation. They continued to serve with distinction for many years. Though Novak was a low-priority target for the Legion, many of Novak's citizens died in its defense. In the weeks that followed, Several bright followers returned to Novak to help restore its defenses, allowing it to remain independent of NCR. Though NCR was withdrawing from the region, Boone remained in New Vegas, finding work as a security guard and caravan scout along the highways. While he might have preferred rejoining his old unit, Boone couldn't bring himself to abandon the city where he'd met his wife. After Hoover Dam, the leaderless powder gangers at the correctional facility vanished into the wastes, leaving the prison empty. The correctional facility became another abandoned ruin in the wasteland, its carcass occasionally picked over by enterprising prospectors. After the majority of the Vault 19 powder gangers joined the Great Khans, the weaker members scattered throughout the Mojave wasteland. Though a few managed to erase their past, most never survived the journey. Prim Slim proves to be an able-minded, if not able-bodied, sheriff for Prim. And due to his slow speed, some crooks get away without a scratch. But Prim continues to prosper under his watchful robotic eye. Although they performed admirably during NCR's defense of Hoover Dam, the Rangers fell into decline soon after. With Hanlon's plot against the occupation exposed and Oliver denounced for losing the Hoover Dam, many Rangers were greeted coldly on their return home. Few openly blamed the Rangers for Hanlon's treachery, but public and political support for the military as a whole quickly dwindled. After their bold arrival at Hoover Dam, the remnants disappeared as quickly as they came. 
Legends of their power spread throughout the Southwest, a reminder of why people once feared the sight of vertebrates in the sky. And so the Courier's Road came to an end, for now. In the new world of the Mojave Wasteland, fighting continued, blood was spilled, and many lived and died just as they had in the old world. Because war, war never changes. I began writing this script about a month and a half before finishing it. It's potentially one of the largest projects I will ever work on, and I did it because of how much I love this game overall, despite its various flaws. New Vegas is a borderline masterpiece in storytelling, narrative, and critique. It shines a light on some of the worst traits of our culture within North America, criticizing militancy, capitalism, and so much more. While it is known to fall flat from time to time, I don't think you can consider any narrative to be fully perfect. Perfect. New Vegas had a message, however, one that it wanted to bring to an audience of individuals who may not have yet questioned those concepts that have been drilled into their mind about their very own lifestyles, how capitalism affects them, how there are injustices in the world via the wealthy elite against the marginalized. I think it's safe to say that while the gameplay of New Vegas is enjoyable, one of its strongest aspects, one I learned to appreciate more as I grew up, is its storytelling. Bethesda open world games generally focus on combat and exploration, two things I feel are fairly lackluster in their releases within this time period. But Obsidian found a way to make up for that through the sheer strength of their narrative for New Vegas and its DLC. I can honestly say I don't play New Vegas for the gameplay, but to simply go through the motions of the game's winding and ever-changing narrative so I can learn something new each playthrough. I didn't talk about it much until this point, but it's amazing that New Vegas made it out for sale at all, especially with the amount of content it includes. Obsidian was only given a around 18 months to work on the game, and none of the developers were familiar with the engine. This actually led to them requesting help from Jorge Salgado, an Oblivion modder who is best known for his comprehensive overhaul of the game. On top of this, they managed to improve several features of the Fallout 3 base via the source code, better combat, better lighting, etc. If you've ever actually developed a fully featured game, you know this takes an exorbitant amount of time and talent, and 18 months sounds like nothing at all in the grand scheme of things. And with Bethesda's constant interference, during development that clashed with the current developer's visions, a lot of content had to hit the cutting room floor to never be completed. All of this to say, at the end of the day, Fallout New Vegas is one of the best modern Fallout games to currently exist. In both a gameplay and narrative aspect, it simply trumps both Fallout 3 and 4, allowing Obsidian to essentially show how skilled they were that they could make a better product on Bethesda's own engine than Bethesda themselves. I'm sure that led to a little bad blood in the office Office from time to time, as Josh Sawyer and his team care a lot about old school RPG freedom. Meanwhile, we see Bethesda releases more and more streamlined experiences that seem content with removing player choice within each release. This isn't the first time this happened to Obsidian either, as they had similar issues with their sequel to Knights of the Old Republic, another entry I consider better than its predecessor. It's sad to see how much good Obsidian could do with the series, only for them to never be given the opportunity to touch it again. At the very at least we did receive a spiritual successor of sorts in Outer Worlds, an open-ish world space-based RPG in a similar vein to the Fallout model. While it was a fun experience, Outer Worlds seemed to miss some of the charm of New Vegas. That being said, I am hoping to see Obsidian revisit the idea. Now Obsidian is working on Avowed, a game that looks to be in a similar model to Bethesda's Elder Scrolls series. At the end of the day, Obsidian managed to strike gold under poor circumstances, and created a game that while not as well received at first, grew into one of the most revered entries within the Fallout series overall. Obsidian did all of this work for a one-time fee, far less than what they deserved, but they were promised a bonus if the game received an 85 on Metacritic, a site that no one should be looking at in terms of forming their opinions over a piece of media. Despite their hard work, the amount of quality within the game, and the exceptional narrative, New Vegas only ever received an 84 on average. One point from the goal, meaning no bonus and putting Obsidian in a difficult position financially. It's not all bad, however. As I mentioned, they have slowly gotten back on their feet over the years. So the best thing I can end this video with is a thank you to Obsidian for making such an amazing experience. And I suggest you go try the game for yourself if you haven't already. Every playthrough is unique to the player, and it's one of the few games that still allows this to happen. Thanks for watching, everyone. 
Hey, thanks so much for watching to the end of the video. I know it was a long one. If you made it here, I really appreciate it. I think this is, you know, this definitely is my longest video ever. So I, I really do appreciate it. You're in the Patreon section. I just want to shout out some people that are supporting me making these videos. And if you want to support me, you can join the Patreon as well. Thank you so much. Shout out to Ralkar, Tritonate, Festive, Snowcart, Prime XD, Ashtray, Disparity, Beyond the Time, Nolan Brookman, Carl the Crab, Moal Kasemi, Captain Ziba, Ziba, Captain Ziba, Cyberworm, Kathleen Mejuk, Crunchy Kauru, Jonathan, Strangely, Rosalio, and Mr. Janky. Mr. Janky also helped with the script writing process, was just a big help in general, so thank you for that as well. The video couldn't have been done without him, so uh, appreciate it a lot, really. Thank you so much. If you wanna support me again, you can do it through Patreon. You can have your name here, should be here, it's usually there, or you can have me shout you out. It'd be great, super cool. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video. Uh -huh.